This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kevin, a neural engine by Amazon Web Services. In conjunction with Laude Corpus, Software Safety, Audiobook Library Essentials, and Project Gutenberg. The Veil of Isis. Part 1. Science. Chapter 1. Ego Sum Ki Sum. An axiom of hermetic philosophy. We commence research where modern conjecture closes its faithless wings. And with us, those were the common elements of science which the sages of today disdain as wild chimeras, or despair of as unfathomable mysteries. Bolra Zanoni. There exists somewhere in this wide world an old book so very old that our modern antiquarians might ponder over its pages in indefinite time, and still not quite agree as to the nature of the fabric upon which it is written. It is the only original copy now in existence. The most ancient Hebrew document on occult learning the Sifrit Zenaida was compiled from it, and that at a time when the former was already considered in the light of a literary relic. One of its illustrations represents a divine essence emanating from Adam like a luminous arc proceeding to form a circle, and then, having attained the highest point of its circumference, the ineffable glory bends back again, and returns to earth, bringing a higher type of humanity in its vortex. As it approaches nearer and nearer to our planet, the emanation becomes more and more shadowy, until upon touching the ground it is as black as night. A conviction, founded upon 70,000 years of experience, as they allege, has been entertained by hermetic philosophers of all periods that matter has in time become, through sin, more gross and dense than it was at man's first formation, that, at the beginning, the p. 2. Human body was of a half-ethereal nature, and that, before the fall, mankind communed freely with the now unseen universes. But since that time matter has become the formidable barrier between us and the world of spirits. The oldest esoteric traditions also teach that, before the mystic Adam, many races of human beings lived and died out, each giving place in its turn to another. Were these precedent types more perfect? Did any of them belong to the winged race of men mentioned by Plato and Phaedrus? It is the special province of science to solve the problem. The caves of France and the relics of the Stone Age afford a point at which to begin. As the cycle proceeded, man's eyes were more and more opened, until he came to know good and evil as well as the alone in themselves. Having reached its summit, the cycle began to go downward. When the ark attained a certain point which brought it parallel with the fixed line of our terrestrial plane, the man was furnished by nature with coats of skin, and the Lord God clothed them. This same belief in the pre-existence of a far more spiritual race than the one to which we now belong can be traced back to the earliest traditions of nearly every people. In the ancient Quiche manuscript, published by Brasser de Bourbourg the Pope all vu the first men are mentioned as a race that could reason and speak whose sight was unlimited, and who knew all things at once. According to Philo Judaeus, the air is filled with an invisible host of spirits, some of whom are free from evil and immortal, and others are pernicious and mortal. From the sons of El we are descended, and sons of El must we become again. And the unequivocal statement of the anonymous Gnostic who wrote the Gospel according to John, that as many as received him, i.e., who followed practically the esoteric doctrine of Jesus, would become the sons of God points to the same belief. I, twelve, know ye not, ye are gods? exclaimed the master. Plato describes admirably in Phaedrus the state in which man once was, and what he will become again, before, and after the loss of his wings, when he lived among the gods, a god himself in the airy world. From the remotest periods religious philosophies taught that the whole universe was filled with divine and spiritual beings of divers races. From one of these evolved, in the course of time, Adam, the primitive man. The Kalmyks and some tribes of Siberia also describe in their legends earlier creations than our present race. These beings, they say, were possessed of almost boundless knowledge, and in their audacity even threatened rebellion against the great chief spirit. To punish their presumption and humble them, he imprisoned them in bodies, and p. 3. So shut in their senses. From these they can escape but through long repentance, self-purification, and development. Their shamans, they think, occasionally enjoy the divine powers originally possessed by all human beings. The Astor Library of New York has recently been enriched by a facsimile of an Egyptian medical treatise, written in the 16th century BC, or, more precisely, 1552 BC, which, according to the commonly received chronology, 
is the time when Moses was just 21 years of age. The original is written upon the inner bark of Cyperus papyrus, and has been pronounced by Professor Schenk, of Leipzig, not only genuine, but also the most perfect ever seen. It consists of a single sheet of yellow-brown papyrus of finest quality, three-tenths of a meter wide, more than twenty meters long, and forming one roll divided into one hundred and ten pages, all carefully numbered. It was purchased in Egypt, in 1872-3, by the archaeologist Ebers, of a well-to-do Arab from Luxor. The New York Tribune, commenting upon the circumstance, says, The papyrus bears internal evidence of being one of the six hermetic books on medicine named by Clement of Alexandria. The editor further says, At the time of Yom Likus, 8363, the priests of Egypt showed 42 books which they attributed to Hermes, duty. Of these, according to that author, 36 contained the history of all human knowledge, the last six treated of anatomy, of pathology, of affections of the eye, instruments of surgery, and of medicines. The Papyrus Ebers is indisputably one of these ancient hermetic works. If so clear a ray of light has been thrown upon ancient Egyptian science, by the accidental encounter of the German archaeologist with one well-to-do Arab from Luxor, how can we know what sunshine may be let in upon the dark crypts of history by an equally accidental meeting between some other prosperous Egyptian and another enterprising student of antiquity? The discoveries of modern science do not disagree with the oldest traditions which claim an incredible antiquity for our race. Within the last few years geology, which previously had only conceded that man could be traced as far back as the tertiary period, has found unanswerable proofs that human existence antedates the last glaciation of Europe over 250,000 years. A hard nut, this, for patristic theology to crack, but an accepted fact with the ancient philosophers. p. 4. Moreover, fossil implements have been exhumed together with human remains, which show that man hunted in those remote times, and knew how to build a fire. But the forward step has not yet been taken in the search for the origin of the race. Science comes to a dead stop, and waits for future proofs. Unfortunately, anthropology and psychology possess no cuvier. Neither geologists nor archaeologists are able to construct, from the fragmentary bits hitherto discovered, the perfect skeleton of the triple man physical, intellectual, and spiritual. Because the fossil implements of man are found to become more rough and uncouth as geology penetrates deeper into the bowels of the earth, it seems a proof to science that the closer we come to the origin of man, the more savage and brute-like he must be. Strange logic. Does the finding of the remains in the cave of Devon prove that there were no contemporary races then who were highly civilized? When the present population of the earth have disappeared, and some archaeologists belonging to the coming race of the distant future shall excavate the domestic implements of one of our Indian Arondament Island tribes, will he be justified in concluding that mankind in the 19th century was just emerging from the Stone Age? It has lately been the fashion to speak of the untenable conceptions of an uncultivated past. As though it were possible to hide behind an epigram the intellectual quarries out of which the reputations of so many modern philosophers have been carved. Just as Tyndall is ever ready to disparage ancient philosophers for a dressing up of whose ideas more than one distinguished scientist has derived honor and credit so the geologists seem more and more inclined to take for granted that all of the archaic races were contemporaneously in a state of dense barbarism. But not all of our best authorities agree in this opinion. Some of the most eminent maintain exactly the reverse. Max Muller, for instance, says, Many things are still unintelligible to us and the hieroglyphic language of antiquity records but half of the mind's unconscious intentions. Yet more and more the image of man, in whatever clime we meet him, rises before us, noble and pure from the very beginning, even his errors we learn to understand, even his dreams we begin to interpret. As far as we can trace back the footsteps of man, even on the lowest strata of history, we see the divine gift of a sound and sober intellect belonging to him from the very first and the idea of a humanity emerging slowly from the depths of an animal brutality can never be maintained again. p. 5. As it is claimed to be unphilosophical to inquire into first causes, scientists now occupy themselves with considering their physical effects. The field of scientific investigation is therefore bounded by physical nature. When once its limits are reached, inquiry must stop, and their work be recommenced. With all due respect to our learned men, they are like the squirrel upon its revolving wheel, for they are doomed to turn their matter over and over again. Science is a mighty potency, and it is not for us pygmies to question her. 
but the scientists are not themselves science embodied any more than the men of our planet are the planet itself. We have neither the right to demand, nor power to compel our modern-day philosopher to accept without challenge a geographical description of the dark side of the moon. But, if in some lunar cataclysm one of her inhabitants should be hurled thence into the attraction of our atmosphere, and land, safe and sound, at Dr. Carpenter's door, he would be indictable as recreant to professional duty if he should fail to set the physical problem at rest. For a man of science to refuse an opportunity to investigate any new phenomenon, whether it comes to him in the shape of a man from the moon, or a ghost from the Eddy homestead, is alike reprehensible. Whether arrived at by the method of Aristotle, or that of Plato, we need not stop to inquire, but it is a fact that both the inner and outer natures of man are claimed to have been thoroughly understood by the ancient andrologists. Notwithstanding the superficial hypotheses of geologists, we are beginning to have almost daily proofs and corroboration of the assertions of those philosophers. They divided the interminable periods of human existence on this planet into cycles, during each of which mankind gradually reached the culminating point of high civilization and gradually relapsed into abject barbarism. To what eminence the race in its progress had several times arrived may be feebly surmised by the wonderful monuments of old, still visible, and the descriptions given by Herodotus of other marvels of which no traces now remain. Even in his days the gigantic structures of many pyramids and world-famous temples were but masses of ruins. Scattered by the unrelenting hand of time, they are described by the father of history as these venerable witnesses of the long bygone glory of departed ancestors. He shrinks from speaking of divine things, and gives to posterity but an imperfect description from hearsay of some marvelous subterranean chambers of the labyrinth, where lay and now lie concealed, the sacred remains of the king initiates. We can judge, moreover, of the lofty civilization reached in some. p. 6 periods of antiquity by the historical descriptions of the ages of the Ptolemies, yet in that epoch the arts and sciences were considered to be degenerating, and the secret of a number of the former had been already lost. In the recent excavations of Marriott Bay, at the foot of the pyramids, statues of wood and other relics have been exhumed, which show that long before the period of the first dynasties the Egyptians had attained to a refinement and perfection which is calculated to excite the wonder of even the most ardent admirers of Grecian art. Baird Taylor describes these statues in one of his lectures, and tells us that the beauty of the heads, ornamented with eyes of precious stones and copper eyelids, is unsurpassed. Far below the stratum of sand in which lay the remains gathered into the collections of Lepsius, Abbott, and the British Museum, were found buried the tangible proofs of the hermetic doctrine of cycles which has been already explained. Dr. Schliemann, the enthusiastic Hellenist, has recently found, in his excavations in the Trode, Abundant evidences of the same gradual change from barbarism to civilization, and from civilization to barbarism again. Why then should we feel so reluctant to admit the possibility that, if the antediluvians were so much better versed than ourselves in certain sciences as to have been perfectly acquainted with important arts, which we now term lost, they might have equally excelled in psychological knowledge? Such a hypothesis must be considered as reasonable as any other until some countervailing evidence shall be discovered to destroy it. Every true savant admits that in many respects human knowledge is yet in its infancy. Can it be that our cycle began in ages comparatively recent? These cycles, according to the Chaldean philosophy, do not embrace all mankind at one and the same time. Professor Draper partially corroborates this view by saying that the periods into which geology has found it convenient to divide the progress of man and civilization are not abrupt epochs which hold good simultaneously for the whole human race, giving as an instance the wandering Indians of America who are only at the present moment emerging from the Stone Age. Thus more than once scientific men have unwittingly confirmed the testimony of the ancients. Any Kabbalist well acquainted with the Pythagorean system of numerals and geometry can demonstrate that the metaphysical views of Plato were based upon the strictest mathematical principles. True mathematics, says the Mahican, is something with which all higher sciences are connected. Common mathematics is but a deceitful phantasmagoria, whose much praise and fallibility only arises from this that. p. 7. Materials, conditions, and references are made its foundation. Scientists who believe they have adopted the Aristotelian method only because they creep when they do not run from demonstrated particulars to universals, glorify this method of inductive philosophy, and reject that of Plato, which they treat as unsubstantial. Professor Draper laments that such speculative mystics as Ammonius Saccas and Plotinus should have taken the place of the severe geometers of the old museum. 
He forgets that geometry, of all sciences the only one which proceeds from universals to particulars, was precisely the method employed by Plato and his philosophy. As long as exact science confines its observations to physical conditions and precedes Aristotle-like, it certainly cannot fail. But notwithstanding that the world of matter is boundless for us, it still is finite, and thus materialism will turn forever in this vitiated circle, unable to soar higher than the circumference will permit. The cosmological theory of numerals which Pythagoras learned from the Egyptian hierophants, is alone able to reconcile the two units, matter and spirit, and cause each to demonstrate the other mathematically. The sacred numbers of the universe and their esoteric combination solve the great problem and explain the theory of radiation and the cycle of the emanations. The lower orders before they develop into higher ones must emanate from the higher spiritual ones, and when arrived at the turning point, be reabsorbed again into the infinite. Physiology, like everything else in this world of constant evolution, is subject to the cyclic revolution. As it now seems to be hardly emerging from the shadows of the lower art, so it may be one day proved to have been at the highest point of the circumference of the circle far earlier than the days of Pythagoras. Mochus, the Sidonian, the physiologist and teacher of the science of anatomy, flourished long before the sage of Samos, and the latter received the sacred instructions from his disciples and descendants. Pythagoras, the pure philosopher, the deeply versed in the profounder phenomena of nature, the noble inheritor of the ancient lore, whose great aim was to free the soul from the fetters of sense and force it to realize its powers, must live eternally in human memory. The impenetrable veil of arcane secrecy was thrown over the sciences taught in the sanctuary. This is the cause of the modern depreciating of the ancient philosophies. Even Plato and philo Judaeus have been accused by many a commentator of absurd inconsistencies, whereas the p. 8. Design which underlies the maze of metaphysical contradictions so perplexing to the reader of the Timaeus, is but too evident. But has Plato ever been read understandingly by one of the expounders of the classics? This is a question warranted by the criticisms to be found in such authors as Stahlbaum, Schleiermacher, Ficinus, Latin Translation, Heindorf, Sydenham, Putman, Taylor, and Bergs, to say nothing of lesser authorities. The covert allusions of the Greek philosopher to esoteric things have manifestly baffled these commentators to the last degree. They not only with unblushing coolness suggest as to certain difficult passages that another phraseology was evidently intended, but they audaciously make the changes. The Orphic Line Of the song, the order of the sixth race close, which can only be interpreted as a reference to the sixth race evolved in the consecutive evolution of the spheres, Berg says, was evidently taken from a cosmogony where man was fain to be created the last. Ought not one who undertakes to edit another's works at least understand what his author means? Indeed, the ancient philosophers seem to be generally held, even by the least prejudice of our modern critics, to have lacked that profundity and thorough knowledge in the exact sciences of which our century is so boastful. It is even questioned whether they understood that basic scientific principle, ex nihilo nihil fit, if they suspected the indestructibility of matter at all, say these commentators it was not in consequence of a firmly established formula but only through an intuitional reasoning and by analogy. We hold to the contrary opinion. The speculations of these philosophers upon matter were open to public criticism, but their teachings in regard to spiritual things were profoundly esoteric. Being thus sworn to secrecy and religious silence upon abstruse subjects involving the relations of spirit and matter, they rivaled each other in their ingenious methods for concealing their real opinions. The doctrine of metempsychosis has been abundantly ridiculed by men of science and rejected by theologians, yet if it had been properly understood in its application to the indestructibility of matter and the immortality of spirit, it would have been perceived that it is a sublime conception. Should we not first regard the subject from the standpoint? p. 9. Of the ancients before venturing to disparage its teachers? The solution of the great problem of eternity belongs neither to religious superstition nor to gross materialism. The harmony and mathematical equiformity of the double evolution spiritual and physical are elucidated only in the universal numerals of Pythagoras, who built his system entirely upon the so-called metrical speech of the Hindu Vedas. It is but lately that one of the most zealous Sanskrit scholars, Martin Haug, undertook the translation of the Aitareya Brahmana of the Rigveda. It had been till that time entirely unknown. These explanations indicate beyond dispute the identity of the Pythagorean and Brahmanical systems. In both, the esoteric significance is derived from the number, and the former, 
from the mystic relation of every number to everything intelligible to the human mind, in the latter, from the number of syllables of which each verse in the mantras consists. Plato, the ardent disciple of Pythagoras, realized it so fully as to maintain that the dodecahedron was the geometrical figure employed by the demiurgus in constructing the universe. Some of these figures had a peculiarly solemn significance. For instance four, of which the dodecahedron is the trine, was held sacred by the Pythagoreans. It is the perfect square, and neither of the bounding lines exceeds the other in length, by a single point. It is the emblem of moral justice and divine equity geometrically expressed. All the powers and great symphonies of physical and spiritual nature lie inscribed within the perfect square, and the ineffable name of him, which name otherwise, would remain unutterable, was replaced by the sacred number four the most binding and solemn oath with the ancient mystics the Tetrachtes. If the Pythagorean metempsychosis should be thoroughly explained and compared with the modern theory of evolution, it would be found to supply every missing link in the chain of the latter. But who of our scientists would consent to lose his precious time over the vagaries of the ancients? Notwithstanding proofs to the contrary, they not only deny that the nations of the archaic periods, but even the ancient philosophers had any positive knowledge of the heliocentric system. The venerable bed, the Augustines and Lactantiae appear to have smothered with their dogmatic ignorance, all faith in the more ancient theologists of the pre-Christian centuries. But now philology and a closer acquaintance with Sanskrit literature have partially enabled us to vindicate them from these unmerited imputations. In the Vedas, for instance, we find positive proof that so long ago as 2000 BC, the Hindu sages and scholars must have been acquainted with the rotundity of our globe and the heliocentric system. Hence, Pythagoras and Plato knew well this astronomical truth, for Pythagoras obtained his knowledge. p. 10. In India, or for men who have been there, in Plato faithfully echoed his teachings. We will quote two passages from the Aitareya Brahmana. In the Serpent Mantra, the Brahmana declares as follows, that this mantra is that one which was seen by the queen of the serpents, Sarpa Rajni, because the earth, Iam, is the queen of the serpents, as she is the mother and queen of all that moves, Sarpat. In the beginning she, the earth, was but one head, round, without hair, bald, i.e., without vegetation. She then perceived this mantra which confers upon him who knows it, the power of assuming any form which he might desire. She pronounced the mantra, i.e., sacrifice to the gods, and, in consequence, immediately obtained a motley appearance, she became variegated, and able to produce any form she might like, changing one form into another. This mantra begins with the words, I am God prisoner Akramit, X, 189. The description of the earth in the shape of a round and bald head, which was soft at first, and became hard only from being breathed upon by the god Vayu, the lord of the air, forcibly suggests the idea that the authors of the sacred Vedic books knew the earth to be round or spherical, moreover, that it had been a gelatinous mass at first, which gradually cooled off under the influence of the air and time. So much for their knowledge about our globe's sphericity, and now we will present the testimony upon which we base our assertion, that the Hindus were perfectly acquainted with the heliocentric system, at least 2000 years BC. In the same treatise the Hatter, priest, is taught how the Shastra should be repeated, and how the phenomena of sunrise and sunset are to be explained. It says, the Agnishtoma is that one, that God, who burns. The sun never sets nor rises. When people think the sun is setting, it is not so, they are mistaken. For after having arrived at the end of the day, it produces two opposite effects, making night to what is below, and day to what is on the other side. When they, the people, believe it rises in the morning, the sun only does thus, having reached the end of the night, it makes itself produce two opposite effects, making day to what is below, and night to what is on the other side. In fact the sun never sets, nor does it set for him who has such a knowledge. This sentence is so conclusive, that even the translator of the Rigveda, Dr. Haug, was forced to remark it. He says this passage contains the denial of the existence of sunrise and sunset, and that the author supposes the sun to remain always in its high position. p. 11. In one of the earliest Nivids, Rishiksa, a Hindu sage of the remotest antiquity, explains the allegory of the first laws given to the celestial bodies. For doing what she ought not to do, Anahit, Anitis or Nana, the Persian Venus, representing the earth in the legend, is sentenced to turn round the sun. The satras, or sacrificial sessions prove undoubtedly that so early as in the 18th or 20th century BC, 
the Hindus had made considerable progress in astronomical science. The satras lasted one year, and were nothing but an imitation of the sun's yearly course. They were divided, says Haug, into two distinct parts, each consisting of six months of thirty days each. In the midst of both was the Vishavan, equator or central day, cutting the whole satras into two halves, etc. This scholar, although he ascribes the composition of the bulk of the Brahmanas to the period 1400 to 1200 BC, is of opinion that the oldest of the hymns may be placed at the very commencement of Vedic literature, between the years 2400 to 2000, BC he finds no reason for considering the Vedas less ancient than the sacred books of the Chinese. As the Shu King or Book of History, and the sacrificial songs of the Shi King, or Book of Odes, have been proved to have an antiquity as early as 2200, BC, our philologists may yet be compelled before long to acknowledge, that in astronomical knowledge, the antediluvian Hindus were their masters. At all events, there are facts which prove that certain astronomical calculations were as correct with the Chaldeans in the days of Julius Caesar as they are now. When the calendar was reformed by the conqueror, the civil year was found to correspond so little with the seasons, that summer had merged into the autumn months, and the autumn months into full winter. It was Sosagenes, the Chaldean astronomer, who restored order into the confusion, by putting back the 25th of March 90 days, thus making it correspond with the vernal equinox, and it was Sosagenes, again, who fixed the lengths of the months as they now remain. In America, it was found by the Montezuman army, that the calendar of the Aztecs gave an equal number of days and weeks to each month. The extreme accuracy of their astronomical calculations was so great, that no error has been discovered in their reckoning by subsequent verifications, while the Europeans, who landed in Mexico in 1519, were, by the Julian calendar, nearly eleven days in advance of the exact time. It is to the priceless and accurate translations of the Vedic books, and to the personal researches of Dr. Howe, that we are indebted for the p. 12. Corroboration of the claims of the Hermetic philosophers. That the period of Zarathustra Spatama, Zoroaster, was of untold antiquity, can be easily proved. The Brahmanas, to which Haug ascribes four thousand years, describe the religious contest between the ancient Hindus, who lived in the pre-Vedic period, and the Iranians. The battles between the Devas and the Asuras the former representing the Hindus and the latter the Iranians are described at length in the sacred books. As the Iranian prophet was the first to raise himself against what he called the idolatry of the Brahmins, and to designate them as the Devas, devils, how far back must then have been this religious crisis? This contest, answers Dr. Howe, must have appeared to the authors of the Brahmanas as old as the feats of King Arthur appeared to English writers of the 19th century. There was not a philosopher of any notoriety who did not hold to this doctrine of metempsychosis, as taught by the Brahmins, Buddhists, and later by the Pythagoreans, in its esoteric sense, whether he expressed it more or less intelligibly. Origen and Clemens Alexandrinus, Synesius, and Chalcidius, all believed in it, and the Gnostics, who are unhesitatingly proclaimed by history as a body of the most refined, learned, and enlightened men, were all believers in metempsychosis. Socrates entertained opinions identical with those of Pythagoras, and both, as the penalty of their divine philosophy, were put to a violent death. The rabble has been the same in all ages. Materialism has been, and will ever be blind to spiritual truths. These philosophers held, with the Hindus, that God had infused into matter a portion of his own divine spirit, which animates and moves every particle. They taught that men have two souls, of separate and quite different natures, the one perishable the astral soul, or the inner, fluidic body the other incorruptible and immortal the agoides, or portion of the divine spirit that the mortal or astral soul perishes at each gradual change at the threshold of every new sphere, becoming with every transmigration more purified. The astral man, intangible and invisible as he might be to our mortal, earthly senses, is still constituted of matter, though sublimated. Aristotle, notwithstanding that for political reasons of his own he maintained a prudent silence as to certain esoteric matters, expressed very clearly his opinion on the subject. It was his belief that human souls are emanations of God that are finally reabsorbed into divinity. Zeno, the founder of the Stoics, taught that there are two eternal qualities throughout nature, the one active, or male, the other passive, or female, that the p. 13. Former is pure, subtle ether, or divine spirit, the other entirely inert in itself till united with the active principle. That the divine spirit acting upon matter produce fire, water, earth, and air, 
and that it is the sole efficient principle by which all nature is moved. The Stoics, like the Hindu sages, believed in the final absorption. Saint Justin believed in the emanation of these souls from divinity, and Tatian, the Assyrian, his disciple, declared that man was as immortal as God himself. That profoundly significant verse of the Genesis, into every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, I gave a living soul, should arrest the attention of every Hebrew scholar capable of reading the scripture in its original, instead of following the erroneous translation, in which the phrase reads, wherein there is life. From the first to the last chapters, the translators of the Jewish sacred books misconstrued this meaning. They have even changed the spelling of the name of God, as Sir W. Drummond proves. Thus L, if written correctly, would read Al, for it stands in the original Al, and, according to Higgins, this word means the god Mithra, the sun, the preserver and savior. Sir W. Drummond shows that Bethel means the house of the sun in its literal translation, and not of God. L, in the composition of these Canaanite names, does not signify Deus, but Saul. Thus theology has disfigured ancient theosophy, and science ancient philosophy. For lack of comprehension of this great philosophical principle, the methods of modern science, however exact, must end in nullity. And no one branch can it demonstrate the origin and ultimate of things. Instead of tracing the effect from its primal source, its progress is the reverse. Its higher types, as it teaches, are all evolved from antecedent lower ones. It starts from the bottom of the cycle, led on step by step in the great labyrinth of nature by a thread of matter. As soon as this breaks and the clue is lost, it recoils in a fright from the incomprehensible, and p. 14. Confesses itself powerless. Not so did Plato and his disciples. Within the lower types were but the concrete images of the higher abstract ones. The soul, which is immortal, has an arithmetical, as the body has a geometrical, beginning. This beginning, as the reflection of the great universal Arceus, is self-moving, and from the center diffuses itself over the whole body of the microcosm. It was the sad perception of this truth that made Tyndall confess how powerless is science, even over the world of matter. The first marshalling of the atoms, on which all subsequent action depends, baffles a keener power than that of the microscope. Through pure excess of complexity, and long before observation can have any voice in the matter, the most highly trained intellect, the most refined and disciplined imagination, retires in bewilderment from the contemplation of the problem. We are struck dumb by an astonishment which no microscope can relieve, doubting not only the power of our instrument, but even whether we ourselves possess the intellectual elements which will ever enable us to grapple with the ultimate structural energies of nature. The fundamental geometrical figure of the Kabbalah, that figure which tradition and the esoteric doctrines tell us was given by the deity itself to Moses on Mount Sinai contains in its grandiose, because simple combination, the key to the universal problem. This figure contains in itself all the others. For those who are able to master it, there is no need to exercise imagination. No earthly microscope can be compared with the keenness of the spiritual perception. And even for those who are unacquainted with the great science, the description given by a well-trained child psychometer of the genesis of a grain, a fragment of crystal, or any other object is worth all the telescopes and microscopes of exact science. There may be more truth in the adventurous pangenesis of Darwin whom Tyndall calls a soaring speculator than in the cautious, line-bound hypothesis of the latter, who, in common with other thinkers of his class, surrounds his imagination by the firm frontiers of reason. The theory of a microscopic germ which contains in itself a world of minor germs, soars in one sense at least into the infinite. It oversteps the world of matter, and begins unconsciously busying itself in the world of spirit. If we accept Darwin's theory of the development of species, we find that his starting point is placed in front of an open door. We are at liberty with him, to either remain within, or cross the threshold, beyond. p. 15. Which lies the limitless and the incomprehensible, or rather the unutterable. If our mortal language is inadequate to express what our spirit dimly foresees in the great beyond while on this earth it must realize it at some point in the timeless eternity. Not so with Professor Huxley's theory of the physical basis of life. Regardless of the formidable majority of nays from his German brother scientist, he creates a universal protoplasm and appoints its cells to become henceforth the sacred founts of the principle of all life. By making the latter identical in living man, dead mutton, a nettle sting, and a lobster, by shutting in, 
and the molecular cell of the protoplasm, the life principle, and by shutting out from it the divine influx which comes with subsequent evolution, he closes every door against any possible escape. Like an able tactician he converts his laws and facts into sentries whom he causes to mount guard over every issue. The standard under which he rallies them is inscribed with the word necessity, but hardly is it unfurled when he mocks the legend and calls it an empty shadow of my own imagination. The fundamental doctrines of spiritualism, he says, lie outside the limits of philosophical inquiry. We will be bold enough to contradict this assertion, and say that they lie a great deal more within such inquiry than Mr. Huxley's protoplasm, insomuch that they present evident and palpable facts of the existence of spirit, and the protoplasmic cells, once dead, present none whatever of being the originators or the basis of life, as this one of the few foremost thinkers of the day wants us to believe. The ancient Kabbalist rested upon no hypothesis till he could lay its basis upon the firm rock of recorded experiment. But the too great dependence upon physical facts led to a growth of materialism and a decadence of spirituality and faith. At the time of Aristotle, this was the prevailing tendency of thought. And though the Delphic commandment was not as yet completely eliminated from Grecian thought, and some philosophers still held that in order to know what man is, we ought to know what man was still materialism had already begun to gnaw at the root of faith. The mysteries themselves had degenerated in a very great degree into mere priestly speculations and religious fraud. Few were the true adepts and initiates, the heirs and descendants of those who had been dispersed by the conquering swords of various invaders of old Egypt. The time predicted by the great Hermes in his dialogue with an elig, Sculapius. P. 16. Had indeed come, the time when impious foreigners would accuse Egypt of adoring monsters, and not but the letters engraved in stone upon her monuments would survive enigmas incredible to posterity. Their sacred scribes and hierophants were wanderers upon the face of the earth. Obliged from fear of a profanation of the sacred mysteries to seek refuge among the hermetic fraternities known later as the Essenes their esoteric knowledge was buried deeper than ever. The triumphant brand of Aristotle's pupil swept away from his path of conquest every vestige of a once pure religion, and Aristotle himself, the type and child of his epic, though instructed in the secret science of the Egyptians, knew but little of this crowning result of millenniums of esoteric studies, as well as those who lived in the days of the Sametics. Our present-day philosophers lift the veil of Isis for Isis is but the symbol of nature. But, they see only her physical forms. The soul within escapes their view, and the Divine Mother has no answer for them. There are anatomists, who, hovering to sight no indwelling spirit under the layers of muscles, the network of nerves, or the cenericious matter, which they lift with the point of the scalpel, assert that man has no soul. Such are as purblind and sophistry as the student, who, confining his research to the cold letter of the Kabbalah, dares say it has no vivifying spirit. To see the true man who once inhabited the subject which lies before him, on the dissecting table, the surgeon must use other eyes than those of his body. So, the glorious truth covered up in the hieratic writings of the ancient papyri can be revealed only to him who possesses the faculty of intuition which, if we call reason the eye of the mind, may be defined as the eye of the soul. Our modern science acknowledges a supreme power, an invisible principle, but denies a supreme being, or personal God. Logically, the difference between the two might be questioned, for in this case the power and the being are identical. Human reason can hardly imagine to itself an intelligent supreme power without associating it with the idea of an intelligent being. The masses can never be expected to have a clear conception of the omnipotence and omnipresence of a supreme God, without investing with those attributes a gigantic projection of their own personality. But the Kabbalists have never looked upon the invisible and self otherwise than as a power. So far our modern positivists have been anticipated by thousands of ages, in their cautious philosophy. What the hermetic adept claims to demonstrate is, that simple common sense precludes the possibility that p. 17. The universe is the result of mere chance. Such an idea appears to him more absurd than to think that the problems of Euclid were unconsciously formed by a monkey playing with geometrical figures. Very few Christians understand, if indeed they know anything at all, of the Jewish theology. The Talmud is the darkest of enigmas even for most Jews, while those Hebrew scholars who do comprehend it do not boast of their knowledge. Their Kabbalistic books are still less understood by them, for in our days more Christian than Jewish students are engrossed in the elimination of their great truths. How much less is definitely known of the Oriental, or the Universal Kabbalah? Its adepts are few, 
But these heirs elect of the sages who first discovered the starry truths which shone on the great Shemai of the Chaldean lore have solved the absolute and are now resting from their grand labor. They cannot go beyond that which is given to mortals of this earth to know, and no one, not even these elect, can trespass beyond the line drawn by the finger of the divinity itself. Travelers have met these adepts on the shores of the sacred Ganges, brushed against them in the silent ruins of Thebes, and in the mysterious deserted chambers of Luxor, within the halls upon whose blue and golden vaults the weird signs attract attention, but whose secret meaning is never penetrated by the idle gazers, they have been seen but seldom recognized. Historical memoirs have recorded their presence in the brilliantly illuminated salons of European aristocracy. They have been encountered again on the arid and desolate plains of the Great Sahara, as in the caves of Elephanta. They may be found everywhere, but make themselves known only to those who have devoted their lives to unselfish study and are not likely to turn back. Maimonides, the great Jewish theologian and historian, who at one time was almost deified by his countrymen and afterward treated as a heretic, remarks, that the more absurd and void of sense the Talmud seems the more sublime is the secret meaning. This learned man has successfully demonstrated that the Chaldean magic, the science of Moses and other learned thaumaturgists was wholly based on an extensive knowledge of the various and now forgotten branches of natural science. Thoroughly acquainted with all the resources of the vegetable, animal, and mineral kingdoms, experts in occult chemistry and physics, psychologists as well as physiologists, why wonder that the graduates or adepts instructed in the mysterious sanctuaries of the temples, could perform wonders, which even in our days of enlightenment would appear supernatural? p. 18. It is an insult to human nature to brand magic and the occult science with the name of imposture. To believe that for so many thousands of years, one half of mankind practiced deception and fraud on the other half, is equivalent to saying that the human race was composed only of knaves and incurable idiots. Where is the country in which magic was not practiced? At what age was it wholly forgotten? In the oldest documents now in our possession the Vedas and the older laws of Manu we find many magical rites practiced and permitted by the Brahmins. Tibet, Japan and China teach in the present age that which was taught by the oldest Chaldeans. The clergy of these respective countries, prove moreover what they teach, namely, that the practice of moral and physical purity, and of certain austerities, develops the vital soul power of self-illumination. Affording to man the control over his own immortal spirit, it gives him truly magical powers over the elementary spirits inferior to himself. In the West we find magic of as high an antiquity as in the East. The Druids of Great Britain practice it in the silent crypts of their deep caves, and Pliny devotes many a chapter to the wisdom of the leaders of the Celts. The Smuthies, the Druids of the Gauls, expounded the physical as well as the spiritual sciences. They taught the secrets of the universe, the harmonious progress of the heavenly bodies, the formation of the earth, and above all the immortality of the soul. Into their sacred groves natural academies built by the hand of the invisible architect the initiates assembled at the still hour of midnight to learn about what man once was and what he will be. They needed no artificial illumination, nor life-drawn gas, to light up their temples, for the chaste goddess of night beamed her most silvery rays on their oak-crowned heads, and their white-robed sacred bards knew how to converse with the solitary queen of the starry vault. On the dead soil of the long bygone past stand their sacred oaks, now dried up and stripped of their spiritual meaning by the venomous breath of materialism. But for the student of occult learning, their vegetation is still as verdant and luxuriant, and as full of deep and sacred truths, as at that hour when the archdruid performed his magical cures, and waving a branch of mistletoe, severed with his golden sickle the green bough from its mother oak tree. Magic is as old as man. It is. p. 19. As impossible to name the time when it sprang into existence as to indicate on what day the first man himself was born. Whenever a writer has started with the idea of connecting its first foundation in a country with some historical character, further research has proved his views groundless. Odin, the Scandinavian priest and monarch was thought by many to have originated the practice of magic some seventy years B.C., but it was easily demonstrated that the mysterious rites of the priestesses called voilers, lawless, were greatly anterior to his age. Some modern authors were bent on proving that Zoroaster was the founder of magic, because he was the founder of the Magian religion. Aminus Marcellinus, Arnobius, Pliny, and other ancient historians demonstrated conclusively that he was but a reformer of magic as practiced by the Chaldeans and Egyptians. The greatest teachers of divinity agree that nearly all ancient books were written symbolically and in a language intelligible only to the initiated. 
The biographical sketch of Apollonius of Tiana affords an example. As every Kabbalist knows, it embraces the whole of the Hermetic philosophy, being a counterpart in many respects of the traditions left us of King Solomon. It reads like a fairy story, but, as in the case of the latter, sometimes facts and historical events are presented to the world under the colors of a fiction. The journey to India represents allegorically the trials of a neophyte. His long discourses with the Brahmins, their sage advice, and the dialogues with the Corinthian Manipus would, if interpreted, give the esoteric catechism. His visit to the Empire of the Wise Men, an interview with their King Yarkas, the Oracle of Amphiraeus, explained symbolically many of the secret dogmas of Hermes. They would disclose, if understood, some of the most important secrets of nature. Eliphas Levi points out the great resemblance which exists between King Yarkas and the fabulous Hiram, of whom Solomon procured the cedars of Lebanon and the gold of Ophir. We would like to know whether modern masons, even grand lecturers and the most intelligent craftsmen belonging to important lodges, understand who the Hiram is whose death they combine together to avenge? Putting aside the purely metaphysical teachings of the Kabbalah, if one would devote himself but to physical occultism, to the so-called branch of therapeutics, the results might benefit some of our modern sciences, such as chemistry and medicine. Says Professor Draper, sometimes, not. p. 20. Without surprise, we meet with ideas which we flatter ourselves originated in our own times. This remark, uttered in relation to the scientific writings of the Saracens, would apply still better to the more secret treatises of the ancients. Modern medicine, while it has gained largely in anatomy, physiology, in pathology, and even in therapeutics, has lost immensely by its narrowness of spirit, its rigid materialism, its sectarian dogmatism. One school in its purblindness sternly ignores whatever is developed by other schools, and all unite in ignoring every grand conception of man or nature, developed by mesmerism, or by American experiments on the brain every principle which does not conform to a stolid materialism. It would require a convocation of the hostile physicians of the several different schools to bring together what is now known of medical science, and it too often happens that after the best practitioners have vainly exhausted their art upon a patient, a mesmerist or a healing medium will effect a cure. The explorers of old medical literature, from the time of Hippocrates to that of Paracelsus and Van Helmont, will find a vast number of well-attested physiological and psychological facts and of measures or medicines for healing the sick which modern physicians superciliously refuse to employ. Even with respect to surgery, modern practitioners have humbly and publicly confessed the total impossibility of their approximating to anything like the marvelous skill displayed in the art of bandaging by ancient Egyptians. The many hundred yards of ligature enveloping a mummy from its ears down to every separate toe, were studied by the chief surgical operators in Paris, and, notwithstanding that the models were before their eyes, they were unable to accomplish anything like it. In the Abbott Egyptological Collection, in New York City, may be seen numerous evidences of the skill of the ancients in various handicrafts, among others the art of lace-making, and, as it could hardly be expected but that the signs of woman's vanity should go side by side with p. 21. Those of man's strength, there are also specimens of artificial hair, and gold ornaments of different kinds. The New York Tribune, reviewing the contents of the Ebers Papyrus, says, Verily, there is no new thing under the sun. Chapters 65, 66, 79, and 89 show that hair invigorators, hair dyes, painkillers, and flea powders were desiderata 3,400 years ago. How few of our recent alleged discoveries are in reality new, and how many belong to the ancients, is again most fairly and eloquently though but in part stated by our eminent philosophical writer, Professor John W. Draper. His conflict between religion and science a great book with a very bad title swarms with such facts. At page 13, he cites a few of the achievements of ancient philosophers, which excited the admiration of Greece. In Babylon was a series of Chaldean astronomical observations, ranging back through 1903 years, which Callisthenes sent to Aristotle. Ptolemy, the Egyptian king astronomer possessed a Babylonian record of eclipses going back 747 years before our era. As Professor Draper truly remarks, long-continued and close observations were necessary before some of these astronomical results that have reached our times could have been ascertained. Thus, the Babylonians had fixed the length of a tropical year within 25 seconds of the truth. Their estimate of the sidereal year was barely two minutes in excess. They had detected the precession of the equinoxes. 
they knew the causes of eclipses, and, by the aid of their cycle, called sorrows, could predict them. Their estimate of the value of that cycle, which is more than 6,585 days, was within 19 and a half minutes of the truth. Such facts furnish incontrovertible proof of the patience and skill with which astronomy had been cultivated in Mesopotamia, and that, with very inadequate instrumental means, it had reached no inconsiderable perfection. These old observers had made a catalogue of the stars, had divided the zodiac into twelve signs, they had parted the day into twelve hours, the night into twelve. They had, as Aristotle says, for a long time devoted themselves to observations of star occultations by the moon. They had correct views of the structure of the solar system, and knew the order of emplacement of the planets. They constructed sundials, clepsydras, astrolabes, gnomons. Speaking of the world of eternal truths that lies within the world of transient delusions and unrealities, Professor Draper says, that world is not to be discovered through the vain traditions that have brought down to us the opinion of men who lived in the morning of civilization, nor in the dreams of mystics who thought that they were inspired. It is to be p. 22. Discovered by the investigations of geometry and by the practical interrogations of nature. Precisely. The issue could not be better stated. This eloquent writer tells us a profound truth. He does not, however, tell us the whole truth, because he does not know it. He has not described the nature or extent of the knowledge imparted in the mysteries. No subsequent people has been so proficient in geometry as the builders of the pyramids and other titanic monuments, antediluvian and postdiluvian. On the other hand, none has ever equaled them in the practical interrogation of nature. An undeniable proof of this is the significance of their countless symbols. Every one of these symbols is an embodied idea, combining the conception of the divine invisible with the earthly invisible. The former is derived from the latter strictly through analogy according to the hermetic formula as below, so it is above. Their symbols show great knowledge of natural sciences and a practical study of cosmical power. As to practical results to be obtained by the investigations of geometry, very fortunately for students who are coming upon the stage of action, we are no longer forced to content ourselves with mere conjectures. In our own times, an American, Mr. George H. Fell, of New York, who, if he continues as he has begun, may one day be recognized as the greatest geometer of the age, has been enabled, by the sole help of the premises established by the ancient Egyptians, to arrive at results which we will give in his own language. Firstly, says Mr. Fell, the fundamental diagram to which all science of elementary geometry, both plane and solid, is referable, to produce arithmetical systems of proportion in a geometrical manner, to identify this figure with all the remains of architecture and sculpture, and all which it had been followed in a marvelously exact manner, to determine that the Egyptians had used it as the basis of all their astronomical calculations, on which their religious symbolism was almost entirely founded, to find its traces among all the remnants of art and architecture of the Greeks to discover its traces so strongly among the Jewish sacred records, as to prove conclusively that it was founded thereon, to find that the whole system had been discovered by the Egyptians after researches of tens of thousands of years into the laws of nature, and that it might truly be called the science of the universe. Further it enabled him to determine with precision problems in physiology heretofore only surmised, to first develop such a Masonic philosophy as showed it to be conclusively the first science in religion, as it will be the last, and we may add, Lastly, to prove by ocular demonstrations that the Egyptian sculptors and architects obtained. p. 23. The models for the quaint figures which adorn the facades and vestibules of their temples, not in the disordered fantasies of their own brains, but from the viewless races of the air, and other kingdoms of nature, whom he, like them, claims to make visible by resort to their own chemical and cabalistical processes. Schwiger proves that the symbols of all the mythologies have a scientific foundation and substance. It is only through recent discoveries of the physical electromagnetical powers of nature that such experts in mesmerism as Enemoser, Schwiger, and Bart, in Germany, Baron du Petit, and Regazzoni, in France and Italy, were enabled to trace with almost faultless accuracy the true relation which each the mythos bore to some one of these powers. The ideic finger, which had such importance in the magic art of healing, means an iron finger, which is attracted and repulsed in turn by magnetic, natural forces. It produced, in Samothrace, wonders of healing by restoring affected organs to their normal condition. Bart goes deeper than Schwiger into the significations of the old myths, 
and studies the subject from both its spiritual and physical aspects. He treats at length of the Phrygian dactyls, those magicians and exorcists of sickness, and of the Cabirian theurgists. He says, while we treat of the close union of the dactyls and magnetic forces, we are not necessarily confined to the magnetic stone, and our views of nature would take a glance at magnetism and its whole meaning. Then it is clear how the initiated, who called themselves dactyls, created astonishment in the people through their magic arts, working as they did, miracles of a healing nature. To this united themselves many other things which the priesthood of antiquity was wont to practice, the cultivation of the land and of morals, the advancement of art and science, mysteries, and secret consecrations. All this was done by the priestly Cabirians, and wherefore not guided and supported by the mysterious spirits of nature? Schwiger is of the same opinion, and demonstrates that the phenomena of ancient theurgy were produced by magnetic powers under the guidance of spirits. Despite their apparent polytheism, the ancients those of the educated class at all events were entirely monotheistical, in this, too, ages upon ages before the days of Moses. And the Evers papyrus this fact is shown conclusively in the following words, translated from the first four lines of Plato: I, I came from Heliopolis with the great ones from. p. 24. Head at, the lords of protection, the masters of eternity and salvation. I came from Say with the mother goddesses, who extended to me protection. The Lord of the universe told me how to free the gods from all murderous diseases. Eminent men were called gods by the ancients. The deification of mortal men and suppositious gods is no more a proof against their monotheism than the monument building of modern Christians, who erect statues to their heroes, is proof of their polytheism. Americans of the present century would consider it absurd in their posterity three thousand years hence to classify them as idolaters for having built statues to their god Washington. So shrouded in mystery was the hermetic philosophy that Volney asserted that the ancient peoples worshipped their gross material symbols as divine in themselves, whereas these were only considered as representing esoteric principles. Dupuis, also, after devoting many years of study to the problem, mistook the symbolic circle, and attributed their religion solely to astronomy. Eberhardt, Berliner Monatriff, and many other German writers of the last and present centuries, dispose of magic most unceremoniously, and thank you due to the Platonic mythos of the Timaeus. But how, without possessing a knowledge of the mysteries, was it possible for these men or any others not endowed with the finer intuition of a champollion, to discover the esoteric half of that which was concealed, behind the veil of Isis, from all except the adepts? The merit of champollion as an Egyptologist none will question. He declares that everything demonstrates the ancient Egyptians to have been profoundly monotheistical. The accuracy of the writings of the mysterious Hermes Trismegistus, whose antiquity runs back into the night of time, is corroborated by him to their minutest details. Anamoser also says, and to Egypt and the east when Herodotus, Thales, Parmenides, Empedocles, Orpheus, and Pythagoras, to instruct themselves in natural philosophy and theology. There, too, Moses acquired his wisdom, and Jesus passed the earlier years of his life. Thither gathered the students of all countries before Alexandria was founded. How comes it, Anamoser goes on to say, that so little has become known of these mysteries? Through so many ages and amongst so many different times and people? The answer is that it is owing to the universally strict silence of the initiated. Another cause may be found in the destruction and total loss of all the written memorials of the secret knowledge of the remotest antiquity. Numa's books, described by Livy, consisting of treatises upon natural philosophy, were found in his tomb, but they were not allowed to be made known, lest they should reveal the most secret mysteries of the state religion. The p. 25. Senate and the tribune of the people determined that the books themselves should be burned, which was done in public. Magic was considered a divine science which led to a participation in the attributes of divinity itself. It unveils the operations of nature, says Philo Judaeus, and leads to the contemplation of celestial powers. In later periods its abuse and degeneration into sorcery made it an object of general abhorrence. We must therefore deal with it only as it was in the remote past, during those ages when every true religion was based on a knowledge of the occult powers of nature. It was not the sacerdotal class in ancient Persia that established magic, as it is commonly thought, but the Magi, who derived their name from it. The Mobeds, priests of the Parsis the ancient Gebers are named, even at the present day, Magoi, in the dialect of the Paoli. Magic appeared in the world with the earlier races of men. Cassian mentions a treatise, 
well known in the 4th and 5th centuries, which was accredited to Ham, the son of Noah, who in his turn was reputed to have received it from Jared, the fourth generation from Seth, the son of Adam. Moses was indebted for his knowledge to the mother of the Egyptian princess, Dermothes, who saved him from the waters of the Nile. The wife of Pharaoh, Batria, was an initiate herself, and the Jews owed to her the possession of their prophet, learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and mighty in words and deeds. Justin Martyr, giving as his authority Trobus Pompeius, shows Joseph as having acquired a great knowledge in magical arts with the high priests of Egypt. The ancients knew more concerning certain sciences than our modern savants have yet discovered. Reluctant as many are to confess as much, it has been acknowledged by more than one scientist. The degree of scientific knowledge existing in an early period of society was much greater than the moderns are willing to admit, says Dr. A. Todd Thompson, the editor of Occult Sciences, by Salvert, but, he adds, it was confined to the temples, carefully veiled from the eyes of the people and opposed only to the priesthood. Speaking of the Kabbalah, the learned Franz von Bader remarks that not only our salvation and wisdom, but our science itself came to us from the Jews. But why not complete the sentence and tell the reader from whom the Jews got their wisdom? Origen, who had belonged to the Alexandrian school of Platonists. p. 26. Declares that Moses, besides the teachings of the covenant, communicated some very important secrets from the hidden depths of the law to the seventy elders. These he enjoined them to impart only to persons whom they found worthy. St. Jerome names the Jews of Tiberias and Lydda as the only teachers of the mystical manner of interpretation. Finally, Anna Moser expresses a strong opinion that the writings of Dionysius Ariopagita have palpably been grounded on the Jewish Kabbalah. When we take in consideration that the Gnostics, or early Christians, were but the followers of the old Essenes under a new name, this fact is nothing to be wondered at. Professor Melitor gives the Kabbalah its just due. He says, The age of inconsequence and shallowness, in theology as well as in sciences, is past, and since that revolutionary rationalism has left nothing behind but its own emptiness, after having destroyed everything positive, it seems now to be the time to direct our attention anew to that mysterious revelation which is the living spring whence our salvation must come, the mysteries of ancient Israel, which contain all secrets of modern Israel would be particularly calculated to, found the fabric of theology upon its deepest theosophical principles, and to gain a firm basis to all ideal sciences. It would open a new path, to the obscure labyrinth of the myths, mysteries and constitutions of primitive nations. In these traditions alone are contained the system of the schools of the prophets, which the prophet Samuel did not found, but only restored, whose end was no other than to lead the scholars to wisdom and the highest knowledge, and when they had been found worthy, to induct them into deeper mysteries. Class with these mysteries was magic, which was of a double nature divine magic, and evil magic, or the black art. Each of these is again divisible into two kinds, the active and seeing, and the first, man endeavors to place himself in rapport with the world to learn hidden things, in the latter he endeavors to gain power over spirits, in the former, to perform good and beneficial acts, in the latter to do all kinds of diabolical and unnatural deeds. The clergy of the three most prominent Christian bodies, the Greek, Roman Catholic, and Protestant, discountenance every spiritual phenomenon manifesting itself through the so-called mediums. A very brief period, indeed, has elapsed since both the two latter ecclesiastical corporations burned, hanged, and otherwise murdered every helpless victim through whose organism spirits and sometimes blind and as yet unexplained. p. 27. Forces of nature manifested themselves. At the head of these three churches, preeminent stands the Church of Rome. Her hands are scarlet with the innocent blood of countless victims shed in the name of the Moloch-like divinity at the head of her creed. She is ready and eager to begin again. But she is bound hand and foot by that nineteenth-century spirit of progress and religious freedom which she reviles and blasphemes daily. The Greco-Russian Church is the most amiable and Christ-like in her primitive, simple, though blind faith. Despite the fact that there has been no practical union between the Greek and Latin churches, and that the two parted company long centuries ago, the Roman pontiffs seem to invariably ignore the fact. They have in the most impudent manner possible arrogated to themselves jurisdiction not only over the countries within the Greek communion but also over all Protestants as well. The church insists, says Professor Draper, that the state has no rights over anything which it declares to be within its domain, and that Protestantism being a mere rebellion has no rights at all, 
that even in Protestant communities the Catholic bishop is the only lawful spiritual pastor. Decrees unheeded, encyclical letters unread, invitations to ecumenical councils unnoticed, excommunications laughed at all these have seemed to make no difference. Their persistence has only been matched by their effrontery. In 1864, the culmination of absurdity was attained when Pius IX excommunicated and fulminated publicly as anathemas against the Russian emperor, as a schismatic cast out from the bosom of the Holy Mother Church. Neither he nor his ancestors, nor Russia since it was Christianized, a thousand years ago, have ever consented to join the Roman Catholics. When out claim ecclesiastical jurisdiction over the Buddhists of Tibet, or the shadows of the ancient Hyksos? The medium mystic phenomena have manifested themselves at all times in Russia as well as in other countries. This force ignores religious differences, it laughs at nationalities, and invades on us any individuality, whether of a crowned head or a poor beggar. Not even the present vice-god, Pius IX, himself, could avoid the unwelcome guest. For the last fifty years His Holiness has been known to be subject to very extraordinary fits. Inside the Vatican they are termed divine visions, outside, physicians call them epileptic fits, and popular rumor attributes them to an obsession by the ghosts of Perugia, Castel Fidardo, and Mentana. p. 28. The lights burn blue, it is now dead midnight. Cold fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. Methought the souls of all that I caused to be murdered. Came. The Prince of Hohenlohe, so famous during the first quarter of our century for his healing powers, was himself a great medium. Indeed, these phenomena and powers belong to no particular age or country. They form a portion of the psychological attributes of Monta Microcosmos. For centuries have the Klikauchi, the Eurotavoy, and other miserable creatures been afflicted with strange disorders, which the Russian clergy and the populace attribute to possession by the devil. They throng the entrances of the cathedrals, without daring to trust themselves inside, lest their self-will controlling demons might fling them on the ground. Voronegh, Kiev, Kazan, in all cities which possess the thaumaturgical relics of canonized saints, abound with such unconscious mediums. One can always find numbers of them, congregating in hideous groups, and hanging about the gates and porches. At certain stages of the celebration of the Mass by the officiating clergy, such as the appearance of the sacraments, or the beginning of the prayer and chorus, e.g. cherubim, these half-maniacs, half-mediums, begin crowing like cocks, barking, bellowing and braying, and, finally, fall down in fearful convulsions. The unclean one cannot bear the holy prayer, is the pious explanation. Moved by pity, some charitable souls administer restoratives to the afflicted ones, and distribute alms among them. Occasionally, a priest is invited to exorcise, in which event he either performs the ceremony for the sake of love and charity, or the alluring prospect of a twenty-kopeck silver bit, according to his Christian impulses. But these miserable creatures who are mediums, for they prophesy and see visions sometimes, when the fit is genuine are never molested because of their misfortune. Why should the clergy persecute them, or people hate and denounce them as damnable witches or wizards? Common sense and justice surely suggest that if any are to be punished it is certainly not the victims who cannot help themselves, but the demon who is alleged to control their actions. The worst that happens to the patient is, that the priest inundates him or her with holy water, and causes the poor creature to catch cold. This failing in efficacy, the clicutcha is left to the will. p. 29. Of God, and taken care of in love and pity. Superstitious and blind as it is, a faith conducted on such principles certainly deserves some respect, and can never be offensive, either to man or the true God. Not so with that of the Roman Catholics, and hence, it is they, and secondarily, the Protestant clergy with the exception of some foremost thinkers among them that we purpose questioning in this work. We want to know upon what grounds they base their right to treat Hindus and Chinese spiritualists and Kabbalists in the way they do, denouncing them, in company with the infidels creatures of their own making as so many convict sentenced to the inextinguishable fires of hell. Far from us be the thought of the slightest irreverence let alone blasphemy toward the divine power which called into being all things, visible and invisible. Of its majesty and boundless perfection we dare not even think. It is enough for us to know that it exists and that it is all-wise. Enough that in common with our fellow creatures we possess a spark of its essence. The supreme power whom we revere is the boundless and endless one the grand central spiritual sun by whose attributes and the visible effects of whose inaudible will we are surrounded the god of the ancient and the god of modern seers. 
His nature can be studied only in the worlds called forth by his mighty feet. His revelation is traced with his own finger and imperishable figures of universal harmony upon the face of the cosmos. It is the only infallible gospel we recognize. Speaking of ancient geographers, Plutarch remarks in Theseus, that they crowd into the edges of their maps parts of the world which they do not know about, adding notes in the margin to the effect that beyond this lies nothing but sandy deserts full of wild beasts and unapproachable bogs. Do not our theologians and scientists do the same? While the former people the invisible world with either angels or devils, our philosophers try to persuade their disciples that where there is no matter there is nothing. How many of our inveterate skeptics belong, notwithstanding their materialism, to Masonic lodges? The Brothers of the Rosy Cross, mysterious practitioners of the medieval ages, still live but in name only. They may shed tears at the grave of their respectable master, Hiram Abif, but vainly will they search for the true locality, where the sprig of myrtle was placed. The dead letter remains alone, the spirit has fled. They are like the English or German chorus of the Italian opera, who descend in the fourth act of Renani into the crypt of Charlemagne, singing their conspiracy in a tongue utterly unknown to them. So, our modern knights of the sacred arch may descend every night if they choose. p. 30. Through the nine arches into the bowels of the earth, they will never discover the sacred delta of Enoch. The Sir Knights in the South Valley and those in the North Valley may try to assure themselves that enlightenment dawns upon their minds, and that as they progress in masonry the veil of superstition, despotism, tyranny and so on, no longer obscures the visions of their minds. But these are all empty words so long as they neglect their mother magic, and turn their backs upon its twin sister, spiritualism. Verily, Sir Knights of the Orient, you may leave your stations and sit upon the floor in attitudes of grief, with your heads resting upon your hands, for you have cause to bewail and mourn your fate. Since Philippe Le Bel destroyed the Knights Templars, not one has appeared to clear up your doubts notwithstanding all claims to the contrary. Truly, you are wanderers from Jerusalem, seeking the lost treasure of the holy place. Have you found it? Alas, no. For the holy place is profaned, the pillars of wisdom, strength and beauty are destroyed. Henceforth, you must wander in darkness, and travel in humility, among the woods and mountains in search of the lost word. Pass on. You will never find it so long as you limit your journeys to seven or even seven times seven, because you are traveling in darkness, and this darkness can only be dispelled by the light of the blazing torch of truth which alone the right descendants of Ormus carry. They alone can teach you the true pronunciation of the name revealed to Enoch, Jacob, and Moses. Pass on. Till your R. S. W shall learn to multiply 333, and strike instead 666 the number of the apocalyptic beast, you may just as well observe prudence and act sub rosa. In order to demonstrate that the notions which the ancients entertained about dividing human history into cycles were not utterly devoid of a philosophical basis, we will close this chapter by introducing to the reader one of the oldest traditions of antiquity as to the evolution of our planet. At the close of each great year, called by Aristotle according to Censorinus the Greatest, and which consists of six stars our planet is subjected to a thorough physical revolution. The polar and equatorial climates gradually exchange places, the former moving slowly toward the line, and the tropical zone, with its exuberant vegetation and swarming animal life, replacing the forbidding waste of the icy poles. This? P. 31. Change of climate is necessarily attended by cataclysms, earthquakes, and other cosmical throws. As the beds of the ocean are displaced, at the end of every decimillennium and about one near west, a semi-universal deluge like the legendary Nokian flood is brought about. This year was called the Heliacal by the Greeks, but no one outside the sanctuary knew anything certain either as to its duration or particulars. The winter of this year was called the Cataclysm or the Deluge, the summer, the Epirosis. The popular traditions taught that at these alternate seasons the world was in turn burned and deluged. This is what we learn at least from the astronomical fragments of Censorinus and Seneca. So uncertain were the commentators about the length of this year, that none except Herodotus and Linus, who assigned to it, the former 10,800, and the latter 13,984, came near the truth. According to the claims of the Babylonian priests, corroborated by Eupolemus, the city of Babylon, owes its foundation to those who were saved from the catastrophe of the deluge, there were the giants and they built the tower which is noticed in history. These giants who were great astrologers and had received moreover from their fathers, the sons of God, every instruction pertaining to secret matters, 
instructed the priests in their turn, and left in the temples all the records of the periodical cataclysm that they had witnessed themselves. This is how the high priests came by the knowledge of the great years. When we remember, moreover, that Plato in the Timaeus cites the old Egyptian priest rebuking Solon for his ignorance of the fact that there were several such deluges as the great one of Ajiges, we can easily ascertain that this belief in the Heliacos was a doctrine held by the initiated priests the world over. The Neroses, the Rahaspashi, or the periods called Yugas or Kalpas, are life problems to solve. The Satya Yuga and Buddhistic cycles of chronology would make a mathematician stand aghast at the array of ciphers. The Mahakalpa embraces an untold number of periods far. p. 32. Back in the Antediluvian Ages. Their system comprises a kalpa or grand period of 4,320,000,000 years, which they divide into four lesser yugas, running as follows. First, Satya Yuga 1,728,000 years. 2d. Tretya Yuga 1,296,000 years. 3d. Divapa Yug, 864,000 years. Fourth, Kali Yug, 432,000 years. Total, 4,320,000 years. Which make one divine age or Maha Yug. 71 Maha Yugs make 306,720,000 years, to which is added a Sandhi, or the time when day and night border on each other, morning and evening twilight, equal to a Satya Yug, 1,728,000 make a manwantar of 308,448,000 years, 14 manwantars make 4,318,272,000 years, to which must be added a sandhi to begin the kalpo, 1,728,000 years, making the kalpo a grand period of 4,320,000,000 of years. As we are now only in the Kali Yuga of the 28th age of the 7th manwantar of 308,448,000 years, we have yet sufficient time before us to wait before we reach even half of the time allotted to the world. These ciphers are not fanciful, but founded upon actual astronomical calculations, as has been demonstrated by S. Davis. Many a scientist, Higgins among others, notwithstanding their researches, has been utterly perplexed as to which of these was the secret cycle. Bunsen has demonstrated that the Egyptian priests, who made the cyclic notations, kept them always in the profoundest mystery. Perhaps their difficulty arose from the fact that the calculations of the ancients applied equally to the spiritual progress of humanity as to the physical. It will not be difficult to understand the close correspondence drawn by the ancients between the cycles of nature and of mankind, if we keep in mind their belief in the constant and all potent influences of the planets upon the fortunes of humanity. Higgins justly believed that the cycle of the Indian system, of 432,000, is the true key of the secret cycle but his failure in trying to decipher it was made apparent, for as it pertained to the mystery of the creation, this cycle was the most inviolable of all. It was repeated in symbolic figures only in the Chaldean Book of Numbers, the original of which, if p. 33. Now extant, is certainly not to be found in libraries, as it formed one of the most ancient books of Hermes, the number of which is at present undetermined. Calculating by the secret period of the great Near West and the Hindu Kalpas, some Kabbalists, mathematicians and archaeologists who knew not of the secret computations made the above number of 21,000 years to be 24,000 years, for the length of the great year, as it was to the renewal only of our globe that they thought the last period of 6,000 years applied. Higgins gives us a reason for it, that it was anciently thought that the equinoxes proceeded only after the rate of 2,000, not 2,160, years in a sign, for thus it would allow for the length of the great year four times six thousand or twenty-four thousand years. Hence, he says, might arise their immensely lengthened cycles, because, it would be the same with this great year as with the common year, till it traveled round an immensely lengthened circle, when it would come to the old point again. He therefore accounts for the twenty-four thousand in the following manner, if the angle which the plan of the ecliptic makes with the plan of the equator had decreased gradually and regularly, as it was till very lately supposed to do, the two planes would have coincided in about ten ages, six thousand years. p. 34. In ten ages, six thousand years more, the sun would have been situated relatively to the southern hemisphere as he is now to the northern, in ten ages, six thousand years more, the two planes would coincide again, and, in ten ages, six thousand years more, he would be situated as he is now, 
after a lapse of about 24 or 25,000 years in all. When the sun arrived at the equator, the ten ages or 6,000 years would end, and the world would be destroyed by fire. When he arrived at the southern point, it would be destroyed by water. And thus, it would be destroyed at the end of every 6,000 years, or 10 nearoses. This method of calculating by the nearoses, without allowing any consideration for the secrecy in which the ancient philosophers, who were exclusively of the sacerdotal order, held their knowledge, gave rise to the greatest errors. It led the Jews, as well as some of the Christian Platonists, to maintain that the world would be destroyed at the end of 6,000 years. Gale shows how firmly this belief was rooted in the Jews. It has also led modern scientists to discredit entirely the hypothesis of the ancients. It has given rise to the formation of different religious sects, which, like the Adventists of our century, are always living in the expectation of the approaching destruction of the world. As our planet revolves once every year around the sun and at the same time turns once in every 24 hours upon its own axis, thus traversing minor circles within a larger one, so is the work of the smaller cyclic periods accomplished and recommenced, within the great sorrows. The revolution of the physical world, according to the ancient doctrine, is attended by a like revolution in the world of intellect the spiritual evolution of the world proceeding in cycles, like the physical one. Thus we see in history a regular alternation of ebb and flow in the tide of human progress. The great kingdoms and empires of the world, after reaching the culmination of their greatness, descend again, in accordance with the same law by which they ascended, till, having reached the lowest point, humanity reasserts itself and mounts up once more, the height of its attainment being, by this law of ascending progression by cycles, somewhat higher than the point from which it had before descended. The division of the history of mankind into golden, silver, copper, and iron ages, is not a fiction. We see the same thing in the literature of peoples. An age of great inspiration and unconscious productiveness is invariably followed by an age of criticism and consciousness. The one affords material for the analyzing and critical intellect of the other. Thus, all those great characters who tower like giants in the history of mankind, like Buddha Siddhartha, and Jesus, in the realm of spiritual, and p. 35. Alexander the Macedonian and Napoleon the Great, in the realm of physical conquest, were but reflex images of human types which had existed 10,000 years before, in the preceding decimillennium, reproduced by the mysterious powers controlling the destinies of our world. There is no prominent character in all the annals of sacred or profane history whose prototype we cannot find in the half-fictitious and half-real traditions of bygone religions and mythologies. As a star, glimmering at an immeasurable distance above our heads, and the boundless immensity of the sky, reflects itself in the smooth waters of a lake, so does the imagery of men of the antediluvian ages reflect itself in the periods we can embrace in an historical retrospect. As above, so it is below. That which has been, will return again. As in heaven, so on earth. The world is always ungrateful to its great men. Florence has built a statue to Galileo, but hardly even mentions Pythagoras. The former had a ready guide in the treatises of Copernicus, who had been obliged to contend against the universally established Ptolemaic system. But neither Galileo nor modern astronomy discovered the emplacement of the planetary bodies. Thousands of ages before, it was taught by the sages of Middle Asia, and brought thence by Pythagoras, not as a speculation, but as a demonstrated science. The numerals of Pythagoras, says Porphyry, were hieroglyphical symbols, by means whereof he explained all ideas concerning the nature of all things. Verily, then, to antiquity alone have we to look for the origin of all things. How well Hargrave Jennings expresses himself when speaking of pyramids, and how true are his words when he asks, is it at all reasonable to conclude, at a period when knowledge was at the highest, and when the human powers were, in comparison with ours at the present time, prodigious, that all these indomitable, scarcely believable physical effects that such achievements as those of the Egyptians were devoted to a mistake? That the myriads of the Nile were fools laboring in the dark, and that all the magic of their great men was forgery, and that we, in despising that which we call their superstition and wasted power, are alone the wise? No. There is much more in these old religions than probably in the audacity of modern denial, and the confidence of these superficial science times, and in the derision of these days without faith is in the least degree supposed. We do not understand the old time. Thus we see how classic practice and heathen teaching may be made to reconcile how even the Gentile and the Hebrew, the mytho. P. 36. 
Logical and the Christian doctrine harmonize in the general faith founded on magic. That magic is indeed possible is the moral of this book. It is possible. Thirty years ago, when the first wrappings of Rochester awakened slumbering attention to the reality of an invisible world, when the gentle shower of wraps gradually became a torrent which overflowed the whole globe, spiritualists had to contend but against two potencies theology and science. But the theosophists have, in addition to these, to meet the world at large and the spiritualists first of all. There is a personal God, and there is a personal devil. Thunders the Christian preacher. Let him be anathema who dares say nay. There is no personal God, except the gray matter in our brain, contemptuously replies the materialist. And there is no devil. Let him be considered thrice an idiot who says I. Meanwhile the occultists and true philosophers he neither of the two combatants, but keep perseveringly at their work. None of them believe in the absurd, passionate, and fickle god of superstition, but all of them believe in good and evil. Our human reason, the emanation of our finite mind, is certainly incapable of comprehending a divine intelligence, an endless and infinite entity, and, according to strict logic, that which transcends our understanding and would remain thoroughly incomprehensible to our senses cannot exist for us, hence, it does not exist. So far finite reason agrees with science, and says, there is no God. But, on the other hand, our ego, that which lives and thinks and feels independently of us in our mortal casket, does more than believe. It knows that there exists a God in nature, for the sole and invincible artificer of all lives in us as we live in him. No dogmatic faith or exact science is able to uproot that intuitional feeling inherent in man, when he has once fully realized it in himself. Human nature is like universal nature in its abhorrence of a vacuum. It feels an intuitional yearning for a supreme power. Without a god, the cosmos would seem to it but like a soulless corpse. Being forbidden to search for him where alone his traces would be found, man filled the aching void with the personal god whom his spiritual teachers built up for him from the crumbling ruins of heathen myths and hoary philosophies of old. How otherwise explain the mushroom growth of new sects, some of them absurd beyond degree? Mankind have one innate, irrepressible craving, that must be satisfied in any religion that would supplant the dogmatic, undemonstrated and undemonstrable theology of our Christian ages. This is the yearning after the proofs of immortality. As Sir Thomas Brown has expressed it, it is the heaviest stone that p. 37. Melancholy can throw at a man, to tell him that he is at the end of his nature, or that there is no future state to come, unto which this seems progressive, and otherwise made in vain. Let any religion offer itself that can supply these proofs in the shape of scientific facts, and the established system will be driven to the alternative of fortifying its dogmas with such facts, or of passing out of the reverence and affection of Christendom. Many a Christian divine has been forced to acknowledge that there is no authentic source whence the assurance of a future state could have been derived by man. How could then such a belief have stood for countless ages, were it not that among all nations, whether civilized or savage, man has been allowed the demonstrative proof? Is not the very existence of such a belief and evidence that thinking philosopher and unreasoning savage have both been compelled to acknowledge the testimony of their senses? That if, in isolated instances, spectral illusion may have resulted from physical causes, on the other hand, in thousands of instances, apparitions of persons have held converse with several individuals at once, who saw and heard them collectively, and could not all have been diseased in mind? The greatest thinkers of Greece and Rome regarded such matters as demonstrated facts. They distinguished the apparitions by the names of manes, anima and umbra, the manes ascending after the decease of the individual into the underworld, the anima, or pure spirit, ascending to heaven, and the restless umbra, earthbound spirit, hovering about its tomb, because the attraction of matter and love of its earthly body prevailed in it and prevented its ascension to higher regions. Terra legit carnum tumulum circumvolit umbra. Orcus hobbit manes, spiritus astropedi, says Ovid, speaking of the threefold constituents of souls. But all such definitions must be subjected to the careful analysis of philosophy. Too many of our thinkers do not consider that the numerous changes in language, the allegorical phraseology and evident secretiveness of old mystic writers, who were generally under an obligation never to divulge the solemn secrets of the sanctuary, might have sadly misled translators and commentators. The phrases of the medieval alchemists they read literally, and even the veiled symbolology of Plato is commonly misunderstood by the modern scholar. One day they may learn to know better, 
and so become aware that the method of extreme necessarianism was practiced in ancient as well as in modern philosophy, that from the first ages of man, the fundamental truths of all that we are permitted to know on earth was in the safe keeping of the adepts of the sanctuary. p. 38. That the difference in creeds and religious practice was only external, and that those guardians of the primitive divine revelation, who have solved every problem that is within the grasp of human intellect, were bound together by a universal freemasonry of science and philosophy, which formed one unbroken chain around the globe. It is for philology and psychology to find the end of the thread. That done, it will then be ascertained that, by relaxing one single loop of the old religious systems, the chain of mystery may be disentangled. The neglect and withholding of these proofs have driven such eminent minds as Hare and Wallace, and other men of power, into the fold of modern spiritualism. At the same time it has forced others, congenitally devoid of spiritual intuitions, into a gross materialism that figures under various names. But we see no utility in prosecuting the subject further. For, though in the opinion of most of our contemporaries, there has been but one day of learning, in whose twilight stood the older philosophers, in whose noontide brightness is all our own, and though the testimony of scores of ancient and medieval thinkers has proved valueless to modern experimenters, as though the world dated from 81, and all knowledge were of recent growth, we will not lose hope or courage. The moment is more opportune than ever for the review of old philosophies. Archaeologists, philologists, astronomers, chemists and physicists are getting nearer and nearer to the point where they will be forced to consider them. Physical science has already reached its limits of exploration, dogmatic theology sees the springs of its inspiration dry. Unless we mistake the signs, the day is approaching when the world will receive the proofs that only ancient religions were in harmony with nature, and ancient science embraced all that can be known. Secrets long kept may be revealed, books long forgotten and arts long time lost may be brought out to light again, papyri and parchments of inestimable importance will turn up in the hands of men who pretend to have unrolled them from mummies or stumbled upon them in buried crypts, tablets and pillars, whose sculptured revelations will stagger theologians and confound scientists, may yet be excavated and interpreted. Who knows the possibilities of the future? An era of disenchantment and rebuilding will soon begin nay, has already begun. The cycle has almost run its course, a new one is about to begin, and the future pages of history may contain full evidence, and convey full proof that, if ancestry can be not believed, Descending spirits have conversed with man, and told him secrets of the world unknown. Chapter 2 Pride, where it fails, steps into our defense, and fills up all the mighty void of sense. Pope. But why should the operations of nature be changed? There may be a deeper philosophy than we dream of a philosophy that discovers the secrets of nature, but does not alter, by penetrating them, its course. Bulwer. Is it enough for man to know that he exists? Is it enough to be formed a human being to enable him to deserve the appellation of man? It is our decided impression and conviction, that to become a genuine spiritual entity, which that designation implies, man must first create himself anew, so to speak I.E., thoroughly eliminate from his mind and spirit, not only the dominating influence of selfishness and other impurity, but also the infection of superstition and prejudice. The latter is far different from what we commonly term antipathy or sympathy. We are at first irresistibly or unwittingly drawn within its dark circle by that peculiar influence, that powerful current of magnetism which emanates from ideas as well as from physical bodies. By this we are surrounded, and finally prevented through moral cowardice fear of public opinion from stepping out of it. It is rare that men regard a thing in either its true or false light, accepting the conclusion by the free action of their own judgment. Quite the reverse. The conclusion is more commonly reached by blindly adopting the opinion current at the hour among those with whom they associate. A church member will not pay an absurdly high price for his pew any more than a materialist will go twice to listen to Mr. Huxley's talk on evolution, because they think that it is right to do so, but merely because Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so have done it, and these personages are the S, and S. The same holds good with everything else. If psychology had had its Darwin, the descent of man as regards moral qualities might have been found inseparably linked with that of his physical form. Society and its several conditions suggest to the intelligent observer of its mimicry a kinship between the simia and human beings even more striking than is exhibited in the external marks pointed out by the great anthropologist. p. 40. 
Many varieties of the ape mocking presentments of ourselves appear to have been evolved on purpose to supply a certain class of expensively dressed persons with the material for genealogical trees. Science is daily and rapidly moving toward the great discoveries in chemistry and physics, organology, and anthropology. Learn men ought to be free from preconceptions and prejudices of every kind, yet, although thought and opinion are now free, scientists are still the same men as of old. An utopian dreamer is he who thinks that man ever changes with the evolution and development of new ideas. The soil may be well fertilized and made to yield with every year a greater and better variety of fruit, but, dig a little deeper than the stratum required for the crop, and the same earth will be found in the subsoil as was there before the first furrow was turned. Not many years ago, the person who questioned the infallibility of some theological dogma was branded at once an iconoclast and an infidel. Va Victus, science has conquered. But in its turn the victor claims the same infallibility, though it equally fails to prove its right. Tempor mutander et nos mutamor in illis, the saying of the good old Lotharius, applies to the case. Nevertheless, we feel as if we had some right to question the high priest of science. For many years we have watched the development and growth of that apple of discord modern spiritualism. Familiar with its literature both in Europe and America, we have closely and eagerly witnessed its interminable controversies and compared its contradictory hypotheses. Many educated men and women heterodox spiritualists, of course have tried to fathom the protean phenomena. The only result was that they came to the following conclusion, whatever may be the reason of these constant failures whether such are to be laid at the door of the investigators themselves, or of the secret force at work it is at least proved that, in proportion as the psychological manifestations increase in frequency and variety, the darkness surrounding their origin becomes more impenetrable. That phenomena are actually witnessed, mysterious in their nature generally and perhaps wrongly termed spiritual it is now idle to deny. Allowing a large discount for clever fraud, what remains is quite serious enough to demand the careful scrutiny of science. E. Pierre Se Moave, the sentence spoken ages since, has passed into the category of household words. The courage of Galileo is not now required to fling it into the face of the academy. Psychological phenomena are already on the offensive. The position assumed by modern scientists is that even though the occurrence of certain mysterious phenomena in the presence of the p. 41. Mediums be a fact, there is no proof that they are not due to some abnormal nervous condition of those individuals. The possibility that they may be produced by returning human spirits need not be considered until the other question is decided. Little exception can be taken to this position. Unquestionably, the burden of proof rests upon those who assert the agency of spirits. If the scientists would grapple with the subject in good faith, showing an earnest desire to solve the perplexing mystery, Instead of treating it with undignified and unprofessional contempt, they would be open to no censure. True, the great majority of spiritual communications are calculated to discuss investigators of even moderate intelligence. Even when genuine they are trivial, commonplace, and often vulgar. During the past twenty years we have received through various mediums messages purporting to be from Shakespeare, Byron, Franklin, Peter the Great, Napoleon, and Josephine, and even from Voltaire. The general impression made upon us was that the French conqueror and his consort seemed to have forgotten how to spell words correctly, Shakespeare and Byron had become chronic inebriates, and Voltaire had turned an imbecile. Who can blame men trained to habits of exactitude, or even simply well-educated persons, for hastily concluding that when so much palpable fraud lies upon the surface, there could hardly be truth if they should go to the bottom? The huckstering about of pompous names attached to idiotic communications has given the scientific stomach such an indigestion that it cannot assimilate even the great truth which lies on the telegraphic plateaus of this ocean of psychological phenomena. They judge by its surface, covered with froth and scum. But they might with equal propriety deny that there is any clear water in the depths of the sea when an oily scum was floating upon the surface. Therefore, if on one hand we cannot very well blame them for stepping back at the first sight of what seems really repulsive, we do, and have a right to censure them for their unwillingness to explore deeper. Neither pearls nor cut diamonds are to be found lying loose on the ground, and these persons act as unwisely as would a professional diver, who should reject an oyster on account of its filthy and slimy appearance, when by opening it he might find a precious pearl inside the shell. Even the just and severe rebukes of some of their leading men are of no avail and the fear on the part of men of science to investigate such an unpopular subject seems to have now become a general panic. The phenomena chase the scientists, 
and the scientists run away from the phenomena, very pointedly remarks Man Aksakoff in an able article on mediumism on the St. Petersburg Scientific Committee. The Attitude p. 42 of this body of professors toward the subject which they had pledged themselves to investigate was throughout simply disgraceful. Their premature and prearranged report was so evidently partial and inconclusive as to call out a scornful protest even from unbelievers. The inconsistency of the logic of our learned gentlemen against the philosophy of spiritualism proper is admirably pointed out by Professor John Fisk one of their own body. In a recent philosophical work, The Unseen World, while showing that from the very definition of the terms, matter and spirit, the existence of spirit cannot be demonstrated to the senses, and that thus no theory is amenable to scientific tests, he deals a severe blow at his colleagues in the following lines. The testimony in such a case, he says, must, under the conditions of the present life, be forever inaccessible. It lies wholly outside the range of experience. However abundant it may be, we cannot expect to meet it. And, accordingly, our failure to produce it does not raise even the slightest presumption against our theory. When conceived in this way, the belief in the future life is without scientific support, but at the same time it is placed beyond the need of scientific support in the range of scientific criticism. It is a belief which no imaginable future advance of physical discovery can in any way impugn. It is a belief which is in no sense irrational, and which may be logically entertained without in the least affecting our scientific habit of mind or influencing our scientific conclusions. If now, he adds, men of science will accept the position that spirit is not matter, nor governed by the laws of matter, and refrain from speculations concerning it restricted by their knowledge of material things, they will withdraw what is to men of religion, at present, their principal cause of irritation. But, they will do no such thing. They feel and sense that the brave, loyal, and highly commendable surrender of such superior men as Wallace, and refuse to accept even the prudent and restrictive policy of Mr. Crookes. No other claim is advanced for a hearing of the opinions contained in the present work than that they are based upon many years' study of both ancient magic and its modern form, spiritualism. The former, even now, when phenomena of the same nature have become so familiar to all, is commonly set down as clever jugglery. The latter, when overwhelming evidence precludes the possibility of truthfully declaring it charlatanry, is denominated an universal hallucination. Many years of wandering among heathen and Christian magicians, occultists, mesmerizers, and the tutti quanti of white and black art, ought to be sufficient, we think, to give us a certain right to. p. 43. Feel competent to take a practical view of this doubted and very complicated question. We have associated with the fakirs, the holy men of India, and seen them when in intercourse with the Petrus. We have watched the proceedings and modus operandi of the howling and dancing dervishes, held friendly communications with the marabouts of European and Asiatic Turkey, and the serpent charmers of Damascus and Benares have but few secrets that we have not had the fortune to study. Therefore, when scientists who have never had an opportunity of living among these oriental jugglers and can judge at the best but superficially, tell us that there is not in their performances but mere tricks of prestidigitation, we cannot help feeling a profound regret for such hasty conclusions. That such pretentious claims should be made to a thorough analysis of the powers of nature, and at the same time such unpardonable neglect displayed of questions of purely physiological and psychological character, and astounding phenomena rejected without either examination or appeal, is an exhibition of inconsistency, strongly savoring of timidity, if not of moral obliquity. If, therefore, we should ever receive from some contemporaneous Faraday the same flame that the gentleman made years since, when, with more sincerity than good breeding, he said that many dogs have the power of coming to much more logical conclusions than some spiritualists, we fear we must still persist. Abuse is not argument, least of all, proof. Because such men as Huxley and Tyndall denominate spiritualism a degrading belief in oriental magic jugglery, they cannot thereby take from truth its verity. Skepticism, whether it proceeds from a scientific or an ignorant brain, is unable to overturn the immortality of our souls if such immortality is a fact and plunge them into post-mortem annihilation. Reason is subject to error, says Aristotle, so is opinion, and the personal views of the most learned philosopher are often more liable to be proved erroneous, than the plain common sense of his own illiterate cook. In the tales of the impious caliph, Baraki Hassan Ogulu, the Arabian sage holds a wise discourse, beware. O oh my son, of self and sense, he says. 
it is the most dangerous, on account of its agreeable intoxication. Profit by thy own wisdom, but learn to respect the wisdom of thy fathers likewise. And remember, O my beloved, that the light of Allah's truth will often penetrate much easier an empty head, than one that is so crammed with learning that many a silver ray is crowded out for one of space, such is the case with our overwise Qadi. P. 44. These representatives of modern science in both hemispheres seem never to have exhibited more scorn, or to have felt more bitterly toward the unsolvable mystery, than since Mr. Crooks began the investigation of the phenomena, in London. This courageous gentleman was the first to introduce to the public one of those alleged materialized sentries that guard the forbidden gates. Following after him, several other learned members of the scientific body had the rare integrity, combined with a degree of courage, which, in view of the unpopularity of the subject, may be deemed heroic, to take the phenomena in hand. But, alas! Although the spirit, indeed, was willing, the mortal flesh proved weak. Ridicule was more than the majority of them could bear, and so, the heaviest burden was thrown upon the shoulders of Mr. Crooks. In account of the benefit this gentleman reaped from his disinterested investigations, and the thanks he received from his own brother scientist, can be found in his three pamphlets, entitled, Researches in the Phenomena of Spiritualism. After a while, the members appointed on the committee of the Dialectical Society and Mr. Crooks, who had applied to his mediums the most crucial tests, were forced by an impatient public to report in so many plain words what they had seen. But what could they say, except the truth? Thus, they were compelled to acknowledge, first, that the phenomena which they, at least, had witnessed, were genuine, and impossible to simulate, thus showing that manifestations produced by some unknown force, couldn't it happen. 2d. That, whether the phenomena were produced by disembodied spirits or other analogous entities, they could not tell, but that manifestations, thoroughly upsetting many preconceived theories as to natural laws, did happen and were undeniable. Several of these occurred in their own families. 3d. That, notwithstanding all their combined efforts to the contrary, beyond the indisputable fact of the reality of the phenomena, glimpses of natural action not yet reduced to law, they, to borrow the expression of the Count de Gavallis, could make neither head nor tail on. Now this was precisely what a skeptical public had not bargained for. The discomfiture of the believers in spiritualism had been impatiently anticipated before the conclusions of Messrs. Crooks, Farley, and the Dialectical Society were announced. Such a confession on the part of their brother scientists was too humiliating for the pride of even those who had timorously abstained from investigation. It was regarded as really too much that such vulgar and repulsive manifestations of feet. p. 45. Nomina which had always, by common consent of educated people, been regarded as nursery tales, fit only to amuse hysterical servant girls and afford revenue to professional somnambulists that manifestations which had been consigned by the Academy and Institute of Paris to oblivion, should so impertinently elude detection at the hands of experts in physical sciences. A tornado of indignation followed the confession. Mr. Crooks depicts it in his pamphlet on psychic force. He heads it very pointedly with the quotation from Galvani, I am attacked by two very opposite sects the scientists and the know-nothings, yet I know that I have discovered one of the greatest forces in nature. He then proceeds. It was taken for granted that the results of my experiments would be in accordance with their preconceptions. What they really desired was not the truth, but an additional witness in favor of their own foregone conclusions. When they found the facts which that investigation established could not be made to fit those opinions, why, so much the worse for the facts. They try to creep out of their own confident recommendations of the inquiry, by declaring that Mr. Holm is a clever conjurer who has duped us all. Mr. Crooks might, with equal propriety, examine the performances of an Indian juggler. Mr. Crooks must get better witnesses before he can be believed. The thing is too absurd to be treated seriously. It is impossible and therefore can't be. I never said it was impossible, I only said it was true, the observers have all been biologized, and fancy they saw things occur which really never took place, etc., etc., etc. After expending their energy on such puerile theories as unconscious cerebration, involuntary muscular contraction, and the sublimely ridiculous one of the cracking knee joints, the muscle cracker, after meeting ignominious failures by the obstinate survival of the new force, and finally, after every desperate effort to compass its obliteration, these feely diffidentiae as St. Paul calls their class thought best to give up the whole thing in disgust. 
Sacrificing their courageously persevering brethren as a holocaust on the altar of public opinion, they withdrew in dignified silence. Leaving the arena of investigation to more fearless champions, these unlucky experimenters are not likely to ever enter it again. It is easier by far to deny the reality of such manifestations from a secure distance, than find for them a proper place among the classes of p. 46. Natural phenomena accepted by exact science. And how can they, since all such phenomena pertain to psychology, and the latter, with its occult and mysterious powers, is a terra incognita for modern science? Thus, powerless to explain that which proceeds directly from the nature of the human soul itself the existence of which most of them deny unwilling at the same time to confess their ignorance, scientists retaliate very unjustly on those who believe in the evidence of their senses without any pretense to science. A kick from thee, O Jupiter, is sweet says the poet Treshikowsky, in an old Russian tragedy. Rude as those Jupiters of science may be occasionally toward us credulous mortals, their vast learning and less abstruse questions, we mean if not their manners, entitles them to public respect. But unfortunately it is not the gods who shout the loudest. The eloquent Tertullian, speaking of Satan and his imps, whom he accuses of ever mimicking the Creator's works, denominates them the monkeys of God. It is fortunate for the philosophicals that we have no modern Tertullian to consign them to an immortality of contempt as the monkeys of science. But to return to genuine scientists. Phenomena of a merely objective character, says A. and Aksakoff, force themselves upon the representatives of exact sciences for investigation and explanation, but the high priests of science, in the face of apparently such a simple question, are totally disconcerted. This subject seems to have the privilege of forcing them to betray, not only the highest code of morality truth, but also the supreme law of science experiment, they feel that there is something too serious underlying it. The cases of Hare, Crookes, De Morgan, Varley, Wallace, and Butleroff create a panic. They fear that as soon as they concede one step, they will have to yield the whole ground. Time-honored principles, the contemplative speculations of a whole life, of a long line of generations, are all staked on a single card. In the face of such experience as that of Crookes in the dialectical society, of Wallace and the late Professor Hare, what can we expect from our luminaries of erudition? Their attitude toward the undeniable phenomena is in itself another phenomenon. It is simply incomprehensible, unless we admit the possibility of another psychological disease, as mysterious and contagious as hydrophobia. Although we claim no honor for this new discovery, we nevertheless propose to recognize it under the name of scientific psychophobia. P. 47. They ought to have learned by this time, in the school of bitter experience, that they can rely on the self-sufficiency of the positive sciences only to a certain point, in that, so long as there remains one single unexplained mystery in nature, the word impossible is a dangerous word for them to pronounce. In the researches on the phenomena of spiritualism, Mr. Crook submits to the option of the reader eight theories to account for the phenomena observed. These theories run as follows. First theory. The phenomena are all the result of tricks, clever mechanical arrangements, or ledger domain, the mediums are impostors, and the rest of the company fools. Second theory. The persons at a seance are the victims of a sort of mania, or delusion, and imagine phenomena to occur which have no real objective existence. Third theory. The whole is the result of conscious or unconscious cerebral action. Fourth theory. The result of the spirit of the medium perhaps in association with the spirits of some or all of the people present. Fifth theory. The actions of evil spirits, or devils, personifying whom or what they please, in order to undermine Christianity, and ruin men's souls. Theory of our theologians. Sixth theory. The actions of a separate order of beings living on this earth, but invisible and immaterial to us. Able, however, occasionally to manifest their presence, known in almost all countries and ages as demons, not necessarily bad, gnomes, fairies, kobolds, elves, goblins, puck, etc. One of the claims of the Kabbalists. Seventh Theory The Actions of Departed Human Beings The Spiritual Theory Par Excellence Eighth Theory The Psychic Force, an adjunct to the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh theories. The first of these theories having been proved valid only in exceptional, though unfortunately still too frequent cases, must be ruled out as having no material bearing upon the phenomena themselves. 
Theories the second and the third are the last crumbling entrenchments of the girl of skeptics and materialists, and remain, as lawyers say, at hux sub judice lis est. Thus, we can deal in this work but with the four remaining ones, the last, eighth, theory being according to Mr. Crooks's opinion, but a necessary adjunct of the others. How subject even a scientific opinion is to error, we may see, if we only compare the several articles on spiritual phenomena from the able. p. 48. Pen of that gentleman, which appeared from 1870 to 1875. In one of the first we read, the increased employment of scientific methods will promote exact observations in greater love of truths among inquirers, and will produce a race of observers who will drive the worthless residuum of spiritualism hence into the unknown limbo of magic and necromancy. And in 1875, we read, over his own signature, men in most interesting descriptions of the materialized spirit Katie King. It is hardly possible to suppose that Mr. Crooks could be under electrobiological influence or hallucination for two or three consecutive years. The spirit appeared in his own house, in his library, under the most crucial tests, and was seen, felt, and heard by hundreds of persons. But Mr. Crooks denies that he ever took Katie King for a disembodied spirit. What was it then? If it was not Miss Florence Cook, and his words are sufficient guarantee for it then it was either the spirit of one who had lived on earth, or one of those that come directly under the sixth theory of the eight the eminent scientist offers to the public choice. It must have been one of the classes named, fairies, kobolds, gnomes, elves, goblins, or a puck. Yes, Katie King must have been a fairy a titania. For to a fairy only could be applied with propriety the following poetic effusion which Mr. Crooks quotes in describing this wonderful spirit. Round her she made an atmosphere of life. The very air seemed lighter from her eyes. They were so soft and beautiful and rife. With all we can imagine of the skies. Her overpowering presence makes you feel. It would not be idolatry to kneel. And thus, after having written, in 1870, his severe sentence against spiritualism and magic, after saying that even at that moment he believed the whole affair a superstition, or, at least, an unexplained trick a delusion of the senses, Mr. Crooks, in 1875, closes his letter with the following memorable words, to imagine, I say, the Katie King of the last three years to be the result of imposture does more violence to one's reason and common sense than to believe her to be what she herself affirms. This last remark, moreover, conclusively proves that. p. 49. 1. Notwithstanding Mr. Crooks's full convictions that the somebody calling herself Katie King was neither the medium nor some confederate, but on the contrary an unknown force in nature, which like love laughs at locksmiths, too. That that hitherto unrecognized form of force, albeit it had become with him not a matter of opinion, but of absolute knowledge, the eminent investigator still did not abandon to the last a skeptical attitude toward the question. In short, he firmly believes in the phenomenon, but cannot accept the idea of its being the human spirit of a departed somebody. It seems to us, that, as far as public prejudice goes, Mr. Crooks solves one mystery by creating a still deeper one, the obscurum per obscurius. In other words, rejecting the worthless residuum of spiritualism, the courageous scientist fearlessly plunges into his own unknown limbo of magic and necromancy. The recognized laws of physical science account for but a few of the more objective of the so-called spiritual phenomena. While proving the reality of certain visible effects of an unknown force, they have not thus far enabled scientists to control at will even this portion of the phenomena. The truth is that the professors have not yet discovered the necessary conditions of their occurrence. They must go as deeply into the study of the triple nature of man physiological, psychological, and divine as did their predecessors, the magicians, theurgists, and thaumaturgists of old. Until the present moment, even those who have investigated the phenomena as thoroughly and impartially as Mr. Crookes, have set aside the cause as something not to be discovered now, if ever. They have troubled themselves no more about that than about the first cause of the cosmic phenomena of the correlation of forces, whose endless effects they are at such pains to observe and classify. Their course has been as unwise as that of a man who should attempt to discover the sources of a river by exploring toward its mouth. It has so narrowed their views of the possibilities of natural law that very simple forms of occult phenomena have necessitated their denial that they can occur unless miracles were possible, and this being a scientific absurdity the result has been that physical science has latterly been losing prestige. If scientists had studied the so-called miracles instead of denying them, 
many secret laws of nature comprehended by the ancients would have been again discovered. Conviction, says Bacon, comes not through arguments but through experiments. The ancients were always distinguished especially the Chaldean astrologers and magians for their ardent love and pursuit of knowledge in every branch of science. They tried to penetrate the secrets of nature. p. 50. In the same way as our modern naturalists, and by the only method by which this object can be obtained, namely, by experimental researches and reason. If our modern philosophers cannot apprehend the fact that they penetrated deeper than themselves into the mysteries of the universe, this does not constitute a valid reason why the credit of possessing this knowledge should be denied them or the imputation of superstition laid at their door. Nothing warrants the charge, and every new archaeological discovery militates against the assumption. As chemists they were unequaled, and in his famous lecture on the lost arts, Wendell Phillips says, the chemistry of the most ancient period had reached a point which we have never even approached. The secret of the malleable glass, which, if supported by one and by its own weight, in twenty hours dwindles down to a fine line that you can curve around your wrist, would be as difficult to rediscover in our civilized countries as to fly to the moon. The fabrication of a cup of glass which was brought by an exile to Rome in the reign of Tiberius, a cup which he dashed upon the marble pavement, and it was not crushed nor broken by the fall, and which, as it got dented some was easily brought into shape again with a hammer, is a historic fact. If it is doubted now it is merely because the moderns cannot do the same. And yet, in Samarkand and some monasteries of Tibet such cups and glassware may be found to this day, nay, there are persons who claim that they can make the same by virtue of their knowledge of the much ridiculed and ever doubted Alcahes the universal solvent. This agent that Paracelsus and Van Helmont maintain to be a certain fluid in nature, capable of reducing all sublunary bodies, as well homogeneous as mixed, into their ins primum, or the original matter of which they are composed, or into an uniform, equable, and potable liquor, that will unite with water, and the juices of all bodies, and yet retain its own radical virtues, and, if again mixed with itself will thereby be converted into pure elementary water, what impossibilities prevent our crediting the statement? Why should it not exist and why the idea be considered utopian? Is it again because our modern chemists are unable to produce it? But surely it may be conceived without any great effort of imagination that all bodies must have originally come from some first matter, and that this matter, according to the lessons of astronomy, geology and physics, must have been a fluid. Why should not gold of whose genesis our scientists know so little have been originally a primitive or basic matter of gold, a ponderous fluid which, as says Van Helmont, from its own nature, or a strong cohesion between its particles, acquired afterward a solid form? p. 51. There seems to be very little absurdity to believe in a universal ens that resolves all bodies into their ens genitale. Van Helmont calls it the highest and most successful of all salts, which having obtained the supreme degree of simplicity, purity, subtlety, enjoys alone the faculty of remaining unchanged and unimpaired by the subjects it works upon, and of dissolving the most stubborn and untractable bodies, as stones, gems, glass, earth, sulfur, metals, etc., into red salt equal in weight to the matter dissolved, and this with as much ease as hot water melts down snow. It is into this fluid that the makers of malleable glass claimed, and now claim, that they immerse common glass for several hours, to acquire the property of malleability. We have already impalpable proof of such possibilities. A foreign correspondent of the Theosophical Society, a well-known medical practitioner, and one who has studied the occult sciences for upward of thirty years, has succeeded in obtaining what he terms the true oil of gold, i.e., the primal element. Chemists and physicists have seen and examined it, and were driven to confess that they neither knew how it was obtained nor could they do the same. That he desires his name to remain unknown is not to be wondered at. Ridicule and public prejudice are more dangerous sometimes than the Inquisition of old. This Adamic earth is next door neighbor to the Alcahes, and one of the most important secrets of the alchemists. Now Cablos will reveal it to the world. For, as he expresses it in the well-known jargon, it would explain the eagles of the alchemists, and how the eagles' wings are clipped, a secret that it took Thomas Vaughn, Eugenius Philolethes, twenty years to learn. As the dawn of physical science broke into a glaring daylight, the spiritual sciences merged deeper and deeper into night, and in their turn they were denied. So, now, these greatest masters in psychology are looked upon as ignorant and superstitious ancestors, as mountebanks and jugglers, because, Forsooth, the sun of modern learning shines today so bright, 
It has become an axiom that the philosophers and men of science of the olden time knew nothing, and lived in a night of superstition. But their traducers forget that the sun of today will seem dark by comparison with the luminary of tomorrow, whether justly or not, and as the men of our century think their ancestors ignorant, so will perhaps their descendants count them for no nothings. The world moves in cycles. The coming races will be but the reproductions of races long bygone, as we, perhaps, are the images of those who lived a hundred centuries ago. The time will come when those who now in public slander. P. 52. The Hermetists, but ponder in secret their dust-covered volumes, who plagiarize their ideas, assimilate and give them out as their own will receive their dues. Who, honestly exclaims Foff what man has ever taken more comprehensive views of nature than Paracelsus? He was the bold creator of chemical medicines, the founder of courageous parties, victorious in controversy, belonging to those spirits who have created amongst us a new mode of thinking on the natural existence of things. What he scattered through his writings on the philosopher's stone, on pygmies and spirits of the minds, on signs, on homunculi, and the elixir of life, and which are employed by many to lower his estimation, cannot extinguish our grateful remembrance of his general works, nor our admiration of his free, bold exertions, and his noble, intellectual life. More than one pathologist, chemist, homeopathist, and magnetist has quenched his thirst for knowledge in the books of Paracelsus. Frederick Hufelant got his theoretical doctrines on infection from this medieval quack, as sprangled lights in calling one who was immeasurably higher than himself. Hemen, who endeavors to vindicate this great philosopher, and nobly tries to redress his slandered memory, speaks of him as the greatest chemist of his time. So do Professor Maliter, and Dr. Ennemoser, the eminent German psychologist. According to their criticisms on the labors of this hermetist, Paracelsus is the most wondrous intellect of his age, a noble genius. But our modern lights assume to know better, and the ideas of the Rosicrucians about the elementary spirits, the goblins and the elves, have sunk into the limbo of magic and fairy tales for early childhoods. We are quite ready to concede to skeptics that one half, and even more, of seeming phenomena, are but more or less clever fraud. Recent exposures, especially of materializing mediums, but too well prove the fact. Unquestionably numerous others are still in store, and this will. p. 53. Continue until tests have become so perfect and spiritualist so reasonable as no longer to furnish opportunity to mediums or weapons to adversaries. What should sensible spiritualists think of the character of angel guides, who after monopolizing, perhaps for years, a poor medium's time, health and means, suddenly abandon him when he most needs their help? None but creatures without soul or conscience would be guilty of such injustice. Conditions? Mere sophistry. What sort of spirits must they be who would not summon if necessary an army of spirit friends, if such there be, to snatch the innocent medium from the pit dug for his feet? Such things happened in the olden time, such may happen now. There were apparitions before modern spiritualism, and phenomena like ours in every previous age. If modern manifestations are a reality in palpable facts, so must have been the so-called miracles and thaumaturgic exploits of old or if the latter are but fictions of superstition so must be the former, for they rest on no better testimony. But, in this daily increasing torrent of occult phenomena that rushes from one end of the globe to the other, though two-thirds of the manifestations are proved spurious, what of those which are proved genuine beyond doubt or cavil? Among these may be found communications coming through non-professional as well as professional mediums, which are sublime and divinely grand. Often, through young children, and simple-minded ignorant persons, we receive philosophical teachings and precepts, poetry and inspirational orations, music and paintings that are fully worthy of the reputations of their alleged authors. Their prophecies are often verified and their moral disquisitions beneficent, though the latter is of rare occurrence. Who are those spirits, what those powers or intelligences which are evidently outside of the medium proper and entities per se? These intelligences deserve the appellation, and they differ as widely from the generality of spooks and goblins that hover around the cabinets for physical manifestations, as day from night. We must confess that the situation appears to be very grave. The control of mediums by such unprincipled and lying spirits is constantly becoming more and more general, and the pernicious effects of seeming diabolism constantly multiply. Some of the best mediums are abandoning the public rostrum and retiring from this influence, and the movement is drifting churchward. We venture the prediction that unless spiritualists set about the study of ancient philosophy, 
so as to learn to discriminate between spirits and to guard themselves against the baser sword. Twenty-five years more will not elapse before they will have to fly to the Romish communion to escape these guides and controls that they have fondled so long. The signs of this catastrophe already exhibit p. 54. Themselves. At a recent convention at Philadelphia, it was seriously proposed to organize a sect of Christian spiritualists. This is because, having withdrawn from the church and learned nothing of the philosophy of the phenomena, or the nature of their spirits, they are drifting about on a sea of uncertainty like a ship without compass or rudder. They cannot escape the dilemma, they must choose between Porphyry and Pio Nono. While men of genuine science, such as Wallace, Crooks, Wagner, Butleroff, Farley, Buchanan, Hare, Reichenbach, Three, Purdy, De Morgan, Hoffman, Goldschmidt, W. Gregory, Flamar Young, Sergeant Cox and many others, firmly believe in the current phenomena. Many of the above named reject the theory of departed spirits. Therefore, it seems but logical to think that if the London Katie King, the only materialized something which the public is obliged more or less to credit out of respect to science, is not the spirit of an ex-mortal, then it must be the astral solidified shadow of either one of the Rosicrucian spooks fantasies of superstition or of some as yet unexplained force in nature. Be it however a spirit of health or goblin damned it is of little consequence, for if it be once proved that its organism is not solid matter, then it must be and is a spirit, an apparition, a breath. It is an intelligence which acts outside our organisms and therefore must belong to some existing even though unseen race of beings. But what is it? What is this something which thinks and even speaks but yet is not human, that is impalpable and yet not a disembodied spirit, that simulates affection, passion, remorse, fear, joy, but yet feels neither? What is this canting creature which rejoices in cheating the truthful inquirer and mocking at sacred human feeling? For, if not Mr. Crooks's Katie King, other similar creatures have done all these. Who can fathom the mystery? The true psychologist alone. And where should he go for his textbooks but to the neglected alcoves of libraries where the works of the spies, hermetists, and theurgists have been gathering dust these many years? Says Henry Moore, the revered English Platonist, in his answer to an attack on the believers of spiritual and magic phenomena by a skeptic of that age, named Webster, as for that other opinion, that the p. 55. Greater part of the reformed divines hold, that it was the devil that appeared in Samuel's shape, it is beneath contempt, for though I do not doubt but that in many of these necromantic apparitions, they are ludicrous spirits, not the souls of the deceased that appear, yet I am clear for the appearing of the soul of Samuel and as clear that in other necromancies, it may be such kinds of spirits, as Porphyrius above describes, that change themselves into omnifarious forms and shapes, and one will act the parts of demons, another while of angels or gods, and another while of the souls of the departed. And I confess such a spirit as this might personate Samuel here, for anything Webster alleged to the contrary, for his arguments indeed are wonderfully weak and wooden. When such a metaphysician and philosopher as Henry Moore gives such testimony as this, we may well assume our point to have been well taken. Learned investigators, all very skeptical as to spirits in general and departed human spirits in particular, during the last twenty years have taxed their brains to invent new names for an old thing. Thus, with Mr. Crooks and Sergeant Cox, it is the psychic force. Professor Three of Geneva calls it the psychote or actinic force, Professor Balfour Stewart, the electrobiological power, Faraday, the great master of experimental philosophy and physics but apparently a novice in psychology, superciliously termed it an unconscious muscular action, an unconscious cerebration, and what not? Sir William Hamilton, a latent thought, Dr. Carpenter, the idiomotor principle, etc., etc., so many scientists, so many names. Years ago the old German philosopher, Schopenhauer, disposed of this force and matter at the same time, and since the conversion of Mr. Wallace, the great anthropologist has evidently adopted his ideas. Schopenhauer's doctrine is that the universe is but the manifestation of the will. Every force in nature is also an effect of will, representing a higher or lower degree of its objectiveness. It is the teaching of Plato, who stated distinctly that everything visible was created or evolved out of the invisible and eternal will, and after its fashion. Our heaven, he says, was produced according to the eternal pattern of the ideal world, contained, as everything else, in the dodecahedron, the geometrical model used by the deity. With Plato, the primal being is an emanation of the demiurgic mind, nil, which contains from the eternity the idea of the to-be-created world within itself, 
and which idea he produces out of himself. The laws of nature are the established relations of this idea to the forms of its manifestations, these. p. 56. Forms, says Schopenhauer, are time, space, and causality. Through time and space the idea varies in its numberless manifestations. These ideas are far from being new, and even with Plato they were not original. This is what we read in the Chaldean oracles. The works of nature coexist with the intellectual new Omicron Epsilon Rho Iota Omicron, spiritual light of the Father. For it is the soul Psi Upsilon Chi Epsilon which adorn the great heaven, and which adorns it after the Father. The incorporeal world then was already completed, having its seat in the divine reason, says Philo who was erroneously accused of deriving his philosophy from Plato's. In the Theogony of Mochus, we find ether first, and then the air, the two principles from which all am, the intelligible new Omicron Epsilon Tau Omicron Sigma God, the visible universe of matter, is born. In the Orphic hymns, the Eros Phanes evolves from the spiritual egg, which the ethereal winds impregnate, wind being the spirit of God, who is said to move in ether, brooding over the chaos the divine idea. In the Hindu Katakopanisid, Purusha, the divine spirit, already stands before the original matter, from whose union springs the great soul of the world, Ma equals Atma, Brahm, the spirit of life, these latter appellations are identical with the universal soul, or anima mundi, and the astral light of the theurgists and Kabbalists. Pythagoras brought his doctrines from the eastern sanctuaries, and Plato compiled them into a form more intelligible than the mysterious numerals of the sage whose doctrines he had fully embraced to the uninitiated mind. Thus, the cosmos is the sun with Plato, having for his father and mother the divine thought and matter. The Egyptians, says Dunlop, distinguish between an older and younger Horus, the former brother of Osiris, the latter the son of Osiris and Isis. The first is the idea of the world remaining in the demiurgic mind, born in darkness before the creation of the world. The second Horus is this idea going forth from the Logos, becoming clothed with matter, and assuming an actual existence. The mundane god, eternal, boundless, young and old, of winding form, say the Chaldean oracles. This winding form is a figure to express the vibratory motion of the astral light, with which the ancient priests were perfectly well. p. 57. Acquainted, though they may have differed in views of ether, with modern scientists, for in the ether they place the eternal idea pervading the universe, or the will which becomes force, and creates or organizes matter. The will, says Van Helmont, is the first of all powers. For through the will of the Creator all things were made and put in motion. The will is the property of all spiritual beings, and displays itself in them the more actively the more they are freed from matter. And Paracelsus, the divine, as he was called, adds in the same strain, faith must confirm the imagination, for faith establishes the will. Determined will is a beginning of all magical operations. Because men do not perfectly imagine and believe the result, is that the arts are uncertain, while they might be perfectly certain. The opposing power alone of unbelief and skepticism, if projected in a current of equal force, can check the other, and sometimes completely neutralize it. Why should spiritualists wonder that the presence of some strong skeptics, or of those who, feeling bitterly opposed to the phenomenon, unconsciously exercise their willpower in opposition, hinders and often stops altogether the manifestations? If there is no conscious power on earth but sometimes finds another to interfere with or even counterbalance it, why wonder when the unconscious, passive power of a medium is suddenly paralyzed in its effects by another opposing one, though it also be as unconsciously exercised? Professors Faraday and Tyndall boasted that their presence at a circle would stop at once every manifestation. This fact alone ought to have proved to the eminent scientists that there was some force in these phenomena worthy to arrest their attention. As a scientist, Professor Tyndall was perhaps preeminent in the circle of those who were present at the seance. As a shrewd observer, one not easily deceived by a tricking medium, he was perhaps no better, if as clever, as others in the room, and if the manifestations were but a fraud so ingenious as to deceive the others, they would not have stopped, even on his account. What medium can ever boast of such phenomena as were produced by Jesus, and the Apostle Paul after him? Yet even Jesus met with cases where the unconscious force of resistance overpowered even his so well-directed current of will. And he did not many mighty works there, because of their unbelief. There is a reflection of every one of these views in Schopenhauer's philosophy. Our investigating scientist might consult his works with profit. 
they will find there and many a strange hypothesis founded on old ideas, speculations on the new phenomena, which may prove as reasonable as any, and be saved the useless trouble of inventing new. p. 58. Theories. The psychic and actinic forces, the eumotor and electrobiological powers, latent thought and even unconscious cerebration theories, can be condensed in two words, the Kabbalistic astral light. The bold theories and opinions expressed in Schopenhauer's works differ widely with those of the majority of our orthodox scientists. In reality, remarks this daring speculator, there is neither matter nor spirit. The tendency to gravitation in a stone is as unexplainable as thought in human brain. If matter can no one knows why fall to the ground, then it can also no one knows why think. As soon, even in mechanics, as we trespass beyond the purely mathematical, as soon as we reach the inscrutable, adhesion gravitation, and so on, we are faced by phenomena which are to our senses as mysterious as the will and thought and one may find ourselves facing the incomprehensible, for such is every force in nature. Where is then that matter which you all pretend to know so well, and from which being so familiar with it you draw all your conclusions and explanations, and attribute to it all things? That, which can be fully realized by our reason and senses, is but the superficial, they can never reach the true inner substance of things. Such was the opinion of Kant. If you consider that there is in a human head some sort of a spirit, then you are obliged to concede the same to a stone. If your dead and utterly passive matter can manifest a tendency toward gravitation, or, like electricity, attract and repel, and send out sparks then, as well as the brain, it can also think. In short, every particle of the so-called spirit, we can replace with an equivalent of matter, and every particle of matter replace with spirit. Thus, it is not the Cartesian division of all things into matter and spirit that can ever be found philosophically exact, but only if we divide them into will and manifestation, which form of division has not to do with the former, for it spiritualizes everything, all that, which is in the first instance real and objective body and matter it transforms into a representation, and every manifestation into will. These views corroborate what we have expressed about the various names given to the same thing. The disputants are battling about mere words. Call the phenomena force, energy, electricity or magnetism, will, or spirit power, it will ever be the partial manifestation of the soul, whether disembodied or imprisoned for a while in its body of a portion of that intelligent, omnipotent, and individual will, pervading all nature, and known, through the insufficiency of human language to express correctly psychological images, as God. p. 59. The ideas of some of our schoolmen about matter are, from the Kabbalistic standing point, in many a way erroneous. Hartman calls their views an instinctual prejudice. Furthermore, he demonstrates that no experimenter can have anything to do with matter properly termed, but only with the forces into which he divides it. The visible effects of matter are but the effects of force. He concludes thereby, that that which is now called matter is nothing but the aggregation of atomic forces, to express which the word matter is used, outside of that for science matter is but a word void of sense. Notwithstanding many an honest confession on the part of our specialists physicists, physiologists and chemists that they know nothing whatever of matter, they deify it. Every new phenomenon which they find themselves unable to explain, is triturated, compounded into incense, and burned on the altar of the goddess who patronizes modern scientists. No one can better treat his subject than does Schopenhauer and his Perga. In this work he discusses at length animal magnetism, clairvoyance, sympathetic cures, seership, magic, omens, ghost-seeing, and other spiritual matters. All these manifestations, he says, are branches of one and the same tree, and furnish us with irrefutable proofs of the existence of a chain of beings which is based on quite a different order of things in that nature which has at its foundation laws of space, time and adaptability. This other order of things is far deeper, for it is the original and the direct one, in its presence the common laws of nature, which are simply formal, are unavailing, therefore, under its immediate action neither time nor space can separate any longer the individuals, and the separation impendent on these forms presents no more insurmountable barriers for the intercourse of thoughts and the immediate action of the will. In this manner changes may be wrought by quite a different course than the course of physical causality, i.e., through an action of the manifestation of the will exhibited in a peculiar way and outside the individual himself. Therefore the peculiar character of all the aforesaid manifestations is the visio in distante et actio in distante, vision and action at a distance, 
in its relation to time as well as in its relation to space. Such an action at a distance is just what constitutes the fundamental character of what is called magical, for such is the immediate action of our will, an action liberated from the causal conditions of physical action, viz., contact. Besides that, continues Schopenhauer, these manifestations present to us a substantial and perfectly logical contradiction to materialism, and even to naturalism, because in the light of such manifestations. p. 60. That order of things in nature which both these philosophies seek to present as absolute and the only genuine, appears before us on the contrary purely phenomenal and superficial, and containing at the bottom of it a substance of things a party and perfectly independent of its own laws. That is why these manifestations at least from a purely philosophical point of view among all the facts which are presented to us in the domain of experiment, are beyond any comparison the most important. Therefore, it is the duty of every scientist to acquaint himself with them. To pass from the philosophical speculations of a man like Schopenhauer to the superficial generalizations of some of the French academicians, would be profitless but for the fact that it enables us to estimate the intellectual grasp of the two schools of learning. What the German makes of profound psychological questions, we have seen. Compare with it the best that the astronomer Bobinet and the chemist Boussingal can offer by way of explaining an important spiritualistic phenomenon. In 1854-5 these distinguished specialists presented to the Academy a memoir, or monograph, whose evident object was to corroborate and at the same time make clear Dr. Chevreuil's too complicated theory and explanation of the turning tables, of the commission for the investigation of which he was a member. Here it is verbatim, as to the movements and oscillations alleged to happen with certain tables, they can have no cause other than the invisible and involuntary vibrations of the experimenter's muscular system, the extended contraction of the muscles manifesting itself at such time by a series of vibrations, and becoming thus a visible tremor which communicates to the object a circumrotary motion. This rotation is thus enabled to manifest itself with a considerable energy, by a gradually quickening motion, or by a strong resistance whenever it is required to stop. Hence the physical explanation of the phenomenon becomes clear and does not offer the slightest difficulty. None whatever. This scientific hypothesis or demonstration, shall we say, is as clear as one of M. Bobinet's nebulae examined on a foggy night. And still, clear as it may be, it lacks an important feature, i.e., common sense. We are at a loss to decide whether or not Bobinet accepts N. de Sespoir de Cos Hartmann's proposition that the visible effects of matter are nothing but the effects of a force, and, that in order to form a clear conception of matter, one must first form one of force. The philosophy to the school of which belongs Hartmann, and which is p. 61. Partly accepted by several of the greatest German scientists, teaches that the problem of matter can only be solved by that invisible force, acquaintance with which Schopenhauer terms the magical knowledge, and magical effect or action of will. Thus, we must first ascertain whether the involuntary vibrations of the experimenter's muscular system, which are but actions of matter, are influenced by a will within the experimenter or without. In the former case Bobinet makes of him an unconscious epileptic, the latter, as we will further see, he rejects altogether, and attributes all intelligent answers of the tipping or wrapping tables to unconscious ventriloquism. We know that every exertion of will results in force, and that, according to the above-named German school, the manifestations of atomic forces are individual actions of will, resulting in the unconscious rushing of atoms into the concrete image already subjectively created by the will. Democritus taught, after his instructor Leucippus, that the first principles of all things contained in the universe were atoms in a vacuum. In its Kabbalistic sense, the vacuum means in this instance the latent deity, or latent force, which at its first manifestation became will, and thus communicated the first impulse to these atoms whose agglomeration, is matter. This vacuum was but another name for chaos, and an unsatisfactory one, for, according to the peripatetics nature abhors a vacuum. That before Democritus the ancients were familiar with the idea of the indestructibility of matter is proved by their allegories and numerous other facts. Movers gives a definition of the Phoenician idea of the ideal sunlight as a spiritual influence issuing from the highest god, Yao, the light conceivable only by intellect the physical and spiritual principle of all things, out of which the soul emanates. It was the male essence, or wisdom, while the primitive matter or chaos was the female. Thus the two first principles co-eternal and infinite, were already with the primitive Phoenicians, spirit and matter. Therefore the theory is as old as the world, 
for Democritus was not the first philosopher who taught it, and intuition existed in man before the ultimate development of his reason. But it is in the denial of the boundless and endless entity, possessor of that invisible will which we for lack of a better term call God, that lies the powerlessness of every materialistic science to explain the occult phenomena. It is in the rejection a priori of everything which might force them to cross the boundary of exact science and step into the domain of psychological, or, if we prefer, metaphysical physiology, that we find the secret cause of their discomfiture by the manifestations, and their absurd theories to account for them. The ancient philosophy affirmed that it is in consequence of the manifestation of that will turn by Plato the divine idea that everything visible and invisible. p. 62. Sprung into existence. As that intelligent idea, which, by directing its sole willpower toward a center of localized forces called objective forms into being, so can man, the microcosm of the great macrocosm, do the same in proportion with the development of his willpower. The imaginary atoms a figure of speech employed by Democritus, and gratefully seized upon by the materialists are like automatic workmen moved inward e by the influx of that universal will directed upon them, and which, manifesting itself as force, sets them into activity. The plan of the structure to be erected is in the brain of the architect, and reflects his will, abstract as yet, from the instant of the conception it becomes concrete through these atoms which follow faithfully every line, point and figure trace in the imagination of the divine geometer. As God creates, so man can create. Given a certain intensity of will, and the shapes created by the mind become subjective. Hallucinations, they are called, although to their creator they are real as any visible object is to anyone else. Given a more intense and intelligent concentration of this will, and the form becomes concrete, visible, objective, the man has learned the secret of secrets, he is a magician. The materialist should not object to this logic, for he regards thought as matter. Conceding it to be so, the cunning mechanism contrived by the inventor, the fairy scenes born in the poet's brain, the gorgeous painting limbed by the artist's fancy, the peerless statue chiseled in ether by the sculptor, the palaces and castles built in air by the architect all these, though invisible and subjective, must exist, for they are matter, shaped and molded. Who shall say, then, that there are not some men of such imperial will as to be able to drag these air-drawn fancies into view, enveloped in the hard casing of gross substance to make them tangible? If the French scientists reaped no laurels in the new field of investigation, what more was done in England? until the day when Mr. Crooks offered himself an atonement for the sins of the learned body? Why, Mr. Faraday, some twenty years ago, actually condescended to be spoken to once or twice upon the subject. Faraday, whose name is pronounced by the anti-spiritualists in every discussion upon the phenomena, as a sort of scientific charm against the evil eye of spiritualism, Faraday, who blushed for having published his researches upon such a degrading belief, is now proved on good authority to have never sat at a tipping table himself at all. We have but to open a few stray numbers of the journal des Debats, published while a noted Scotch medium was in England, to recall the past events in all their primitive freshness. In one of these numbers, Dr. Foucault, of Paris, comes out as a champion for the eminent English experimenter. Pray, do not imagine, says he. P. 63 that the grand physicist had ever himself condescended so far as to sit prosaically at a jumping table. Whence, then, came the blushes which suffused the cheeks of the father of experimental philosophy? Remembering this fact, we will now examine the nature of Faraday's beautiful indicator, the extraordinary medium catcher, invented by him for the detection of mediumistic fraud. That complicated machine, the memory of which haunts like a nightmare the dreams of dishonest mediums, is carefully described in Comte de Marvel's Question d'Esprit. The better to prove to the experimenters the reality of their own impulsion, Professor Faraday placed several cardboard discs, united to each other and stuck to the table by a half-soft glue, which, making the whole adhere for a time together, would, nevertheless, yield to a continuous pressure. Now, the table having turned yes, actually having dared to turn before Mr. Faraday, which fact is of some value, at least the discs were examined, and, as they were found to have gradually displaced themselves by slipping in the same direction as the table, it thus became an unquestionable proof that the experimenters had pushed the tables themselves. Another of the so-called scientific tests, so useful in a phenomenon alleged to be either spiritual or psychical, consisted of a small instrument which immediately warned the witnesses of the slightest personal impulsion on their part, or rather, according to Mr. Faraday's own expression, 
It warned them when they changed from the passive to the active state. This needle which betrayed the active motion proved but one thing, viz, the action of a force which either emanated from the sitters or controlled them. And who has ever said that there is no such force? Every one admits so much, whether this force passes through the operator, as it is generally shown, or acts independently of him, as is so often the case. The whole mystery consisted in the disproportion of the force employed by the operators, who pushed because they were forced to push, with certain effects of rotation, or rather, of a really marvelous race. In the presence of such prodigious effects, how could any one imagine that the Lilliputian experiments of that kind could have any value in this newly discovered land of giants? Professor Agassiz, who occupied in America nearly the same eminent position as the scientist which Mr. Faraday did in England, acted with a still greater unfairness. Professor J. R. Buchanan, the distinguished anthropologist, who has treated spiritualism in some respects more scientifically than anyone else in America, speaks of Agassiz, in a recent article, with p. 64. A very just indignation. For, of all other men, Professor Agassiz ought to believe in a phenomenon to which he had been a subject himself. But now that both Faraday and Agassiz are themselves disembodied, we can do better by questioning the living than the dead. Thus a force whose secret powers were thoroughly familiar to the ancient theurgists, is denied by modern skeptics. The antediluvian children who perhaps played with it, using it as the boys and bull were light in coming race, used the tremendous frio called it the water of the, their descendants named it the animal mundi, the soul of the universe, and still later the medieval hermetists termed it sidereal light, or the milk of the celestial virgin, the magnus, and many other names. But our modern learned men will neither accept nor recognize it under such appellations, for it pertains to magic, and magic is, in their conception, a disgraceful superstition. Apollonius and Iamblichus held that it was not in the knowledge of things without, but in the perfection of the soul within, that lies the empire of man, aspiring to be more than men. Thus they had arrived at a perfect cognizance of their godlike souls, the powers of which they used with all the wisdom, outgrowth of esoteric study of the hermetic lore, inherited by them from their forefathers. But our philosophers, tightly shutting themselves up in their shells of flesh, cannot or dare not carry their timid gaze beyond the comprehensible. For them there is no future life, there are no godlike dreams, they scorn them as unscientific, for them the men of old are but ignorant ancestors, as they express it, and whenever they meet during their physiological researches with an author who believes that this mysterious yearning after spiritual knowledge is inherent in every human being, and cannot have been given us utterly in vain, they regard him with contemptuous pity. Says a Persian proverb, the darker the sky is, the brighter the stars will shine. Thus, on the dark firmament of the medieval ages began appearing the mysterious brothers of the rosy cross. They formed no associations, they built no colleges, for, hunted up and down like so many wild beasts, when caught by the Christian church, they were unceremoniously roasted. As religion forbids it, says Baal, to spill blood, therefore, to elude the maxim, ecclesia non novit sanguinum, they burn human beings, as burning a man does not shed his blood. Many of these mystics, by following what they were taught by some treatises, secretly preserved from one generation to another, achieved discoveries which would not be despised even in our modern days of exact sciences. Roger Bacon, the friar, was laughed at as a quack, and p. 65 is now generally numbered among pretenders to magic art, but his discoveries were nevertheless accepted, and are now used by those who ridicule him the most. Roger Bacon belonged by right if not by fact to that brotherhood which includes all those who study the occult sciences. Living in the 13th century, almost a contemporary, therefore, of Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas, his discoveries such as gunpowder and optical glasses, and his mechanical achievements were considered by every one as so many miracles. He was accused of having made a compact with the evil one. In the legendary history of Friar Bacon, as well as in an old play written by Robert Greene, a dramatist in the days of Queen Elizabeth, it is recounted, that, having been summoned before the king, the friar was induced to show some of his skill before Her Majesty the Queen. So he waved his hand, his wand, says the text, and presently was heard such excellent music, that they all said they had never heard the like. Then there was heard a still louder music and four apparitions suddenly presented themselves and danced until they vanished and disappeared in the air. Then he waved his wand again, and suddenly there was such a smell as if all the rich perfumes in the whole world had been there prepared in the best manner that art could set them out. 
Then Roger Bacon having promised the gentleman to show him a sweetheart, he pulled a hanging in the king's apartment aside and every one in the room saw a kitchen maid with a basting ladle in her hand. The proud gentleman, although he recognized the maiden who disappeared as suddenly as she had appeared, was enraged at the humiliating spectacle, and threatened the friar with his revenge. What does the magician do? He simply answers, threaten not, lest I do more shame, and do you take heed how you give scholars the lie again. As a commentary on this, the modern historian remarks, this may be taken as a sort of exemplification of the class of exhibitions which were probably the result of a superior knowledge of natural sciences. No one ever doubted that it was the result of precisely such a knowledge, and the hermetists, magicians, astrologers and alchemists never claimed anything else. It certainly was not their fault that the ignorant masses, under the influence of an unscrupulous and fanatical clergy, should have attributed all such works to the agency of the devil. In view of the atrocious tortures provided by the Inquisition for all suspected of either black or white magic, it is not strange that these philosophers neither boasted nor even acknowledged the fact of such an intercourse. On the contrary, their own writings prove that they held that magic is no more than the p. 66. Application of natural active causes to passive things or subjects, by means thereof, many tremendously surprising but yet natural effects are produced. The phenomena of the mystic odors and music, exhibited by Roger Bacon, have been often observed in our own time. To say nothing of our personal experience, we are informed by English correspondents of the Theosophical Society that they have heard strains of the most ravishing music, coming from no visible instrument, and inhaled a succession of delightful odors produced, as they believed, by spirit agency. One correspondent tells us that so powerful was one of these familiar odors that of sandalwood that the house would be impregnated with it for weeks after the sounds. The medium in this case was a member of a private family, and the experiments were all made within the domestic circle. Another describes what he calls a musical rap. The potencies that are now capable of producing these phenomena must have existed and been equally efficacious in the days of Roger Bacon. As to the apparitions, it suffices to say that they are evoked now in spiritualistic circles, and guaranteed by scientists, and their evocation by Roger Bacon is thus made more probable than ever. Bacci Supporta, in his treatise on natural magic, enumerates a whole catalogue of secret formulae for producing extraordinary effects by employing the occult powers of nature. Although the magicians believed as firmly as our spiritualists in a world of invisible spirits, None of them claimed to produce his effects under their control or through their sole help. They knew too well how difficult it is to keep away the elementary creatures when they have once found the door wide open. Even the magic of the ancient Chaldeans was but a profound knowledge of the powers of simples and minerals. It was only when the theurgist desired divine help in spiritual and earthly matters that he sought direct communication through religious rites, with pure spiritual beings. With them, even... Those spirits who remain invisible and communicate with mortals through their awakened inner senses, as in clairvoyance, clairaudience and trance, could only be evoked subjectively and as a result of purity of life and prayer. But all physical phenomena were produced simply by applying the knowledge of natural forces, although certainly not by the method of ledger domain, practiced in our days by conjurers. Men possess of such knowledge and exercising such powers patiently toil for something better than the vain glory of a passing fame. Seeking it not, they became immortal, as do all who labor for the good of the race, forgetful of mean self. Illuminated with the light of eternal truth, these rich poor alchemists fix their attention upon the things that lie beyond the common ken, recognizing nothing inscrutable but the first. p. 67. Cause, and finding no question unsolvable. To dare, to know, to will, and remain silent, was their constant rule, to be beneficent, unselfish and unpretending, were, with them, spontaneous impulses. Disdaining the rewards of petty traffic, spurning wealth, luxury, pomp, and worldly power, they aspired to knowledge as the most satisfying of all acquisitions. They esteemed poverty, hunger, toil, and the evil report of men, as none too great a price to pay for its achievement. They, who might have lain on downing, velvet-covered beds, suffered themselves to die in hospitals and by the wayside rather than debase their souls and allow the profane cupidity of those who tempted them to triumph over their sacred vows. The lives of Paracelsus, Cornelius Agrippa, and Philoethes are too well known to repeat the old, sad story. If spiritualists are anxious to keep strictly dogmatic in their notions of the spirit world, they must not set scientists to investigate their phenomena in the true experimental spirit. 
The attempt would most surely result in a partial rediscovery of the magic of old that of Moses and Paracelsus. Under the deceptive beauty of some of their apparitions, they might find some day the sylphs and fair undines of the Rosicrucians playing in the currents of psychic and otic force. Already Mr. Crooks, who fully credits the beam, feels that under the fair skin of Katie, covering a simulacrum of heart borrowed partially from the medium and the circle, there is no soul. And the learned authors of the unseen universe, abandoning their electrobiological theory, begin to perceive in the universal ether the possibility that it is a photographic album of Ensof the Boundless. We are far from believing that all the spirits that communicate at circles are of the classes called elemental, and elementary. Many especially among those who control the medium subjectively to speak, write, and otherwise act in various ways are human, disembodied spirits. Whether the majority of such spirits are good or bad, largely depends on the private morality of the medium, much on the circle present, and a great deal on the intensity and object of their purpose. If this object is merely to gratify curiosity and to pass the time, it is useless to expect anything serious. But, in any case, human spirits can never materialize themselves in propria persona. These can never appear to the investigator clothed with warm, solid flesh, sweating hands and faces, and grossly material bodies. The most they can do is to project their ethereal reflection on the atmospheric waves, and if the touch of their hands and clothing can become upon rare occasions objective to the senses of a living mortal, it will be felt as a passing breeze gently sweeping over the touch spot, not as a human hand or material body. It is useless to plead that the materialized spirits that have exhibited themselves with p. 68. Beating hearts and loud voices, with or without a trumpet, are human spirits. The voices if such sound can be termed a voice at all of a spiritual apparition once heard can hardly be forgotten. That of a pure spirit is like the tremulous murmur of an Aeolian harp echoed from a distance, the voice of a suffering, hence impure, if not utterly bad spirit, may be assimilated to a human voice issuing from an empty barrel. This is not our philosophy, but that of the numberless generations of theurgists and magicians, and based upon their practical experience. The testimony of antiquity is positive on the subject, delta alpha iota mu omicron nu iota omicron iota nu phi omicron nu alpha iota alpha nu alpha rho theta rho omicron iota epsilon iota sigma iota. The voices of spirits are not articulated. The spirit voice consists of a series of sounds which conveys the impression of a column of compressed air ascending from beneath upward, and spreading around the living interlocutor. The many eyewitnesses who testified in the case of Elizabeth Esslinger, namely, the deputy governor of the prison of Weinsberg, Meyer, Eckhart, Thur, and Knorr, sworn evidence, Duddenhofer, and Kopp, the mathematician, testified that they saw the apparition like a pillar of clouds. For the space of eleven weeks, Dr. Kerner and his sons, several Lutheran ministers, the advocate Fraz, the engraver Duddenhofer, two physicians, Seifer and Zischer, the judge Hade, and the Baron von Hugel, with many others, followed this manifestation daily. During the time it lasted, the prisoner Elizabeth prayed with a loud voice uninterruptedly. Therefore, as the spirit was talking at the same time, it could be no ventriloquism, and that voice, they say, had nothing human in it, no one could imitate its sounds. Further on we will give abundant proofs from ancient authors concerning this neglected truism. We will now only again assert that no spirit claimed by the spiritualist to be human was ever proved to be such on sufficient testimony. The influence of the disembodied ones can be felt, and communicated subjectively by them to sensitives. They can produce objective manifestations, but they cannot produce themselves otherwise than as described above. They can control the body of a medium, and express their desires and ideas in various modes well known to spiritualists but not materialize what is matterless and purely spiritual their divine essence. Thus every so-called materialization when genuine is either produced, perhaps, by the will of that spirit whom the appearance is claimed to be but can only personate at best, or by the elementary goblins themselves, which are generally too stupid to deserve the honor of being called devils. Upon rare occasions the spirits are able to subdue and control these soulless beings, which are ever ready to. p. 69. Assume pompous names if left to themselves, in such a way that the mischievous spirit of the air, shaped in the real image of the human spirit, will be moved by the latter like a marionette, and unable to either act or utter other words than those imposed on him by the immortal soul. 
but this requires many conditions generally unknown to the circles of even spiritualists most in the habit of regularly attending seances. Not every one can attract human spirits who likes. One of the most powerful attractions of our departed ones is their strong affection for those whom they have left on earth. It draws them irresistibly, by degrees, into the current of the astral light vibrating between the person sympathetic to them and the universal soul. Another very important condition is harmony, and the magnetic purity of the person's present. If this philosophy is wrong, if all the materialized forms emerging in darkened rooms from still darker cabinets, are spirits of men who once lived upon this earth, why such a difference between them and the ghosts that appear unexpectedly ex abrupto without either cabinet or medium? Whoever heard of the apparitions, unrestful souls, hovering about the spots where they were martyred, or coming back for some other mysterious reasons of their own, with warm hands feeling like living flesh, and but that they are known to be dead and buried, not distinguishable from living mortals? We have well attested facts of such apparitions making themselves suddenly visible, but never, until the beginning of the era of the materializations, did we see anything like them. In the medium and daybreak, of September 8, 1876, we read a letter from a lady traveling on the continent, narrating a circumstance that happened in a haunted house. She says, A strange sound proceeded from a darkened corner of the library. On looking up she perceived a cloud or column of luminous vapor. The earthbound spirit was hovering about the spot rendered accursed by his evil deed. As this spirit was doubtless a genuine elementary apparition, which made itself visible of its own free will in short, in umbra it was, as every respectable shadow should be, visible but impalpable, or if palpable at all, communicating to the failing of touch the sensation of a mass of water suddenly clasped in the hand, or of condensed but cold steam. It was luminous and vapory, for all we can tell it might have been the real personal umbra of the spirit, persecuted, and earthbound, either by its own remorse and crimes or those of another person or spirit. The mysteries of after death are many, and modern materializations only make them cheap and ridiculous in the eyes of the indifferent. To these assertions may be opposed a fact well known among spiritualists, the writer has publicly certified to having seen such materialized forms. We have most assuredly done so, and are ready to repeat the p. 70. Testimony. We have recognized such figures as the visible representations of acquaintances, friends, and even relatives. We have in company with many other spectators, heard them pronounce words and languages unfamiliar not only to the medium and to everyone else in the room, except ourselves, but, in some cases, to almost if not quite every medium in America and Europe, for they were the tongues of eastern tribes and peoples. At the time, these instances were justly regarded as conclusive proofs of the genuine mediumship of the uneducated Vermont farmer who sat in the cabinet. But, nevertheless, these figures were not the forms of the persons they appeared to be. They were simply their portrait statues, constructed, animated and operated by the elementaries. If we have not previously elucidated this point, it was because the spiritualistic public was not then ready to even listen to the fundamental proposition that there are elemental and elementary spirits. Since that time this subject has been broached and more or less widely discussed. There is less hazard now in attempting to launch upon the restless sea of criticism the hoary philosophy of the ancient sages, for there has been some preparation of the public mind to consider it with impartiality and deliberation. Two years of agitation have effected a marked change for the better. Pausanias writes that 400 years after the Battle of Marathon, there were still heard in the place where it was fought, the neighing of horses and the shouts of shadowy soldiers. Supposing that the specters of the slaughtered soldiers were their genuine spirits, they looked like shadows, not materialized men. Who, then, or what, produced the neighing of horses? Equine spirits? And if it be pronounced untrue that horses have spirits which assuredly no one among zoologists, physiologists or psychologists, or even spiritualists, can either prove or disprove them must we take it for granted that it was the immortal souls of men which produced the neighing at Marathon to make the historical battle seem more vivid and dramatic? The phantoms of dogs, cats, and various other animals have been repeatedly seen, and the worldwide testimony is as trustworthy upon this point as that with respect to human apparitions. Who or what personates, if we are allowed such an expression, the ghost of departed animals? Is it, again, human spirits? As the matter now stands, there is no side issue, we have either to admit that animals have surviving spirits and souls as well as ourselves, 
or hold with porphyry that there are in the invisible world a kind of tricky and malicious demons, intermediary beings between living men and gods, spirits that delight in appearing under every imaginable shape, beginning with the human form, and ending with those of multifarious animals. p. 71. Before venturing to decide the question whether the spectral animal forms so frequently seen and attested are the returning spirits of dead beasts, we must carefully consider their reported behavior. Do these specters act according to the habits and display the same instincts, as the animals during life? Do the spectral beasts of prey lie in wait for victims, and timid animals flee before the presence of man, or do the latter show a malevolence and disposition to annoy, quite foreign to their natures? Many victims of these obsessions notably, the afflicted persons of Salem and other historical witchcrafts testify to having seen dogs, cats, pigs, and other animals, entering their rooms, fighting them, trampling upon their sleeping bodies, and talking to them, often inciting them to suicide and other crimes. In the well-attested case of Elizabeth Esslinger, mentioned by Dr. Kerner, the apparition of the ancient priest of Wimenthal was accompanied by a large black dog, which he called his father, and which dog in the presence of numerous witnesses jumped on all the beds of the prisoners. At another time the priest appeared with a lamb, and sometimes with two lambs. Most of those accused at Salem were charged by the seeresses with consulting and plotting mischief with yellow birds, which would sit on their shoulder or on the beams overhead. And unless we discredit the testimony of thousands of witnesses, in all parts of the world, and in all ages, and allow monopoly of seership to modern mediums, Spectre animals do appear and manifest all the worst traits of depraved human nature, without themselves being human. What, then, can they be but elementals? Descartes was one of the few who believed and dared say that to occult medicine we shall owe discoveries destined to extend the domain of philosophy, and Briere de Beaumont not only shared in these hopes but openly avowed his sympathy with supernaturalism, which he considered the universal grand creed, we think with Guizot, he says, that the existence of society is bound up in it. It is in vain that modern reason, which, notwithstanding its positivism, cannot explain the intimate cause of any phenomena, rejects the supernatural, it is universal, and at the root of all hearts. The most elevated minds are frequently its most ardent disciples. Christopher Columbus discovered America, and America's Vespucius reaped the glory and usurped his dues. Theophrastus Paracelsus rediscovered the occult properties of the magnet the bone of Horus which, twelve centuries before his time, had played such an important part in the theurgic mysteries and he very naturally became the founder. p. 72. Of the school of magnetism and of medieval magico theurgy. But Mesmer, who lived nearly three hundred years after him, and as a disciple of his school brought the magnetic wonders before the public, reaped the glory that was due to the fire philosopher while the great master died in the hospital. So goes the world, new discoveries, evolving from old sciences, new men same old nature. Chapter 3. The mirror of the soul cannot reflect both earth and heaven, and the one vanishes from its surface, as the other is glass upon its deep. Zanoni. Qui, donc, ta dans la mission d'annoncer au peuple que la divinat n'existe pas quel avantage trouve to a persuader alone can force of ugle preside a se destinies et frappe au hasard le crime et la vertu? Robespierre, Discours, May 7, 1794. We believe that few of those physical phenomena which are genuine are caused by disembodied human spirits. Still, even those that are produced by occult forces of nature, such as happen through a few genuine mediums, and are consciously employed by the so-called jugglers of India and Egypt, deserve a careful and serious investigation by science, especially now that a number of respected authorities have testified that in many cases the hypothesis of fraud does not hold. No doubt, there are professed conjurers who can perform cleverer tricks than all the American and English John Kings together. Robert Houdin unquestionably could, but this did not prevent his laughing outright in the face of the academicians, when they desired him to assert in the newspapers that he could make a table move, or wrap answers to questions, without contact of hands, unless the table was a prepared one. The fact alone, that a now notorious London juggler refused to accept the challenge for one thousand pound offered him by Mr. Algernon Joy, to produce such manifestations as are usually obtained through mediums, unless he was left unbound and free from the hands of a committee, negatives his expose of the occult phenomena. Clever as he may be, we defy and challenge him to reproduce, under the same conditions, the tricks exhibited even by a common Indian juggler. For instance, the spot to be chosen by the investigators at the moment of the performance, and the juggler to know nothing of the choice, 
the experiment to be made in broad daylight, without the least preparations for it, without any confederate but a boy absolutely naked, and the juggler to be in a condition of semi-nudity. After that, we should select out of a variety three tricks, the most common among such public jugglers, and that were recently exhibited to some gentlemen belonging to. P. 74. The Suite of the Prince of Wales. 1. To transform a rupee firmly clasped in the hand of a skeptic into a living cobra, the bite of which would prove fatal, as an examination of its fangs would show. 2. To cause a seed chosen at random by the spectators, implanted in the first semblance of a flower pot, furnished by the same skeptics, to grow, mature, and bear fruit in less than a quarter of an hour. 3. To stretch himself on three swords, stuck perpendicularly in the ground at their hilts, the sharp points upward, after that to have removed first one of the swords, then the other, and, after an interval of a few seconds, the last one, the juggler remaining, finally, lying on nothing on the air, miraculously suspended at about one yard from the ground. When any prestidigitator, to begin with Udine and end with the last trickster who has secured gratuitous advertisement by attacking spiritualism, does the same, then but only then we will train ourselves to believe that mankind has been evolved out of the hind toe of Mr. Huxley's Eocene Orohippus. We assert again, in full confidence, that there does not exist a professional wizard, either of the north, south or west, who can compete with anything approaching success, with these untutored, naked sons of the east. These require no Egyptian hall for their performances, nor any preparations or rehearsals, but are ever ready, at a moment's notice, to evoke to their help the hidden powers of nature, which, for European prestidigitators as well as for scientists, are a closed book. Verily, as Elihu puts it, great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. To repeat the remark of the English divine, Dr. Henry Moore, we may well say, indeed, if there were any modesty left in mankind, the histories of the Bible might abundantly assure men of the existence of angels and spirits. The same eminent man adds, I look upon it as a special piece of providence that, Fresh examples of apparitions may awaken our benumbed and lethargic minds into an assurance that there are other intelligent beings besides those that are clothed in heavy earth or clay, for this evidence, showing that there are bad spirits, will necessarily open a door to the belief that there are good ones, and lastly, that there is a God. The instance above given carries a moral with it, not only to scientists, but theologians. Men who have made their mark in the pulpit and in professors' chairs, are continually showing the lay public that they really know so little of psychology, as to take up with any plausible schemer who comes their way, and so make themselves ridiculous in the eyes of the thoughtful student. Public opinion upon this subject has been manufactured by jugglers and self-styled savants, unworthy of respectful consideration. p. 75. The development of psychological science has been retarded far more by the ridicule of this class of pretenders, than by the inherent difficulties of its study. The empty laugh of the scientific nursling or of the fools of fashion, has done more to keep man ignorant of his imperial psychical powers, than the obscurities, the obstacles and the dangers that cluster about the subject. This is especially the case with spiritualistic phenomena. That their investigation has been so largely confined to incapables, is due to the fact that men of science, who might and would have studied them, have been frightened off by the boasted exposures, the paltry jokes, and the impertinent clamor of those who are not worthy to tie their shoes. There are moral cowards even in university chairs. The inherent vitality of modern spiritualism is proven in its survival of the neglect of the scientific body, and of the obstreperous boasting of its pretended exposers. If we begin with the contemptuous sneers of the patriarchs of science, such as Faraday and Brewster, and end with the professional, exposes of the successful mimicker of the phenomena, Dash, of London, we will not find them furnishing one single, well-established argument against the occurrence of spiritual manifestations. My theory is, says this individual, in his recent Swatis on Expose, that Mr. Williams dressed up and personified John King and Peter. Nobody can prove that it wasn't so. Thus it appears that, notwithstanding the bold tone of assertion, it is but a theory after all, and spiritualists might well retort upon the exposer, and demand that he should prove that it is so. But the most inveterate, uncompromising enemies of spiritualism are a class very fortunately composed of but few members, who, nevertheless, declaim the louder and assert their views with a clamorousness worthy of a better cause. These are the pretenders to science of young America, a mongrel class of pseudo-philosophers, mentioned at the opening of this chapter, 
with sometimes no better right to be regarded as scholars than the possession of an electrical machine, or the delivery of a puerile lecture on insanity and meaty mania. Such men are if you believe them profound thinkers and physiologists, there is none of your metaphysical nonsense about them, they are positivists the mental sucklings of Auguste Comte, whose bosoms swell at the thought of plucking deluded humanity from the dark abyss of superstition, and rebuilding the cosmos on improved principles. Irascible psychophobists, no more cutting insult can be offered them than to suggest that they may be endowed with immortal spirits. To hear them, one would fancy that there can be no other souls in men and women than scientific or unscientific souls, whatever that kind of soul may be. p. 76. Some thirty or forty years ago, in France, Auguste Comte a pupil of the École Polytechnique, who had remained for years at that establishment as a repetitor of transcendent analysis and rationalistic mechanics awoke one fine morning with the very irrational idea of becoming a prophet. In America, prophets can be met with at every street corner, in Europe, they are as rare as black swans. But France is the land of novelties. Auguste Combe became a prophet, and so infectious his fashion, sometimes, that even in sober England he was considered, for a certain time, the Newton of the nineteenth century. The epidemic extended, and for the time being, it spread like wildfire over Germany, England, and America. It found adepts in France, but the excitement did not last long with these. The prophet needed money, the disciples were unwilling to furnish it. The fever of admiration for a religion without a god cooled off as quickly as it had come on. Of all the enthusiastic apostles of the prophet, there remained but one worthy of any attention. It was the famous philologist Latre a member of the French Institute, and a would-be member of the Imperial Academy of Sciences, but whom the Archbishop of Orleans maliciously prevented from becoming one of the immortals. The philosopher-mathematician the high priest of the religion of the future taught his doctrine as do all his brother prophets of our modern days. He deified woman, and furnished her with an altar, but the goddess had to pay for its use. The rationalists had laughed at the mental aberration of Fourier, they had laughed at the Saint Simonist and their scorn for spiritualism knew no bounds. The same rationalists and materialists were caught, like so many empty-headed sparrows, by the burlam of the new prophet's rhetoric. A longing for some kind of divinity, a craving for the unknown, is a feeling congenital in man, hence the worst atheists seem not to be exempt from it. Deceived by the outward brilliancy of the Ignis Fatuus, the disciples followed it until they found themselves floundering in a bottomless morass. Covering themselves with the mask of a pretended erudition, the positivists of this country have organized themselves into clubs and committees with the design of uprooting spiritualism, while pretending to impartially investigate it. Too timid to openly challenge the churches in the Christian doctrine, they endeavor to sap that upon which all religion is based man's faith in God and his own immortality. Their policy is to ridicule that which affords an unusual basis for such a faith phenomenal spiritualism. p. 77 Attacking it at its weakest side, they make the most of its lack of an inductive method, and of the exaggerations that are to be found in the transcendental doctrines of its propagandists. Taking advantage of its unpopularity, and displaying a courage as furious and out of place as that of the errant knight of La Mancha, they claim recognition as philanthropists and benefactors who would crush out a monstrous superstition. Let us see in what degree Combs boasted religion of the future is superior to spiritualism, and how much less likely its advocates are to need the refuge of those lunatic asylums which they officiously recommend for the mediums whom they have been so solicitous about. Before beginning, let us call attention to the fact that three-fourths of the disgraceful features exhibited in modern spiritualism are directly traceable to the materialistic adventurers pretending to be spiritualists. Comte has fulsomely depicted the artificially fecundated woman of the future. She is but elder sister to the Cyprian ideal of the free lovers. The immunity against the future offered by the teachings of his moonstruck disciples, has inoculated some pseudo-spiritualists to such an extent as to lead them to form communistic associations. None, however, have proved long-lived. Their leading feature being generally a materialistic animalism, gilded over with a thin leaf of Dutch metal philosophy and tricked out with a combination of hard Greek names, the community could not prove anything else than a failure. Plato, in the Fifth Book of the Republic, suggests a method for improving the human race by the elimination of the unhealthy or deformed individuals, and by coupling the better specimens of both sexes. It was not to be expected that the genius of our century, even were he a prophet, would squeeze out of his brain anything entirely new. Combe was a mathematician. 
cleverly combining several old utopias, he colored the whole, and, improving on Plato's idea, materialized it, and presented the world with the greatest monstrosity that ever emanated from a human mind. We beg the reader to keep in view, that we do not attack Comte as a philosopher, but as a professed reformer. In the irremediable darkness of his political, philosophical and religious views, we often meet with isolated observations and remarks in which profound logic and judiciousness of thought rival the brilliancy of their interpretation. But then, these dazzle you like flashes of lightning on a gloomy night, to leave you, the next moment, more in the dark than ever. If condensed and repunctuated, his several works might produce, on the whole, a volume of very original aphorisms, giving a very clear and really clever definition of most of our social evils, but it would be vain to seek, either through the tedious circumlocution of the six volumes of his Carta Philosophy, p. 78, positive, or in that parody on priesthood, in the form of a dialogue the catechism of the religion of positivism any idea suggestive of even provisional remedies for such evils. His disciples suggest that the sublime doctrines of their prophet were not intended for the vulgar. Comparing the dogmas preached by positivism with their practical exemplifications by its apostles, we must confess the possibility of some very achromatic doctrine being at the bottom of it. While the high priest preaches that woman must cease to be the female of the man, while the theory of the positivist legislators on marriage and the family, chiefly consists in making the woman the mere companion of man by ridding her of every maternal function, and while they are preparing against the future a substitute for that function by applying to the chaste woman a latent force, some of its lay priests openly preach polygamy, and others affirm that their doctrines are the quintessence of spiritual philosophy. In the opinion of the Romish clergy, who labor under a chronic nightmare of the devil, Comte offers his woman of the future to the possession of the incubi. In the opinion of more prosaic persons, the divinity of positivism must henceforth be regarded as a biped broodmare. Even Latre made prudent restrictions while accepting the apostleship of this marvelous religion. This is what he wrote in 1859. M. Comte not only thought that he found the principles, traced the outlines, and furnished the method, but that he had deduced the consequences and constructed the social and religious edifice of the future. It is in this second division that we make our reservations, declaring, at the same time, that we accept as an inheritance, the whole of the first. Further, he says, M. Comte, and a grand work entitled The System of the Positive Philosophy, establish the basis of a philosophy, which must finally supplant every theology in the whole of metaphysics. Such a work necessarily contains a direct application to the government of societies, as it has nothing arbitrary in it, and as we find there in a real science, my adhesion to the principles involves my adhesion to the essential consequences. M. Latre has shown himself in the light of a true son of his prophet. Indeed the whole system of Comte appears to us to have been built on a play of words. When they say positivism, read nihilism, when you hear the word chastity, know that it means impudicity, and so on. P. 79. Being a religion based on a theory of negation, its adherents can hardly carry it out practically without saying white when meaning black. Positive philosophy, continues Latre, does not accept atheism, for the atheist is not a really emancipated mind, but is, in his own way, a theologian still, he gives his explanation about the essence of things, he knows how they began, atheism is pantheism, this system is quite theological yet, and thus belongs to the ancient party. It really would be losing time to quote any more of these paradoxical dissertations. Combe attained to the apotheosis of absurdity and inconsistency when, after inventing his philosophy, he named it a religion. And, as is usually the case, the disciples have surpassed the reformer in absurdity. Suppositious philosophers, who shine in the American academies of Combe, like a lampire's noctiluca beside a planet, leave us in no doubt as to their belief, and contrast that system of thought and life elaborated by the French apostle with the idiocy of spiritualism, of course to the advantage of the former. To destroy, you must replace, exclaims the author of the Catechism of the Religion of Positivism, quoting Cassadier, by the way, without crediting him with the thought, and his disciples proceed to show by what sort of a loathsome system they are anxious to replace Christianity, spiritualism, and even science. Positivism, parades one of them, is an integral doctrine. It rejects completely all forms of theological and metaphysical belief, all forms of supernaturalism, and thus spiritualism. 
The true positive spirit consists in substituting the study of the invariable laws of phenomena for that of their so-called causes, whether proximate or primary. On this ground it equally rejects atheism, for the atheist is at bottom a theologian, he adds, plagiarizing sentences from Latre's works, the atheist does not reject the problems of theology, only the solution of these, and so he is illogical. We positivists reject the problem and are turned on the ground that it is utterly inaccessible to the intellect, and we would only waste our strength in a vain search for first and final causes. As you see, positivism gives a complete explanation, of the world, of man, his duty and destiny. Very brilliant this, and now, by way of contrast, we will quote what a really great scientist, Professor Hare, thinks of this system. Kohn's positive philosophy, he says, after all, is merely negative. It is admitted by Kohn, that he knows nothing of the sources and causes of nature's laws, that their origination is so perfectly inscrutable as to make it idle to. p. 80. Take up time and any scrutiny for that purpose. Of course his doctrine makes him avowedly a thorough ignoramus, as to the causes of laws, or the means by which they are established, and can have no basis but the negative argument above stated, in objecting to the facts ascertained in relation to the spiritual creation. Thus, while allowing the atheist his material dominion, spiritualism will erect within and above the same space a dominion of an importance as much greater as eternity is to the average duration of human life, and as the boundless regions of the fixed stars are to the habitable area of this globe. In short, positivism proposes to itself to destroy theology, metaphysics, spiritualism, atheism, materialism, pantheism, and science, and it must finally end in destroying itself. De Merville thinks that according to positivism, order will begin to reign in the human mind only on the day when psychology will become a sort of cerebral physics, and history a kind of social physics. The modern Muhammad first disburdens man and woman of God in their own soul, and then unwittingly disembowels his own doctrine with the too sharp sword of metaphysics, which all the time he thought he was avoiding, thus letting out every vestige of philosophy. In 1864, M. Paul Janet, a member of the Institute, pronounced a discourse upon positivism, in which occur the following remarkable words. There are some minds which were brought up and fed on exact and positive sciences, but which feel nevertheless, a sort of instinctive impulse for philosophy. They can satisfy this instinct but with elements that they have already on hand. Ignorant and psychological sciences, having studied only the rudiments of metaphysics, they nevertheless are determined to fight these same metaphysics as well as psychology, of which they know as little as of the other. After this is done, they will imagine themselves to have founded a positive science, while the truth is that they have only built up a new mutilated and incomplete metaphysical theory. They arrogate to themselves the authority and infallibility properly belonging alone to the true sciences, those which are based on experience and calculations, but they lack such an authority, for their ideas, defective as they may be, nevertheless belong to the same class as those which they attack. Hence the weakness of their situation, the final ruin of their ideas, which are soon scattered to the four winds. The positivists of America have joined hands in their untiring efforts to overthrow spiritualism. To show their impartiality, though, they propound such novel queries as follows, how much rationality is. p. 81. There in the dogmas of the Immaculate Conception, the trinity and transubstantiation, is submitted to the tests of physiology, mathematics, and chemistry, and they undertake to say, that the vagaries of spiritualism do not surpass in absurdity these eminently respectable beliefs. Very well. But there is neither theological absurdity nor spiritualistic delusion that can match in depravity and imbecility that positivist notion of artificial fecundation. Denying to themselves all thought on primal and final causes, they apply their insane theories to the construction of an impossible woman for the worship of future generations, the living, a moral companion of man they would replace with the Indian female fetish of the obia, the wooden idol that is stuffed every day with serpents' eggs, to be hatched by the heat of the sun. And now, if we are permitted to ask in the name of common sense, why should Christian mystics be taxed with credulity or the spiritualists be consigned to bedlam, but a religion embodying such revolting absurdity finds disciples even among academicians? When such insane rhapsodies as the following can be uttered by the mouth of Cohn and admired by his followers, my eyes are dazzled, they open each day more and more to the increasing coincidence between the social advent of the feminine mystery, and the mental decadence of the Eucharistical sacrament. 
Already the Virgin has dethroned God in the minds of Southern Catholics. Positivism realizes the utopia of the medieval ages, by representing all the members of the great family as the issue of a virgin mother without a husband. And again, after giving the modus operandi, the development of the new process would soon cause to spring up a caste without heredity, better adapted than vulgar procreation to the recruitment of spiritual chiefs, or even temporal ones, whose authority would then rest upon an origin truly superior, which would not shrink from an investigation. To this we might inquire with propriety, whether there has ever been found in the vagaries of spiritualism, or the mysteries of Christianity, anything more preposterous than this ideal coming race. If the tendency of materialism is not grossly belied by the behavior of some of its advocates, those who publicly preach polygamy, we fancy that whether or not there will ever be a sacerdotal serp so begotten, we shall see no end of progeny, the offspring of mothers without husbands. How natural that a philosophy which could engender such a cast of didactic incubi, should express through the pen of one of its most careless essayists, the following sentiments, this is a sad, a very sad. p. 82. H, full of dead and dying faiths, full of idle prayers sent out in vain search for the departing gods. But oh, it is a glorious age, full of the golden light which streams from the ascending sun of science. What shall we do for those who are shipwrecked in faith, bankrupt in intellect, but, who seek comfort in the mirage of spiritualism, the delusions of transcendentalism, or the will of the wisp of mesmerism? The ignis fatuus, now so favorite an image with many dwarf philosophers, had itself to struggle for recognition. It is not so long since the now familiar phenomenon was stoutly denied by a correspondent of the London Times, whose assertions carried weight, till the work of Dr. Phipson, supported by the testimony of Beccaria, Humboldt, and other naturalists, set the question at rest. The positivists should choose some happier expression, and follow the discoveries of science at the same time. As to mesmerism, it has been adopted in many parts of Germany and is publicly used with undeniable success in more than one hospital. Its occult properties have been proved and are believed in by physicians, whose eminence, learning, and merited fame, the self-complacent lecturer on mediums and insanity cannot well hope to equal. We have to add but a few more words before we drop this unpleasant subject. We have found positivists particularly happy in the delusion that the greatest scientists of Europe were Comtists. How far their claims may be just, as regards other savants, we do not know, but Huxley, whom all Europe considers one of her greatest scientists, most decidedly declines that honor, and Dr. Maudsley, of London, follows suit. In a lecture delivered by the former gentleman in 1868, in Edinburgh, on the physical basis of life, he even appears to be very much shocked at the liberty taken by the Archbishop of York, in identifying him with Combe's philosophy. So far as I am concerned, says Mr. Huxley, the most reverend prelate might dialectically hew Mr. Combe in pieces, as a modern agag, and I would not attempt to stay his hand. In so far as my study of what specially characterizes a positive philosophy has led me, I find, therein, little or nothing of any scientific value, and a great deal which is as thoroughly antagonistic to the very essence of science as anything in ultramontane Catholicism. In fact, Combe's philosophy and practice might be compendiously described as Catholicism minus Christianity. Further, Huxley even becomes wrathful, and falls to accusing Scotchmen of ingratitude for having allowed the bishop to mistake Combe for the founder of a philosophy which belonged by right to Hume. It was enough, exclaims the professor, to make David. p. 83. Hume turned in his grave, that here, almost within earshot of his house, an interested audience should have listened, without a murmur, whilst his most characteristic doctrines were attributed to a French writer of fifty years later date in whose dreary and verbose pages we miss alike the vigor of thought and the clearness of style. Poor Comte. It appears that the highest representatives of his philosophy are now reduced, at least in this country, to one physicist, one physician who has made a specialty of nervous diseases, and one lawyer. A very witty critic nicknamed this desperate trio, an anomalistic triad, which, amid its arduous labors, finds no time to acquaint itself with the principles and laws of their language. To close the question, the positivists neglect no means to overthrow spiritualism in favor of their religion. Their high priests are made to blow their trumpets untiringly, and though the walls of no modern Jericho are ever likely to tumble down in dust before their blast, still they neglect no means to attain the desired object. Their paradoxes are unique, and their accusations against spiritualists irresistible in logic. In a recent lecture, 
For instance, it was remarked that, the exclusive exercise of religious instinct is productive of sexual immorality. Priests, monks, nuns, saints, media, ecstatics, and devotees are famous for their impurities. We are happy to remark that, while positivism loudly proclaims itself a religion, spiritualism has never pretended to be anything more than a science, a growing philosophy, or rather a research in hidden and as yet unexplained forces in nature. The objectiveness of its various phenomena has been demonstrated by more than one genuine representative of science, and as ineffectually denied by her monkeys. Finally, it may be remarked of our positivists who deal so unceremoniously with every psychological phenomenon, that they are like Samuel Butler's rhetorician, who could not ope his mouth, but out there flew a trope. We would there were no occasion to extend the critic's glance beyond the circle of triflers and pedants who improperly wear the title of men. P. 84. Of science. But it is also undeniable that the treatment of new subjects by those whose rank is high in the scientific world but too often passes unchallenged, when it is amenable to censure. The cautiousness bred of a fixed habit of experimental research, the tentative advance from opinion to opinion, the weight accorded to recognized authorities all foster a conservatism of thought which naturally runs into dogmatism. The price of scientific progress is too commonly the martyrdom or ostracism of the innovator. The reformer of the laboratory must, so to speak, carry the citadel of custom and prejudice at the point of the bayonet. It is rare that even a postern door is left ajar by a friendly hand. The noisy protests and impertinent criticisms of the little people of the antechamber of science, he can afford to let pass unnoticed. The hostility of the other class is a real peril that the innovator must face and overcome. Knowledge does increase apace, but the great body of scientists are not entitled to the credit. In every instance they have done their best to shipwreck the new discovery, together with the discoverer. The palm is to him who is wanted by individual courage, intuitiveness, and persistency. Few are the forces in nature which, when first announced, were not laughed at, and then set aside as absurd and unscientific. Humbling the pride of those who had not discovered anything, the just claims of those who have been denied a hearing until negation was no longer prudent, and then alas for poor, selfish humanity. These very discoverers too often became the opponents and oppressors, in their turn, of still more recent explorers in the domain of natural law. So, step by step, mankind move around their circumscribed circle of knowledge, science constantly correcting its mistakes, and readjusting on the following day the erroneous theories of the preceding one. This has been the case, not merely with questions pertaining to psychology, such as mesmerism, and its dual sense of a physical and spiritual phenomenon, but even with such discoveries as directly related to exact sciences, and have been easy to demonstrate. What can we do? Shall we recall the disagreeable past? Shall we point to medieval scholars conniving with the clergy to deny the heliocentric theory, for fear of hurting an ecclesiastical dogma? Must we recall how learned conchologists once denied that the fossil shells, found scattered over the face of the earth, were ever inhabited by living animals at all? How the naturalists of the 18th century declared these but mere facsimiles of animals? And how these naturalists fought and quarreled and battled and called each other names, over these venerable mummies of the ancient ages for nearly a century, until Buffon settled the question by proving to the negators that they were mistaken? Surely an oyster shell is anything but transcendental, and ought to be quite a palpable subject for any exact study, and if the scientists could not agree. p. 85. On that, we can hardly expect them to believe at all that evanescent forms, of hands, faces, and whole bodies sometimes appear at the seances of spiritual mediums, when the latter are honest. There exists a certain work which might afford very profitable reading for the leisure hours of skeptical men of science. It is a book published by Floron, the perpetual secretary of the French Academy, called Histoire des Recherches de Buffon. The author shows in it how the great naturalists combated and finally conquered the advocates of the facsimile theory, and how they still went on denying everything under the sun, until at times the learned body fell into a fury, an epidemic of negation. It denied Franklin and his refined electricity, laughed at Fulton and his concentrated steam, voted the engineer Perdorme a straitjacket for his offer to build railroads stared Harvey out of countenance, and proclaimed Bernard de Policy as stupid as one of his own pots. In his oft-quoted work, Conflict Between Religion and Science, Professor Draper shows a decided propensity to kick the beam of the scales of justice, and lay all such impediments to the progress of science at the door of the clergy alone. 
With all respect and admiration due to this eloquent writer and scientist, we must protest and give everyone his just due. Many of the above enumerated discoveries are mentioned by the author of the conflict. In every case he denounces the bitter resistance on the part of the clergy, and keeps silent on the like opposition invariably experienced by every new discoverer at the hands of science. His claim on behalf of science that knowledge is power is undoubtedly just. But abuse of power, whether it proceeds from excessive wisdom or ignorance is alike obnoxious in its effects. Besides, the clergy are silenced now. Their protests would at this day be scarcely noticed in the world of science. But while theology is kept in the background, the scientists have seized the scepter of despotism with both hands, and they use it, like the cherubim and flaming sword of Eden, to keep the people away from the tree of immortal life and within this world of perishable matter. The editor of the London Spiritualist, in answer to Dr. Gully's criticism of Mr. Tyndall's Firemus theory, remarks that if the entire body of spiritualists are not roasting alive at Smithfield in the present century, it is to science alone that we are indebted for this crowning mercy. Well, let us admit that the scientists are indirectly public benefactors in this case, to the extent that the burning of erudite scholars is no longer fashionable. But is it unfair to ask whether the disposition manifested toward the spiritualistic doctrine by Faraday, Tyndall, Huxley, Agassiz, and others, does not warrant the suspicion that if these learned gentlemen, p. 86. And their following had the unlimited power once held by the Inquisition. Spiritualists would not have reason to feel as easy as they do now? Even supposing that they should not roast believers in the existence of a spirit world it being unlawful to cremate people alive would they not send every spiritualist they could to Bedlam? Do they not call us incurable monomaniacs, hallucinative fools, fetish worshippers, and like characteristic names? Really, we cannot see what should have stimulated to such extent the gratitude of the editor of the London Spiritualist, but the benevolent tutelage of the men of science. We believe that the recent Lancaster Duncan Slate prosecution in London ought at last to open the eyes of hopeful spiritualists, and show them that stubborn materialism is often more stupidly bigoted than religious fanaticism itself. One of the cleverest productions of Professor Tyndall's pen is his caustic essay upon Martineau and materialism. At the same time it is one which in future years the author will doubtless be only too ready to trim of certain unpardonable grossnesses of expression. For the moment, however, we will not deal with these, but consider what he has to say of the phenomenon of consciousness. He quotes this question from Mr. Martineau, A man can say I feel, I think, I love, but how does consciousness infuse itself into the problem? And thus answers, the passage from the physics of the brain to the corresponding facts of consciousness is unthinkable. Granted that a definite thought and a molecular action in the brain occur simultaneously, we do not possess the intellectual organ nor apparently any rudiments of the organ, which would enable us to pass by a process of reasoning from one to the other. They appear together, but we do not know why. Were our minds and senses so expanded, strengthened and illuminated, as to enable us to see and feel the very molecules of the brain, were we capable of following all their motions, all their groupings, all their electric discharges, if such there be, and were we intimately acquainted with the corresponding states of thought and feeling, we should be as far as ever from the solution of the problem. How are these physical processes connected with the facts of consciousness? The chasm between the two classes of phenomena would still remain intellectually impassable. This chasm, as impassable to Professor Tyndall as the fire mist where the scientist is confronted with his unknowable cause, is a barrier only to men without spiritual intuitions. Professor B. Cannon's Outlines of Lectures on the Neurological System of Anthropology, a work written so far back as 1854, contains suggestions that, if the silist, p. 87, would only heed them, would show how a bridge can be thrown across this dreadful abyss. It is one of the bins in which the thought seed of future harvest is stored up by a frugal present. But the edifice of materialism is based entirely upon that gross substructure the reason. When they have stretched its capabilities to their utmost limits, its teachers can at best only disclose to us an universe of molecules animated by an occult impulse. What better diagnosis of the ailment of our scientists could be asked than can be derived from Professor Tyndall's analysis of the mental state of the ultramontane clergy by a very slight change of names. For spiritual guides read scientists, for pre-scientific past substitute materialistic present, say spirit for science, and in the following paragraph we have a life portrait of the modern man of science drawn by the hand of a master. 
Their spiritual guides live so exclusively in the pre-scientific past, that even the really strong intellects among them are reduced to atrophy as regards scientific truth. Eyes they have and see not, ears they have and hear not, for both eyes and ears are taken possession of by the sights and sounds of another age. In relation to science, the ultramontane brain, through lack of exercise, is virtually the undeveloped brain of the child. And thus it is that as children in scientific knowledge, but as potent wielders of spiritual power among the ignorant, the countenance and enforced practice is sufficient to bring the blush of shame to the cheeks of the more intelligent among themselves. The occultist holds this mirror up to science that it may see how it looks itself. Since history recorded the first laws established by man, there never was yet a people, whose code did not hang the issues of the life and death of its citizens upon the testimony of two or three credible witnesses. At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, says Moses, the first legislator we meet in ancient history. The laws which put to death a man on the deposition of one witness are fatal to freedom, says Montesquieu. Reason claims there should be two witnesses. Thus the value of evidence has been tacitly agreed upon and accepted in every country. But the scientists will not accept the evidence of the million against one. In vain do hundreds of thousands of men testify to facts. Oculos have been at non -vitin. They are determined to remain blind and deaf. Thirty years of practical demonstrations in the testimony of some millions of believers in America and Europe are certainly entitled to some degree of respect and attention. Especially so, when p. 88. The verdict of twelve spiritualists, influenced by the evidence testified to by any two others, is competent to send even a scientist to swing on the gallows for a crime, perhaps committed under the impulse supplied by a commotion among the cerebral molecules unrestrained by a consciousness of future moral retribution. Toward science as a whole, as a divine goal, the whole civilized world ought to look with respect and veneration, for science alone can enable man to understand the deity by the true appreciation of his works. Science is the understanding of truth or facts, says Webster, it is an investigation of truth for its own sake and a pursuit of pure knowledge. If the definition be correct, then the majority of our modern scholars have proved false to their goddess. Truth for its own sake. And where should the keys to every truth in nature be searched for, unless in the hitherto unexplored mystery of psychology? Alas! That in questioning nature so many men of science should daintily sort over her facts and choose only such for study as best bolster their prejudices. Psychology has no worse enemies than the medical school denominated allopathists. It is in vain to remind them that of the so-called exact sciences, medicine, confessedly, least deserves the name. Although of all branches of medical knowledge, psychology ought more than any other to be studied by physicians, since without its help their practice degenerates into mere guesswork and chance intuitions, they almost wholly neglect it. The least dissent from their promulgated doctrines is resented as a heresy, and though an unpopular and unrecognized curative method should be shown to save thousands, they seem, as a body, disposed to cling to accepted hypotheses and prescriptions, and to cry both innovator and innovation until they get the mint stamp of regularity. Thousands of unlucky patients may die meanwhile, but so long as professional honor is vindicated, this is a matter of secondary importance. Theoretically the most benignant, at the same time no other school of science exhibits so many instances of petty prejudice, materialism, atheism, and malicious stubbornness as medicine. The predilections and patronage of the leading physicians are scarcely ever measured by the usefulness of a discovery. Leading, by leeching, cupping, in the lancet, had its epidemic of popularity, but at last fell into merited disgrace. Water, now freely given to fevered patients, was once denied them, warm baths were superseded by cold water, and for a while hydropathy was a mania. Peruvian bark which a modern defender of biblical authority seriously endeavors to identify with the paradisiacal tree of life and which was brought to Spain in 1632 was neglected. p. 89. For years. The church, for once, showed more discrimination than science. At the request of Cardinal de Lugo, Innocent X gave it the prestige of his powerful name. In an old book entitled Demonologia, the author cites many instances of important remedies which being neglected at first afterward rose into notice through mere accident. He also shows that most of the new discoveries in medicine have turned out to be no more than the revival and readoption of very ancient practices. During the last century, the root of the male fern was sold and widely advertised as a secret nostrum by Madame Nufour, a female quack, for the effective cure of the tapeworm. 
The seeker was bought by Louis XV for a large sum of money, after which the physicians discovered that it was recommended and administered in that disease by Galen. The famous powder of the Duke of Portland for the gout was the dye Centauron of Caelius Aurelianus. Later it was ascertained that it had been used by the earliest medical writers, who had found it in the writings of the old Greek philosophers. So with the old Medici Nali of Dr. Husson, whose name it bears. This famous remedy for the gout was recognized under its new mass to be the Colchicum autumnale, or meadow saffron, which is identical with a plant called Hermodactylus, whose merits as a certain antidote to gout were recognized and defended by Orobasius, a great physician of the 4th century, and Isis Amadinus, another eminent physician of Alexandria, 5th century. Subsequently it was abandoned and fell into disfavor only because it was too old to be considered good by the members of the medical faculties that flourished toward the end of the last century. Even the great Magendi, the wise physiologist, was not above discovering that which had already been discovered and found good by the oldest physicians. His proposed remedy against consumption, namely, the use of prussic acid, may be found in the works of Linnaeus, Amenitates Academici, Volume 4, in which he shows the still laurel water to have been used with great profit in pulmonary consumption. Pliny also assures us that the extract of almonds and cherry pits had cured the most obstinate coughs. As the author of Demonologia well remarks, it may be asserted with perfect safety that all the various secret preparations of opium which have been lauded as the discovery of modern times, may be recognized in the works of ancient authors, who see themselves so discredited in our days. It is admitted on all hands that from time immemorial the distant east was the land of knowledge. Not even in Egypt were botany and mineralogy so extensively studied as by the savants of archaic Middle Asia. Sprengel, unjust and prejudiced as he shows himself in everything else, confesses this much in his Eastward Law Medicine. And yet. p. 90. Notwithstanding this, whenever the subject of magic is discussed, that of India has rarely suggested itself to anyone for of its general practice in that country less is known than among any other ancient people. With the Hindus it wasn't as more esoteric, if possible, than it was even among the Egyptian priests. So sacred was it deemed that its existence was only half admitted, and it was only practiced in public emergencies. It was more than a religious matter, for it was considered divine. The Egyptian hierophants, notwithstanding the practice of a stern and pure morality, could not be compared for one moment with the ascetical gymnosophists either in holiness of life or miraculous powers developed in them by the supernatural adoration of everything earthly. By those who knew them well they were held in still greater reverence than the magians of Chaldea. Denying themselves the simplest comforts of life, they dwelled in woods, and led the life of the most secluded hermits, while their Egyptian brothers at least congregated together. Notwithstanding the slur thrown by history on all who practice magic and divination, it has proclaimed them as possessing the greatest secrets in medical knowledge and unsurpassed skill in its practice. Numerous are the volumes preserved in Hindu convents, in which are recorded the proofs of their learning. To attempt to say whether these gymnosophists were the real founders of magic in India, or whether they only practiced what had passed to them as an inheritance from the earliest rishis the seven primeval sages would be regarded as a mere speculation by exact scholars. The care which they took in educating youth, in familiarizing it with generous and virtuous sentiments, did them peculiar honor, and their maxims and discourses, as recorded by historians, prove that they were expert in matters of philosophy, metaphysics, astronomy, morality, and religion, says a modern writer. They preserved their dignity under the sway of the most powerful princes, whom they would not condescend to visit, or to trouble for the slightest favor. If the latter desired the advice or the prayers of the holy men, they were either obliged to go themselves or to send messengers. To these men no secret power of either plant or mineral was unknown. They had fathomed nature to its depths, while psychology and physiology were to them open books, and the result was that science or macagiosha that is now termed, so superciliously, magic. While the miracles recorded in the Bible have become accepted facts. p. 91. With the Christians, to disbelieve which is regarded as infidelity, the narratives of wonders and prodigies found in the Aterva Veda, either provoke their contempt for or are viewed as evidences of diabolism. And yet, in more than one respect, and notwithstanding the unwillingness of certain Sanskrit scholars, we can show the identity between the two. Moreover, as the Vedas have now been proved by scholars to antedate the Jewish Bible by many ages, the inference is an easy one that if one of them has borrowed from the other, 
the hindu sacred books are not to be charged with plagiarism first of all their cosmogony shows how erroneous has been the opinion prevalent among the civilized nations that brahma was ever considered by the hindus their chief or supreme god brahma is a secondary deity and like jehovah is a mover of the waters he is the creating god and has in his allegorical representations four heads answering to the four cardinal points he is the demiurges the architect of the world in the primordial state of the creation says polyers mitologi de indus the rudimental universe submerged in water reposed in the bosom of the eternal sprang from this chaos and darkness brahma the architect of the world poised on a lotus leaf floated moved upon the waters unable to discern anything but water and darkness this is as identical as possible with the egyptian cosmogony which shows in its opening sentences after or mother night which represents a limitable darkness as the primeval element which covered the infinite abyss animated by water and the universal spirit of the eternal dwelling alone in chaos as in the jewish scriptures the history of the creation opens with the spirit of god in his creative emanation and another deity perceiving such a dismal state of things brahma soliloquizes in consternation who am i whence came i then he hears a voice direct your prayer to bhagavan the eternal known also as parabrahma rama rising from his natatory position seats himself upon the lotus in an attitude of contemplation and reflects upon the eternal who pleased with this evidence of piety disperses the primeval darkness and opens his understanding after this brahma issues from the universal egg infinite chaos as light for his understanding is now opened and he sets himself to work he moves on the eternal waters with the spirit of god within himself in his capacity of mover of the waters he is narayana the lotus the sacred flower of the egyptians as well as the hindus is the symbol of horus as it is that of brahma no temples in tibet or p 92 and paul are found without it and the meaning of this symbol is extremely suggestive the sprig of lilies placed in the hand of the archangel who offers them to the virgin mary in the pictures of the annunciation have in their esoteric symbolism precisely the same meaning we refer the reader to sir william jones with the hindus the lotus is the emblem of the productive power of nature through the agency of fire and water spirit and matter eternal says a verse in the bhagavad gita i see brahma the creator enthroned in the above the lotus and sir w jones shows that the seeds of the lotus contain even before they germinate perfectly formed leaves the miniature shapes of what one day as perfected plants they will become or as the author of the heathen religion has it nature thus giving us a specimen of the preformation of its productions adding further that the seed of all phanogamous plants bearing proper flowers contain an embryo plantlet ready formed with the buddhists it has the same signification mahamaya or mahadeva the mother of gautama buddha had the birth of her son announced to her by bodhisat the spirit of buddha who appeared beside her couch with a lotus in his hand thus also Osiris and Horus are represented by the Egyptians constantly in association with the lotus flower. These facts all go to show the identical parentage of this idea in the three religious systems: Hindu, Egyptian, and Judeo-Christian. Wherever the mystic water lily, lotus, is employed, it signifies the emanation of the objective from the concealed or subjective, the eternal thought of the ever invisible deity passing from the abstract into the concrete or visible form. For as soon as darkness was dispersed and there was light, Brahma's understanding was opened and he saw in the ideal world which had hitherto lain eternally concealed in the divine thought the archetypal forms of all the infinite future things that would be called into existence and hence become visible at this first stage of action Brahma had not yet become the architect the builder of the universe for he had like the architect to first acquaint himself with the plan and realize the ideal forms which were buried in the bosom of the eternal one as the future lotus leaves are concealed within the seed of that plant and it is in this idea that we must look for the origin and explanation of the verse in the jewish cosmogony which reads and god said let the earth bring forth the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself in all the primitive religions the son of the father is the creative god i dot e his thought made visible and before the christian era from the trimarti of the hindus down to the p 93 Three cabalistic heads of the Jewish explained scriptures. The triune Godhead of each nation was fully defined and substantiated in its allegories. 
In the Christian creed we see but the artificial engrafting of a new branch upon the old trunk, and the adoption by the Greek and Roman churches of the lily symbol held by the archangel at the moment of the Annunciation, shows a thought of precisely the same metaphysical significance. The lotus is the product of fire, heat, and water, hence the dual symbol of spirit and matter. The god Brahma is the second person of the Trinity, as are Jehovah, Adam Codman, and Osiris, or rather Pomander, or the power of the thought divine, of Hermes, for it is Pomander who represents the root of all the Egyptian sun gods. The eternal is the spirit of fire, which stirs up and fructifies and develops into a concrete form everything that is born of water or the primordial earth, evolved out of Brahma, but the universe is itself Brahma, and he is the universe. This is the philosophy of Spinoza, which he derived from that of Pythagoras, and it is the same for which Bruno died a martyr. How much Christian theology has gone astray from its point of departure, is demonstrated in this historical fact. Bruno was slaughtered for the exegesis of a symbol that was adopted by the earliest Christians, and expounded by the apostles. The sprig of water lilies of Bodhisat, and later of Gabriel, typifying fire and water, or the idea of creation and generation, is worked into the earliest dogma of the baptismal sacrament. Bruno's and Spinoza's doctrines are nearly identical, though the words of the latter are more veiled, and far more cautiously chosen than those to be found in the theories of the author of the Causa Principio et Uno, or the Infinito Universo e Mondi. Both Bruno, who confesses that the source of his information was Pythagoras, and Spinoza, who, without acknowledging it as frankly, allows his philosophy to betray the secret, view the first cause from the same standpoint. With them, God is an entity totally per se, an infinite spirit, and the only being utterly free and independent of either effects or other causes who, through that same will which produced all things and gave the first impulse to every cosmic law, perpetually keeps in existence and order everything in the universe. As well as the Hindu Swabhavikas, erroneously called atheists, who assume that all things, men as well as gods and spirits, were born from Swabhava, or their own nature, both. p. 94. Spinoza and Bruno were led to the conclusion that God is to be sought for within nature and not without. 4. Creation being proportional to the power of the Creator, the universe as well as its Creator must be infinite and eternal, one form emanating from its own essence, and creating in its turn another. The modern commentators affirm that Bruno, unsustained by the hope of another and better world, still surrendered his life rather than his convictions, thereby allowing it to be inferred that Giordano Bruno had no belief in the continued existence of man after death. Professor Draper asserts most positively that Bruno did not believe in the immortality of the soul. Speaking of the countless victims of the religious intolerance of the Popish Church, he remarks, The passage from this life to the next, though through a hard trial, was the passage from a transient trouble to eternal happiness. On his way through the dark valley, the martyr believed that there was an invisible hand that would lead him. For Bruno there was no such support. The philosophical opinions, for the sake of which he surrendered his life, could give him no consolation. But Professor Draper seems to have a very superficial knowledge of the true belief of the philosophers. We can leave Spinoza out of the question, and even allow him to remain in the eyes of his critics an utter atheist and materialist, for the cautious reserve which he placed upon himself in his writings makes it extremely difficult for one who does not read him between the lines, and is not thoroughly acquainted with the hidden meaning of the Pythagorean metaphysics, to ascertain what his real sentiments were. But as for Giordano Bruno, if he adhered to the doctrines of Pythagoras he must have believed in another life, hence, he could not have been an atheist whose philosophy offered him no such consolation. His accusation and subsequent confession, as given by Professor Domenico Berti, in his Life of Bruno, and compiled from original documents recently published, prove beyond doubt what were his real philosophy, creed and doctrines. In common with the Alexandrian Platonists, and the later Kabbalists, he held that Jesus was a magician in the sense given to this appellation by Porphyry and Cicero, who called the Divina Sapientia, divine knowledge, and by Philo Judes, who described the Magi as the most wonderful inquirers into the hidden mysteries of nature, not in the degrading sense given to the word magic in our century. In his noble conception, the Magi were holy men, who, setting themselves apart from everything else on this earth, contemplated the divine virtues and understood the divine nature of the gods and spirits the more clearly, and so, initiated others into the same mysteries. p. 95. Which consists in one holding an uninterrupted intercourse with these invisible beings during life. 
but we will show Bruno's inmost philosophical convictions better by quoting fragments from the accusation and his own confession. The charges in the denunciation of Motionville, his accuser, are expressed in the following terms. I, Zuan Motionvo, son of the most illustrious Ser Marc Antonio, denounce to your very reverend fathership, by constraint of my conscience and by order of my confessor, that I have heard say by Giordano Bruno, several times when he discourse with me in my house, that it is great blasphemy in Catholics to say that the bread transubstantiates itself into flesh, that he is opposed to the Mass, that no religion pleases him, that Christ was a wretch, untristo, and that if he did wicked works to seduce the people he might well predict that he ought to be impaled, that there is no distinction of persons in God, and that it would be imperfection in God, that the world is eternal, and that there are infinite worlds, and that God makes them continually, because, he says, he desires all he can, that Christ did apparent miracles and was a magician, and so were the apostles, and that he had a mind to do as much and more than they did, that Christ showed an unwillingness to die, and shunned death all he could, that there is no punishment of sin, and that souls created by the operation of nature pass from one animal to another, and that as the brute animals are born of corruption, so also are men when after dissolution they come to be born again. Perfidious as they are, the above words plainly indicate the belief of Bruno in the Pythagorean metempsychosis, which, misunderstood as it is, still shows a belief in the survival of man in one shape or another. Further, the accuser says, He has shown indications of wishing to make himself the author of a new sect, under the name of new philosophy. He has said that the Virgin could not have brought forth, and that our Catholic faith is all full of blasphemies against the majesty of God, that the monks ought to be deprived of the right of disputation in their revenues, because they pollute the world, that they are all asses, and that our opinions are doctrines of asses, that we have no proof that our faith has merit with God, and that not to do to others what we would not have done to ourselves suffices for a good life, and that he laughs at all other sins, and wonders how God can endure so many heresies in Catholics. He says that he means to apply himself to the art of divination, and make all the world run after him, that St. Thomas and all the doctors knew nothing to compare with him, and that he could ask questions of all the first theologians of the world that they could not answer. p. 96. To this, the accused philosopher answered by the following profession of faith, which is that of every disciple of the ancient masters. I hold, in brief, to an infinite universe, that is, an effect of infinite divine power, because I esteemed it a thing unworthy of divine goodness and power that being able to produce besides this world another and infinite others, it should produce a finite world. Thus I have declared that there are infinite particular worlds similar to this of the earth, which, with Pythagoras, I understand to be a star similar in nature with the moon, the other planets, and the other stars, which are infinite, and that all those bodies are worlds, and without number, which thus constitute the infinite universality in an infinite space, and this is called the infinite universe, in which are innumerable worlds, so that there is a double kind of infinite greatness in the universe, and of a multitude of worlds. Indirectly, this may be understood to be repugnant to the truth according to the true faith. Moreover, I place in this universe a universal providence, by virtue of which everything lies, vegetates and moves, and stands in its perfection, and I understand it in two ways, one, and the mode in which the whole soul is present in the whole and every part of the body, and this I call nature, the shadow and footprint of divinity, the other, the ineffable mode in which God, by essence, presence, and power, is in all and above all, not as part, not as soul, but in mode inexplicable. Moreover, I understand all the attributes and divinity to be one and the same thing. Together with the theologians and great philosophers, I apprehend three attributes, power, wisdom, and goodness, or, rather, mind, intellect, love, with which things have first, being, through the mind, next, ordered and distinct being, through the intellect, and third, concord and symmetry, through love. Thus I understand being in all and over all, as there is nothing without participation in being, and there is no being without essence, just as nothing is beautiful without beauty being present, thus nothing can be free from the divine presence, and thus by way of reason, and not by way of substantial truth, do I understand distinction and divinity. Assuming then the world caused and produced, I understand that, according to all its being, it is dependent upon the first cause, so that it did not reject the name of creation, which I understand that Aristotle also has expressed, saying, God is that upon whom the world and all nature depends, so that according to the explanation of St. Thomas, whether it be eternal or in time, it is, according to all its being, 
dependent on the first cause, and nothing in it is independent. Next, in regard to what belongs to the true faith, not speaking philosophically, to come to individuality about the divine persons, the p. 97. Wisdom and the son of the mind, called by philosophers intellect, and by theologians the word, which ought to be believed to have taken on human flesh. But I, abiding in the phrases of philosophy, have not understood it, but have doubted and held it with inconstant faith, not that I remember to have shown marks of it in writing nor in speech, except indirectly from other things, something of it may be gathered as by way of ingenuity and profession in regard to what may be proved by reason and concluded from natural light. Thus, in regard to the Holy Spirit in a third person, I have not been able to comprehend, as ought to be believed, but, according to the Pythagoric manner, in conformity to the manner shown by Solomon, I have understood it as the soul of the universe, or joined to the universe according to the saying of the wisdom of Solomon, the Spirit of God filled all the earth, and that which contains all things, all which conforms equally to the Pythagoric doctrine explained by Virgil in the text of the Enu. Principio coilum ac teros campos liquens. Lucentum globum lunae, titaniac astro. Spiritus intusolit, totam confusa per artis. Mens agitat malum. And the lines following. From this spirit, then, which is called the life of the universe, I understand, in my philosophy, proceeds life and soul to everything which has life and soul, which, moreover, I understand to be immortal, as also to bodies, which, as to their substance, are all immortal, there being no other death than division and congregation, which doctrine seems expressed in Ecclesiastes, where it is said that there is nothing new under the sun, that which is is that which was. Furthermore, Bruno confesses his inability to comprehend the doctrine of three persons in the Godhead, and his doubts of the incarnation of God in Jesus, but firmly pronounces his belief in the miracles of Christ. How could he, being a Pythagorean philosopher, discredit them? If, under the merciless constraint of the Inquisition, he, like Galileo, subsequently recanted, and threw himself upon the clemency of his ecclesiastical persecutors, we must remember that he spoke like a man standing between the rack and the faggot, and human nature cannot always be heroic when the corporeal frame is debilitated by torture and imprisonment. But for the opportune appearance of Verdi's authoritative work, we would have continued to revere Bruno as a martyr, whose bust was deservedly set high in the pantheon of exact science, crowned with laurel by the hand of Draper. But now we see that their hero of an hour, p. 98, is neither atheist, materialist, nor positivist, but simply a Pythagorean who taught the philosophy of Upper Asia, and claimed to possess the powers of the magicians, so despised by Draper's own school. Nothing more amusing than this contretemps has happened since the supposed statue of St. Peter was discovered by a reverend archaeologist to be nothing else than the Jupiter of the capital, and Buddha's identity with the Catholic St. Yosephat was satisfactorily proven. Thus, search where we may through the archives of history, we find that there is no fragment of modern philosophy whether Newtonian, Cartesian, Huxleyan or any other but has been dug from the Oriental minds. Even positivism and nihilism find their prototype in the exoteric portion of Kapila's philosophy, as is well remarked by Max Muller. It was the inspiration of the Hindu sages that penetrated the mysteries of Prajnaparamita, perfect wisdom, their hands that rocked the cradle of the first ancestor of that feeble but noisy child that we have christened modern science. Chapter 4 I choose the noble part of Emerson, when, after various disenchantments, he exclaimed, I covet truth. The gladness of true heroism visits the heart of him who is really competent to say this. Tyndall. A testimony is sufficient when it rests on. First, a great number of very sensible witnesses who agree in having seen well. 2d. Who are sane, bodily and mentally. 3d. Who are impartial and disinterested. Fourth, who unanimously agree. Fifth, who solemnly certify to the fact. Voltaire, dicti en air philosophique. The Count Eugenor de Gasparin is a devoted Protestant. His battle with de Musso's, de Merville and other fanatics who laid the whole of the spiritual phenomena at the door of Satan, was long and fierce. Two volumes of over 1500 pages are the result, proving the effects, denying the cause and employing superhuman efforts to invent every other possible explanation that could be suggested rather than the true one. The severe rebuke received by the Journal des Debats from M. de Gasparin was read by all civilized Europe. 
After the gentleman had minutely described numerous manifestations that he had witnessed himself, this journal very impertinently proposed to the authorities in France to send all those who, after having read the fine analysis of the spiritual hallucinations published by Faraday, should insist on crediting this delusion, to the lunatic asylum for incurables. Take care, wrote de Gasper in an answer, the representatives of the exact sciences are on their way to become, the inquisitors of our days. Facts are stronger than academies. Rejected, denied, mocked, they nevertheless are facts, and do exist. The following affirmations of physical phenomena, as witnessed by himself and Professor Three, may be found in de Gasparin's voluminous work. The experimenters have often seen the legs of the table glued, so to say, to the floor, and, notwithstanding the excitement of those present, refuse to be moved from their place. On other occasions they have seen the tables levitated in quite an energetic way. They heard, with their own. P. 100. Ears, loud as well as gentle raps, the former threatening to shatter the table to pieces on account of their violence, the latter so soft as to become hardly perceptible. As to levitations without contact, we found means to produce them easily, and with success. And such levitations do not pertain to isolated results. We have reproduced them over thirty times. One day the table will turn, and lift its legs successively, its weight being augmented by a man weighing 87 kilograms seated on it, another time it will remain motionless and immovable, notwithstanding that the person placed on it weighs but 60, on one occasion we willed it to turn upside down, and it turned over, with its legs in the air, notwithstanding that our fingers never touched it once. It is certain, remarks de Merville, that a man who had repeatedly witnessed such a phenomenon, could not accept the fine analysis of the English physicist. Since 1850, De Musos and de Merville, uncompromising Roman Catholics, have published many volumes whose titles are cleverly contrived to attract public attention. They betray on the part of the authors a very serious alarm, which, moreover, they take no pains to conceal. Were it possible to consider the phenomena spurious, the Church of Rome would never have gone so much out of her way to repress them. Both sides having agreed upon the facts, leaving skeptics out of the question, people could divide themselves into but two parties, the believers in the direct agency of the devil, and the believers in disembodied and other spirits. The fact alone, that theology dreaded a great deal more the revelations which might come through this mysterious agency than all the threatening conflicts with science and the categorical denials of the latter, ought to have opened the eyes of the most skeptical. The Church of Rome has never been either credulous or cowardly, as is abundantly proved by the Machiavellism which marks her policy. Moreover, she has never troubled herself much about the clever prestidigitators whom she knew to be simply adepts in juggling. Robert Eugene, Comte, Hamilton, and Bosco, slept secure in their beds, while she persecuted such men as Paracelsus, Cagliostro, and Mesmer, the hermetic philosophers and mystics and effectually stopped every genuine manifestation of an occult nature by killing the mediums. Those who are unable to believe in a personal devil and the dogmas of the church must nevertheless accord to the clergy enough of shrewdness. p. 101. To prevent the compromising of her reputation for infallibility by making so much of manifestations which, if fraudulent, must inevitably be some day exposed. But the best testimony to the reality of this force was given by Robert Houdin himself, the king of jugglers, who, Upon being called as an expert by the academy to witness the wonderful clairvoyant powers and occasional mistakes of a table, said, We jugglers never make mistakes, and my second sight never failed me yet. The learned astronomer Bobinet was not more fortunate in his selection of Comte, the celebrated ventriloquist, as an expert to testify against the phenomena of direct voices in the rappings. Comte, if we may believe the witnesses, laughed in the face of Bobinet at the bare suggestion that the raps were produced by unconscious ventriloquism. The latter theory, worthy twin sister of unconscious cerebration, caused many of the most skeptical academicians to blush. Its absurdity was too apparent. The problem of the supernatural, says de Gasparin, such as it was presented by the Middle Ages, and as it stands now, is not among the number of those which we are permitted to despise, its breadth and grandeur escape the notice of no one. Everything is profoundly serious in it, both the evil and the remedy, the superstitious recrudescency and the physical fact which is destined to conquer the latter. Further, he pronounces the following decisive opinion, to which he came, conquered by the various manifestations, as he says himself the number of facts which claim their place in the broad daylight of truth, has so much increased of late, 
that of two consequences one is henceforth inevitable, either the domain of natural sciences must consent to expand itself, or the domain of the supernatural will become so enlarged as to have no bounds. Among the multitude of books against spiritualism emanating from Catholic and Protestant sources, none have produced a more appalling effect than the works of de Merville and de Musso's, La Magie au Excise de Eclamer et Pratique des Demons aux Phenomenes de la Magie les Méditeurs de la Magie des Esprits et de leurs Manifestations, etc. that comprise the most cyclopedic biography of the devil and his imps that has appeared for the private delectation of good Catholics since the Middle Ages. According to the authors, he who was a liar and murderer from the beginning, was also the principal motor of spiritual phenomena. He had been for thousands of years at the head of pagan theurgy, and p. 102. It was he, again, who, encouraged by the increase of heresies, infidelity, and atheism, had reappeared in our century. The French Academy lifted up its voice in a general outcry of indignation, and M. De Gasparin even took it for a personal insult. This is a declaration of war, a levy of shields wrote he in his voluminous book of refutations. The work of M. De Merville is a real manifesto. I would be glad to see in it the expression of a strictly individual opinion, but, in truth, it is impossible. The success of the work, these solemn adhesions, the faithful reproduction of its theses by the journals and writers of the party, the solidarity established throughout between them and the whole body of Catholicity, everything goes to show a work which is essentially an act, and has the value of a collective labor. As it is, I felt that I had a duty to perform. I felt obliged to pick up the glove, and lift high the Protestant flag against the ultramontane banner. The medical faculties, as might have been expected, assuming the part of the Greek chorus, echoed the various expostulations against the demonological authors. The Medico-Psychological Annals, edited by Drs. Briere de Boimont and Cerise, published the following, outside these controversies of antagonistical parties, never in our country did a writer dare to face, with a more aggressive serenity, the sarcasms, the scorn of what we term common sense, and, as if to defy and challenge at the same time thundering peals of laughter and shrugging of shoulders, the author strikes an attitude, in placing himself with effrontery before the members of the academy, addresses to them what he modestly terms his memoir on the devil. That was a cutting insult to the academicians, to be sure, but ever since 1850 they seem to have been doomed to suffer in their pride more than most of them can bear. The idea of asking the attention of the forty immortals to the pranks of the devil. They vowed revenge, and, leaguing themselves together, propounded a theory which exceeded in absurdity even to Merville's demonolatry. Dr. Royer and Jobart de Lombal, both celebrities in their way, formed an alliance and presented to the Institute a German whose cleverness afforded, according to his statement, the key to all the knockings and rappings of both hemispheres. We blush remarks the Marquis de Merville to say that the whole of the trick consisted simply in the reiterated displacement of one of the muscular tendons of the legs. Great demonstration of the system and full sitting of the Institute and on the spot, expressions of academical gratitude for this interesting communication, and, a few days later, a full assurance given to the public by a professor of the medical. p. 103. Faculty, that, scientists having pronounced their opinion, the mystery was at last unraveled. But such scientific explanations neither prevented the phenomenon from quietly following its course, nor the two writers on demonology from proceeding to expound their strictly orthodox theories. Denying that the Church had anything to do with his books, De Musso's gravely gave the Academy, in addition to his memoir, the following interesting and profoundly philosophical thoughts on Satan. The devil is the chief pillar of faith. He is one of the grand personages whose life is closely allied to that of the Church and without his speech which issued out so triumphantly from the mouth of the serpent, his medium, the fall of man could not have taken place. Thus, if it was not for him, the Savior, the Crucified, the Redeemer, would be but the most ridiculous of supernumeraries, and the cross an insult to good sense. This writer, be it remembered, is only the faithful echo of the Church, which anathematizes equally the one who denies God and him who doubts the objective existence of Satan. But the Marquis de Merville carries this idea of God's partnership with the devil still further. According to him it is a regular commercial affair, in which the senior silent partner suffers the active business of the firm to be transacted as it may please his junior associate, by whose audacity and industry he profits. Who could be of any other opinion, upon reading the following? At the moment of this spiritual invasion of 1853, 
so slightingly regarded, we had dared to pronounce the word of a threatening catastrophe. The world was nevertheless at peace, but history showing us the same symptoms at all disastrous epochs, we had a presentiment of the sad effects of a law which Gares has formulated thus, Volume 5, p. 356, these mysterious apparitions have invariably indicated the chastening hand of God on earth. These guerrilla skirmishes between the champions of the clergy and the materialistic academy of science, prove abundantly how little the latter has done toward uprooting blind fanaticism from the minds of even very educated persons. Evidently science has neither completely conquered nor muzzled theology. She will master her only on that day when she will condescend to see in the spiritual phenomenon something besides mere hallucination and charlatanry. But how can she do it without investigating it thoroughly? Let us suppose that before the time when p. 104. Electromagnetism was publicly acknowledged, the Copenhagen professor Ersted, its discoverer, had been suffering from an attack of what we call psychophobia, or pneumatophobia. He notices that the wire along which a voltaic current is passing shows a tendency to turn the magnetic needle from its natural position to one perpendicular to the direction of the current. Suppose, moreover, that the professor had heard much of certain superstitious people who use that kind of magnetized needles to converse with unseen intelligences. That they received signals and even held correct conversations with them by means of the tippings of such a needle, and that in consequence he suddenly felt a scientific horror and disgust for such an ignorant belief, and refused, point blank, to have anything to do with such a needle. What would have been the result? Electromagnetism might not have been discovered till now and our experimentalists would have been the principal losers thereby. Bobinet, Royer, and Jobert de Lombol, all three members of the Institute, particularly distinguished themselves in the struggle between skepticism and supernaturalism, and most assuredly have reaped no laurels. The famous astronomer had imprudently risked himself on the battlefield of the phenomenon. He had explained scientifically the manifestations. But, Emboldened by the fond belief among scientists that the new epidemic could not stand close investigation nor outlive the year, he had the still greater imprudence to publish two articles on them. As M. de Merville very wittily remarks, if both of the articles had but a poor success in the scientific press, they had, on the other hand, none at all in the daily one. M. Bobinet began by accepting a priori, the rotation and movements of the furniture, which fact he declared to be or to do. This rotation, he said, being able to manifest itself with a considerable energy, either by a very great speed, or by a strong resistance when it is desired that it should stop. Now comes the explanation of the eminent scientist. Gently pushed by little concordant impulsions of the hands laid upon it, the table begins to oscillate from right to left. At the moment when, after more or less delay, a nervous trepidation is established and the hands and the little individual impulsions of all the experimenters have become harmonized, the table is set in motion. He finds it very simple, for all muscular movements are determined over bodies by levers of the third order, in which the fulcrum is very near to the point where the force acts. This, consequently, communicates a p. 105. Great speed to the mobile parts for the very little distance which the motor force has to run. Some persons are astonished to see a table subjected to the action of several well-disposed individuals in a fair way to conquer powerful obstacles, even break its legs, when suddenly stopped, but that is very simple if we consider the power of the little concordant actions. Once more, the physical explanation offers no difficulty. In this dissertation, two results are clearly shown, the reality of the phenomena proved, and the scientific explanation made ridiculous. But M. Bobinet can well afford to be laughed at a little, he knows, as an astronomer, that dark spots are to be found even in the sun. There is one thing, though, that Bobinet has always stoutly denied, viz., the levitation of furniture without contact. De Merville catches him proclaiming that such levitation is impossible, simply impossible, he says, as impossible as perpetual motion. Who can take upon himself, after such a declaration, to maintain that the word impossible pronounced by science is infallible? But the tables, after having waltzed, oscillated and turned, began tipping and rapping. The raps were sometimes as powerful as pistol detonations. What of this? Listen, the witnesses and investigators are ventriloquists. De Merville refers us to the Revue des Deux Mondes, in which is published a very interesting dialogue, invented by M. Bobinet speaking of himself to himself, like the Chaldean Ensof of the Kabbalists 
What can we finally say of all these facts brought under our observation? Are there such raps produced? Yes. Do such raps answer questions? Yes. Who produces these sounds? The mediums. By what means? By the ordinary acoustic method of the ventriloquists. But we were given to suppose that these sounds might result from the cracking of the toes and fingers? No, for then they would always proceed from the same point, and such is not the fact. Now, ask to Mervo, what are we to believe of the Americans, and their thousands of mediums who produce the same raps before millions of witnesses? Ventriloquism, to be sure, answers Bobinet. But how can you explain such an impossibility? The easiest thing in the world, listen only, all that was necessary to produce the first manifestation in the first house in America was, a street boy knocking at the door of a mystified citizen, perhaps with a leaden ball attached to a p. 106. Strang, and if Mr. Weakman, the first believer in America, when he watched for the third time, heard no shouts of laughter in the street, it is because of the essential difference which exists between a French street Arab, and an English or transatlantic one, the latter being amply provided with what we call a sad merriment, gaite triste. Truly says de Merville in his famous reply to the attacks of de Gasparin, Bobinet, and other scientists, and thus according to our great physicist, the tables turn very quickly, very energetically, resist likewise, and, as M. de Gasparin has proved, they levitate without contact. Said a minister, with three words of a man's handwriting, I take upon myself to have him hung. With the above three lines, we take upon ourselves, in our turn, to throw into the greatest confusion the physicists of all the globe, or rather to revolutionize the world if at least, M. de Bobinet had taken the precaution of suggesting, like M. de Gasparin, some yet unknown law or force. For this would cover the whole ground. But it is in the notes embracing the facts and physical theories, that we find the acme of the consistency and logic of Bobinet as an expert investigator on the field of spiritualism. It would appear, that M. de Merville in his narrative of the wonders manifested at the Presbytère de Sideville, was much struck by the marvelousness of some facts. Though authenticated before the inquest and magistrates, they were of so miraculous a nature as to force the demonological author himself to shrink from the responsibility of publishing them. These facts were as follows. At the precise moment predicted by a sorcerer case of revenge a violent clap of thunder was heard above one of the chimneys of the presbytery, after which the flue descended with a formidable noise through that passage, threw down believers as well as skeptics, as to the power of the sorcerer, who were warming themselves by the fire, and, having filled the room with a multitude of fantastic animals, returned to the chimney, and having reascended it, disappeared, after producing the same terrible noise. As, adds de Merville, we were already but too rich in facts, we recoiled before this new enormity added to so many others. But Bobinet, who in common with his learned colleagues had made such fun of the two writers on demonology, and who was determined, moreover, to prove the absurdity of all like stories, felt himself obliged. p. 107. To discredit the above-mentioned fact of the sideville phenomena, by presenting one still more incredible, we yield the floor to M. Bobinet, himself. The following circumstance which he gave to the Academy of Sciences, on July 5, 1852, can be found without further commentary, and merely as an instance of a sphere-like lightning, in the Ouvres de F. Argo, Volume 1, p. 52. We offer it verbatim. After a strong clap of thunder, says M. Bobinet, but not immediately following it, a tailor apprentice, living in the Rue Saint-Jacques, was just finishing his dinner when he saw the paper screen which shut the fireplace fall down as if pushed out of its place by a moderate gust of wind. Immediately after that he perceived a globe of fire, as large as the head of a child, come out quietly and softly from within the grate and slowly move about the room, without touching the bricks of the floor. The aspect of this fire globe was that of a young cat, of middle size, moving itself without the use of its paws. The fire globe was rather brilliant and luminous than hot or inflamed, and the tailor had no sensation of warmth. This globe approached his feet like a young cat which wishes to play and rub itself against the legs, as is habitual to these animals, but the apprentice withdrew his feet from it, and moving with great caution, avoided contact with the meteor. The latter remained for a few seconds moving about his legs, the tailor examining it with great curiosity and bending over it. After having tried several excursions in opposite directions, but without leaving the center of the room, 
the fire globe elevated itself vertically to the level of the man's head, who to avoid its contact with his face, threw himself backward on his chair. Arrived at about a yard from the floor the fire globe slightly lengthened, took an oblique direction toward a hole in the wall over the fireplace, at about the height of a meter above the mantelpiece. This hole had been made for the purpose of admitting the pipe of a stove in winter, but, according to the expression of the tailor, the thunder could not see it, for it was papered over like the rest of the wall. The fire globe went directly to that hole, unglued the paper without damaging it, and reascended the chimney, when it arrived at the top, which it did very slowly at least sixty feet above ground, it produced a most frightful explosion, which partly destroyed the chimney, etc. It seems, remarks de Merville on his review, that we could apply to M. Bobinet the following remark made by a very witty woman to Raynal, if you are not a Christian, it is not for lack of faith. It was not alone believers who wondered at the credulity displayed by p. 108. M. Bobinet, in persisting to call the manifestation a meteor, for Dr. Bodine mentions it very seriously in a work on lightning he was just then publishing. If these details are exact, says the doctor, as they seem to be, since they are admitted by M.M. Bobinet and Argo, it appears very difficult for the phenomenon to retain its appellation of sphere-shaped lightning. However, we leave it to others to explain, if they can, the essence of a fire globe emitting no sensation of heat, having the aspect of a cat, slowly promenading in a room which finds means to escape by reascending the chimney through an aperture in the wall covered over with a paper which it unglues without damaging. We are of the same opinion, as the Marquis, as the Lauren Doctor, on the difficulty of an exact definition, and we do not see why we should not have in future lightning in the shape of a dog, of a monkey, etc., etc. One shudders at the bare idea of a whole meteorological menagerie, which, thanks to thunder, might come down to our rooms to promenade themselves at will says de Gasparin, in his monster volume of refutations, in questions of testimony, certitude must absolutely cease the moment we cross the borders of the supernatural. The line of demarcation not being sufficiently fixed and determined, which of the opponents is best fitted to take upon himself the difficult task? Which of the two is better entitled to become the public arbiter? Is it the party of superstition, which is supported in its testimony by the evidence of many thousands of people? For nearly two years they crowded the country where were daily manifested the unprecedented miracles of Sidewell, now nearly forgotten among other countless spiritual phenomena, shall we believe them, or shall we bow to science, represented by Bobinet, who, on the testimony of one man, the tailor, accepts the manifestation of the fire globe, or the meteor cat, and henceforth claims for it a place among the established facts of natural phenomena? Mr. Crooks, in his first article in the Quarterly Journal of Science, October 1, 1871, mentions de Gasparin and his work Science v. Spiritualism. He remarks that the author finally arrived at the conclusion that all these phenomena are to be accounted for by the action of natural causes, and do not require the supposition of miracles, nor the intervention of spirits and diabolical influences. Gasparin considers it as a fact fully established by his experiments, that the will, in certain. p. 109. States of organism, can act at a distance on inert matter, and most of his work is devoted to ascertaining the laws and conditions under which this action manifests itself. Precisely, but as the work of de Gasparin called forth numberless answers, defenses, and memoirs, it was then demonstrated by his own work that as he was a Protestant, in point of religious fanaticism, he was as little to be relied upon as de Musso's and de Merville. The former is a profoundly pious Calvinist, while the two latter are fanatical Roman Catholics. Moreover, the very words of de Gasparin betray the spirit of partisanship, I feel I have a duty to perform. I lift high the Protestant flag against the ultramontane banner. Etc. In such matters as the nature of the so-called spiritual phenomena, no evidence can be relied upon, except the disinterested testimony of cold unprejudiced witnesses in science. Truth is one, and legion is the name for religious sects, every one of which claims to have found the unadulterated truth, as the devil is the chief pillar of the Catholic Church, so all supernaturalism and miracles cease, in de Gasparin's opinion, with apostleship. But Mr. Crooks mentioned another eminent scholar, three, of Geneva, professor of natural history, who was a brother investigator with Gasparin and the phenomena of Valiers. This professor contradicts point-blank the assertions of his colleague. The first and most necessary condition, says Gasparin, is the will of the experimenter. Without the will, 
one would obtain nothing. You can form the chain, the circle, for 24 hours consecutively, without obtaining the least movement. The above proves only that de Gasparin makes no difference between phenomena purely magnetic, produced by the persevering will of the sitters among whom there may be not even a single medium, developed or undeveloped, and the so-called spiritual ones. While the first can be produced consciously by nearly every person, who has a firm and determined will, the latter overpowers the sensitive very often against his own consent, and always acts independently of him. The mesmerizer wills a thing, and if he is powerful enough, that thing is done. The medium, even if he had an honest purpose to succeed, may get no manifestations at all. The less he exercises his will, the better the phenomena, the more he feels anxious, the less he is likely to get anything. To mesmerize requires a positive nature, to be a medium a perfectly passive one. This is the alphabet of spiritualism, and no medium is ignorant of it. p. 110. The opinion of three, as we have said, disagrees entirely with Gasparin's theories of willpower. He states it in so many plain words, in a letter, in answer to the invitation of the Count to modify the last article of his memoir. As the book of three is not at hand, we translate the letter as it is found in the resume of de Merville's defense. Three's article which so shocked his religious friend, related to the possibility of the existence and intervention in those manifestations of wills other than those of men and animals. I feel, sir, the justness of your observations in relation to the last pages of this memoir, they may provoke a very bad feeling for me on the part of scientists in general. I regret it the more as my determination seems to affect you so much, nevertheless, I persist in my resolution, because I think it a duty, to shirk which would be a kind of treason. If, against all expectations, there were some truth in spiritualism, by abstaining from saying on the part of science, as I conceive it to be, that the absurdity of the belief in the intervention of spirits is not as yet demonstrated scientifically, for such is the resume, and the thesis of the past pages of my memoir, by abstaining from saying it to those who, after having read my work, will feel inclined to experiment with the phenomena, I might risk to entice such persons on a path many issues of which are very equivocal. Without leaving the domain of science, as I esteem it, I will pursue my duty to the end, without any reticence to the profit of my own glory, and, to use your own words, as the great scandal lies there, I do not wish to assume the shame of it. I, moreover, insist that this is as scientific as anything else. If I wanted to sustain now the theory of the intervention of disembodied spirits, I would have no power for it, for the facts which are made known are not sufficient for the demonstration of such a hypothesis. As it is, and in the position I have assumed, I feel I am strong against every one. Willingly or not, all the scientists must learn, through experience in their own errors, to suspend their judgment as to things which they have not sufficiently examined. The lesson you gave them in this direction cannot be lost. Geneva, 21st of December, 1854. Let us analyze the above letter, and try to discover what the writer thinks, or rather what he does not think of this new force. One thing is certain, at least, Professor Three, a distinguished physicist and naturalist, admits, and even scientifically proves that various manifestations take place. Like Mr. Crookes, he does not believe that they are produced by the interference of spirits or disembodied men who have lived. p. 111. And died on earth, for he says in his letter that nothing has demonstrated this theory. He certainly believes no more in the Catholic devils or demons, for de Merville, who quotes this letter as a triumphant proof against the Gasparin's naturalistic theory, once arrived at the above sentence, hastens to emphasize it by a footnote, which runs thus, at Valiers perhaps, but everywhere else. Showing himself anxious to convey the idea that the professor only meant the manifestations of Valiers, when denying their being produced by demons. The contradictions, and we are sorry to say, the absurdities in which de Gasparin allows himself to be caught, are numerous. While bitterly criticizing the pretensions of the learned Faradaisiacs, he attributes things which he declares magical, to causes perfectly natural. If, he says, we had to deal but with such phenomena, as witnessed and explained, by the great physicist, we might as well hold our tongues, but we have passed beyond, and what good can they do now, I would ask, these apparatus which demonstrate that non-conscious pressure explains the whole? It explains all, and the table resists pressure and guidance. It explains all and a piece of furniture which nobody touches follows the fingers pointed at it, it levitates, without contact, and it turns itself upside down. 
but for all that, he takes upon himself to explain the phenomena. People will be advocating miracles, you say magic. Every new law appears to them as a prodigy. Calm yourselves, I take upon myself the task to quiet those who are alarmed. In the face of such phenomena, we do not cross at all the boundaries of natural law. Most assuredly, we do not. But can the scientists assert that they have in their possession the keys to such law? M. De Gasparin thinks he has. Let us see. I do not risk myself to explain anything, it is no business of mine. To authenticate simple facts, and maintain a truth which science desires to smother, is all I pretend to do. Nevertheless, I cannot resist the temptation to point out to those who would treat us as so many Illuminati or sorcerers, that the manifestation in question affords an interpretation which agrees with the ordinary laws of science. Suppose a fluid, emanating from the experimenters, and chiefly from some of them, suppose that they will determine the direction taken by the fluid, and you will readily understand the rotation and levitation of that one of the legs of the table toward which is ejected with every action of the will an excessive fluid. Suppose that the glass causes the p. 112. Fluid to escape, and you will understand how a tumbler placed on the table can interrupt its rotation, and that the tumbler, placed on one of its sides, causes the accumulation of the fluid in the opposite side, which, in consequence of that, is lifted. If every one of the experimenters were clever mesmerizers, the explanation, minus certain important details, might be acceptable. So much for the power of human will on inanimate matter, according to the learned minister of Louis Philippe. But how about the intelligence exhibited by the table? What explanation does he give us to answers obtained through the agency of this table to questions? Answers which could not possibly have been the reflections of the brain of those present, one of the favorite theories of de Gasparin, for their own ideas were quite the reverse of the very liberal philosophy given by this wonderful table? On this he is silent. Anything but spirits, whether human, satanic, or elemental. Thus, the simultaneous concentration of thought, and the accumulation of fluid, will be found no better than the unconscious cerebration and psychic force of other scientists. We must try again and we may predict beforehand that the thousand and one theories of science will prove of no avail until they will confess that this force, far from being a projection of the accumulated wills of the circle, is, on the contrary, a force which is abnormal, foreign to themselves, and supra-intelligent. Professor Thury, who denies the theory of departed human spirits, rejects the Christian devil doctrine, and shows himself unwilling to pronounce in favor of Crookes's theory, the sixth, that of the Hermetists and ancient theurgists, adopts the one, which, he says in his letter, is the most prudent, and makes him feel strong against every one. Moreover, he accepts as little of the Gasparin's hypothesis of unconscious willpower. This is what he says in his work. As to the announced phenomena, such as the levitation without contact, and the displacement of furniture by invisible hands unable to demonstrate their impossibility, a priori, no one has the right to treat as absurd the serious evidences which affirm their occurrence. p. 9. As to the theory proposed by M. de Gasparin, Thury judges it very severely. While admitting that in the experiments of Valiers, says the Merville, the seat of the force might have been in the individual and we say that it was intrinsic and extrinsic at the same time and that the will might be generally necessary, p. 20, he repeats but what he had said in his preface, to wit, M. de Gasparin presents us with crude facts, and the explanations following he offers for what they are worth. Breathe on them and not many will be found standing after this. No. P. 113. Very little, if anything, will remain of his explanations. As to facts, they are henceforth demonstrated. P. 10. As Mr. Crooks tells us, Professor Thury refutes all these explanations, and considers the effects due to a peculiar substance, fluid, or agent, pervading in a manner similar to the luminiferous ether of the scientists, all matter, nervous, organic or inorganic, which he terms psychode. He enters into full discussion as to the properties of the state, or form, or matter, and proposes the term actinic force, for the power exerted when the mind acts at a distance through the influence of the psychode. Mr. Crookes remarks further, that Professor Thury's actinic force, and his own psychic force are evidently equivalent terms. We certainly could very easily demonstrate that the two forces are identical, moreover, the astral or sidereal light is explained by the alchemist and Elphus Levi, in his Doma et Rituel de la Haute Magie, and that, under the name of Akasha, or life principle, 
This all-pervading force was known to the Gymnosophists, Hindu magicians, and adepts of all countries, thousands of years ago, and, that it is still known to them, and used at present by the Tibetan Lamas, Fakirs, Thaumaturgists of all nationalities, and even by many of the Hindu jugglers. In many cases of trance, artificially induced by mesmerization, it is also quite possible, even quite probable, that it is the spirit of the subject which acts under the guidance of the operator's will. But, if the medium remains conscious, and psychophysical phenomena occur which indicate a directing intelligence, then, unless it be conceded that he is a magician, and can project his double, physical exhaustion can signify nothing more than nervous prostration. The proof that he is the passive instrument of unseen entities controlling occult potencies, seems conclusive. Even if three Zectenic and Crooks's psychic force are substantially of the same derivation, the respective discoverers seem to differ widely as to the properties and potencies of this force, while Professor Three candidly admits that the phenomena are often produced by wills not human, and so, of course, gives a qualified endorsement to Mr. Crooks's theory number six, the latter, admitting the genuineness of the phenomena, has as yet pronounced no definite opinion as to their cause. Thus, we find that neither M3, who investigated these manifestations with de Gasparin in 1854, nor Mr. Crooks, who conceded their undeniable genuineness in 1874, have reached anything definite. Both are chemists, physicists, and very learned men. Both have given all their attention to the puzzling question, and besides these two scientists. P. 114. There were many others who, while coming to the same conclusion, have hitherto been as unable to furnish the world with a final solution. It follows then, that in twenty years none of the scientists have made a single step toward the unraveling of the mystery, which remains as immovable and impregnable as the walls of an enchanted castle in a fairy tale. Would it be too impertinent to surmise that perhaps our modern scientists have gotten what the French term encircle visue? That, hampered by the weight of their materialism, and the insufficiency of what they name the exact sciences to demonstrate to them tangibly the existence of a spiritual universe, peopled and inhabited much more than our visible one, they are doomed forever to creep around inside that circle, unwilling rather than unable to penetrate beyond its enchanted ring, and explore it in its length and breadth? It is but prejudice which keeps them from making a compromise with well-established facts and seek alliance with such expert magnetists and mesmerizers as Radu Patet and Regazzoni. What, then, is produced from death? inquired Socrates of Cebes. Life, was the reply, can the soul, since it is immortal, be anything else than imperishable? The seed cannot develop unless it is in part consumed, says Professor Lecomte, it is not quickened unless it die, says St. Paul. A flower blossoms, then withers and dies. It leaves a fragrance behind, which, long after its delicate petals are but a little dust, still lingers in the air. Our material sense may not be cognizant of it, but it nevertheless exists. Let a note be struck on an instrument, and the faintest sound produces an eternal echo. A disturbance is created on the invisible waves of the shoreless ocean of space, and the vibration is never wholly lost. Its energy being once carried from the world of matter into the immaterial world will live forever. And man, we are asked to believe, man, the living, thinking, reasoning entity, the indwelling deity of our nature's crowning masterpiece, will evacuate his casket and be no more. What the principle of continuity which exists even for the so-called inorganic matter, for a floating atom, be denied to the spirit, whose attributes are consciousness, memory, mind, love. Really, the very idea is preposterous. The more we think and the more we learn, the more difficult it becomes for us to account for the atheism of the scientist. We may readily understand that a man ignorant of the laws of nature, unlearned in either chemistry or physics, may be fairly drawn into materialism through his very ignorance, his incapacity of. p. 115. Understanding the philosophy of the exact sciences, or drawing any inference by analogy from the visible to the invisible. A natural-born metaphysician, an ignorant dreamer, may awake abruptly and say to himself, I dreamed it, I have no tangible proof of that which I imagined, it is all illusion, etc. But for a man of science, acquainted with the characteristics of the universal energy, to maintain that life is merely a phenomenon of matter, a species of energy, amounts simply to a confession of his own incapability of analyzing and properly understanding the alpha and the omega even of that matter. Sincere skepticism as to the immortality of man's soul is a malady, a malformation of the physical brain, 
and has existed in every age. As there are infants born with a call upon their heads, so there are men who are incapable to their last hour of ridding themselves of that kind of call evidently enveloping their organs of spirituality. But it is quite another feeling which makes them reject the possibility of spiritual and magical phenomena. The true name for that feeling is vanity. We can neither produce nor explain it hence, it does not exist, and moreover, could never have existed. Such is the irrefutable argument of our present-day philosophers. Some thirty years ago, E. Salvert startled the world of the credulous by his work, The Philosophy of Magic. The book claimed to unveil the whole of the miracles of the Bible as well as those of the pagan sanctuaries. Its resume ran thus, long ages of observation, a great knowledge, for those days of ignorance, of natural sciences and philosophy, imposture, ledger domain, optics, phantasmagoria, exaggeration. Final and logical conclusion, thaumaturgists, prophets, magicians, rascals, and knaves, the rest of the world, fools. Among many other conclusive proofs, the reader can find him offering the following. The enthusiastic disciples of Iamblichus affirm that when he prayed, he was raised to the height of ten cubits from the ground, and dupes to the same metaphor, although Christians, have had the simplicity to attribute a similar miracle to St. Clair, and St. Francis of Assisi. Hundreds of travelers claimed to have seen fakirs produce the same phenomena, and they were all thought either liars or hallucinated. But it was but yesterday that the same phenomenon was witnessed and endorsed by a well-known scientist, it was produced under test conditions, declared by Mr. Crooks to be genuine, and to be beyond the possibility of an illusion or a trick. And so was it manifested many a time before and attested by numerous witnesses, though the latter are now invariably disbelieved. P. 116. Peace to thy scientific ashes, O credulous Aseb Salver. Who knows but before the close of the present century popular wisdom will have invented a new proverb, as incredibly credulous as a scientist. Why should it appear so impossible that when the spirit is once separated from its body, it may have the power to animate some evanescent form, created out of that magical psychic or actinic or ethereal force, with the help of the elementaries who furnish it with the sublimated matter of their own bodies? The only difficulty is, to realize the fact that surrounding space is not an empty void but a reservoir filled to repletion with the models of all things that ever were, that are, and that will be, and with beings of countless races, unlike our own. Seemingly supernatural facts supernatural in that they openly contradict the demonstrated natural laws of gravitation, as in the above-mentioned instance of levitation are recognized by many scientists. Every one who has dared to investigate with thoroughness has found himself compelled to admit their existence only in their unsuccessful efforts to account for the phenomena on theories based on the laws of such forces as were already known, some of the highest representatives of science have involved themselves in inextricable difficulties. In his resume de Merville describes the argumentation of these adversaries of spiritualism as consisting of five paradoxes, which he terms distractions. First distraction, that of Faraday, who explains the table phenomenon, by the table which pushes you in consequence of the resistance which pushes it back. Second distraction, that of Bobinet, explaining all the communications, by raps, which are produced, as he says, in good faith and with perfect conscientiousness, correct in every way and sense by ventriloquism, the use of which faculty implies of necessity bad faith. Third distraction, that of Dr. Chevroy, explaining the faculty of moving furniture without contact, by the preliminary acquisition of that faculty. Fourth distraction, that of the French Institute and its members, who consent to accept the miracles, on condition that the latter will not contradict in any way those natural laws with which they are acquainted. Fifth distraction, that of M. de Gasparin, introducing as a very simple and perfectly elementary phenomenon that which every one rejects, precisely because no one ever saw the like of it. While the great, world-known scientists indulge in such fantastic theories, some less-known neurologists find an explanation for occult phenomena. P. 117 of every kind in an abnormal effluvium resulting from epilepsy. Another would treat mediums and poets, too, we may infer with a saffetida pneumonia, and declare every one of the believers in spiritual manifestations lunatics and hallucinated mystics. To the latter lecture and professed pathologist is commended that sensible bit of advice to be found in the New Testament, Physician, heal thyself. Truly, no sane man would so sweepingly charge insanity upon 446 millions of people in various parts of the world, who believe in the intercourse of spirits with ourselves. 
Considering all this, it remains to us but to wonder at the preposterous presumption of these men, who claim to be regarded by right of learning as the high priests of science, to classify a phenomenon they know nothing about. Surely, several millions of their countrymen and women, if deluded, deserve at least as much attention as potato bugs or grasshoppers. But, instead of that, what do we find? The Congress of the United States, at the demand of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, enact statutes for organization of national insect commissions. Chemists are busying themselves in boiling frogs and bugs. Geologists amuse their leisure by osteological surveys of armor-plated gonoids, and discuss the odontology of the various species of dinectes. And entomologists suffer their enthusiasm to carry them to the length of supping on grasshoppers boiled, fried, and in soup. Meanwhile, millions of Americans are either losing themselves in the maze of crazy delusions, according to the opinion of some of these very learned encyclopedists, or perishing physically from nervous disorders, brought on or brought out by mediumistic diathesis. At one time, there was reason to hope that Russian scientists would have undertaken the task of giving the phenomena a careful and impartial study. A commission was appointed by the Imperial University of St. Petersburg, with Professor Mendeleev, the great physicist, at its head. The advertised program provided for a series of 40 seances to test mediums, and invitations were extended to all of this class who chose to come to the Russian capital and submit their powers to examination. As a rule they refused doubtless from a prevision of the trap that had been laid for them. After eight sittings, upon a shallow pretext, and just when the manifestations were becoming interesting, the commission prejudged the case, and published a decision adverse to the claims of mediumism. Instead of pursuing dignified, scientific methods, they set spies to peep. P. 118. Through the Keyholes. Professor Mendeleev declared in a public lecture that spiritualism, or any such belief in our soul's immortality, was a mixture of superstition, delusion, and fraud, adding that every manifestation of such nature including mind-reading, trance, and other psychological phenomena, we must suppose could be, and was produced by means of clever apparatus and machinery concealed under the clothing of mediums. After such a public exhibition of ignorance and prejudice, Mr. Butleroff, professor of chemistry at the St. Petersburg University, and Mr. Aksakoff, counselor of state in the same city, who had been invited to assist on the committee for mediums, became so disgusted that they withdrew. Having published their protests in the Russian papers, they were supported by the majority of the press, who did not spare either Mendeleev or his officious committee with their sarcasms. The public acted fairly in that case. 130 names, of the most influential persons of the best society of St. Petersburg, many of them no spiritualists at all, but simply investigators, added their signatures to the well-deserved protest. The inevitable result of such a procedure followed. Universal attention was drawn to the question of spiritualism, private circles were organized throughout the empire, some of the most liberal journals began to discuss the subject, and, as we write, a new commission is being organized to finish the interrupted task. But now as a matter of course they will do their duty less than ever. They have a better pretext than they ever had in the pretended expose of the medium slade, by Professor Lancaster, of London. True, to the evidence of one scientist and his friend, Messrs. Lancaster and Duncan the accused oppose the testimony of Wallace, Crooks, and a host of others, which totally nullifies an accusation based merely on circumstantial evidence and prejudice. As the London Spectator very pertinently observes, it is really a pure superstition and nothing else to assume that we are so fully acquainted with the laws of nature, that even carefully examined facts, attested by an experienced observer, ought to be cast aside as utterly unworthy of credit, only because they do not, at first sight, seem to be in keeping with what is most clearly known already. To assume, as Professor Lancaster appears to do, that because there are fraud and credulity and plenty to be found in connection with these facts as there is, no doubt, in connection with all nervous diseases fraud and credulity will account for all the carefully attested statements of accurate and conscientious observers, is to saw away at the very branch of the tree of knowledge on which inductive science necessarily rests, and to bring the whole structure toppling to the ground. P. 119. But what matters all this to scientists? The torrent of superstition, which, according to them, sweeps away millions of bright intellects in its impetuous course, cannot reach them. The modern deluge called spiritualism is unable to affect their strong minds, and the muddy waves of the flood must expend their raging fury without wetting even the soles of their boots. 
Surely it must be but traditional stubbornness on the part of the Creator that prevents him from confessing what a poor chance his miracles have in our day and blinding professed scientists. By this time even he ought to know and take notice that long ago they decided to write on the porticos of their universities and colleges. Science commands that God shall not do miracles upon this spot. Both the infidel spiritualists and the orthodox Roman Catholics seem to have leagued themselves this year against the iconoclastic pretensions of materialism. Increase of skepticism has developed of late a like increase of credulity. The champions of the Bible divine miracles rival the panegyrist mediumistic phenomena, and the Middle Ages revive in the 19th century. Once more we see the Virgin Mary resume her epistolary correspondence with the faithful children of her church and while the angel friends scribble messages to spiritualists through their mediums, the Mother of God drops letters direct from heaven to earth. The shrine of Notre Dame de Lourdes has turned into a spiritualistic cabinet for materializations, while the cabinets of popular American mediums are transformed into sacred shrines, into which Muhammad, Bishop Polk, Joan of Arc and other aristocratic spirits from over the dark river, having descended, materialize in full light. And if the Virgin Mary is seen taking her daily walk in the woods about Lord in full human form, why not the Apostle of Islam, and the late Bishop of Louisiana? Either both miracles are possible, or both kinds of these manifestations, the divine as well as the spiritual, are errant impostures. Time alone will prove which, but meanwhile, as science refuses the loan of her magic lamp to illuminate these mysteries, common people must go stumbling on whether they be mired or not. The recent miracles at Lord having been unfavorably discussed in the London papers, Monsignor Capel communicates to the Times the views of the Roman Church in the following terms. p. 120. As to the miraculous cures which are effected, I would refer your readers to the calm, judicious work, La Grat de Lord, written by Dr. Dozis, an eminent resident practitioner, inspector of epidemic diseases for the district, and medical assistant of the Court of Justice. He prefaces a number of detailed cases of miraculous cures, which he says he has studied with great care and perseverance. With these words, I declare that these cures effected at the sanctuary of Lord by means of the water of the fountain, have established their supernatural character in the eyes of men of good faith. I ought to confess that without these cures, my mind, little prone to listen to miraculous explanations of any kind, would have had great difficulty in accepting even this fact, the apparition, remarkable as it is from so many points of view. But the cures, of which I have been so often an ocular witness, have given to my mind a light which does not permit me to ignore the importance of the visits of Bernadette to the grotto, and the reality of the apparitions with which she was favored. The testimony of a distinguished medical man, who has carefully watched from the beginning Bernadette, and the miraculous cures at the grotto, is at least worthy of respectful consideration. I may add, that the vast number of those who come to the grotto do so to reap in of their sins, to increase their piety, to pray for the regeneration of their country, to profess publicly their belief in the Son of God and His Immaculate Mother. Many come to be cured of bodily ailments, and on the testimony of eyewitnesses several return home freed from their sickness. To upbraid with non-belief, as does your article, those who use also the waters of the Pyrenees, is as reasonable as to charge with unbelief the magistrates who inflict punishment on the peculiar people for neglecting to have medical aid. Health obliged me to pass the winters of 1860 to 1867 at Pau. This gave me the opportunity of making the most minute inquiry into the apparition at Lord. After frequent and lengthened examinations of Bernadette and of some of the miracles effected, I am convinced that, if facts are to be received on human testimony, then has the apparition at Lord every claim to be received as an undeniable fact. It is, however, no part of the Catholic faith, and may be accepted or rejected by any Catholic without the least praise or condemnation. Let the reader observe the sentence we have italicized. This makes it clear that the Catholic Church, despite her infallibility in her liberal postage convention with the Kingdom of Heaven, is content to accept even the validity of divine miracles upon human testimony. Now when we turn to the report of Mr. Huxley's recent New York lectures on evolution, we find him saying that it is upon human historical evidence that we depend for the greater part of our knowledge for the doings of. p. 121. The Past. In a lecture on biology, he has said, Every man who has the interest of truth at heart must earnestly desire that every well-founded and just criticism that can be made should be made, but it is essential, that the critic should know what he is talking about. An aphorism that its author should recall when he undertakes to pronounce upon psychological subjects. Add this to his views, 
as expressed above, and who could ask a better platform upon which to meet him? Here we have a representative materialist, and a representative Catholic prelate, enunciating an identical view of the sufficiency of human testimony to prove facts that it suits the prejudices of each to believe. After this, what need for either the student of occultism, or even the spiritualist, to hunt about for endorsements of the argument they have so long and so persistently advanced, that the psychological phenomena of ancient and modern thaumaturgists being superabundantly proven upon human testimony must be accepted as facts? Church and college having appealed to the tribunal of human evidence, they cannot deny the rest of mankind an equal privilege. One of the fruits of the recent agitation in London of the subject of mediumistic phenomena, is the expression of some remarkably liberal views on the part of the secular press. In any case, we are for admitting spiritualism to a place among tolerated beliefs, and letting it alone accordingly, says the London Daily News, in 1876. It has many votaries who are as intelligent as most of us, and to whom any obvious and palpable defect in the evidence meant to convince must have been obvious and palpable long ago. Some of the wisest men in the world believed in ghosts and would have continued to do so even though half a dozen persons in succession had been convicted of frightening people with sham goblins. It is not for the first time in the history of the world, that the invisible world has to contend against the materialistic skepticism of soul-blind Sadducees. Plato deplores such an unbelief, and refers to this pernicious tendency more than once in his works. From Kapila, the Hindu philosopher, who many centuries before Christ demurred to the claim of the mystic yogins, that in ecstasy a man has the power of seeing deity face to face and conversing with the highest beings, down to the Voltaireans of the 18th century, who laughed at everything that was held sacred by other people, each age had its unbelieving Thomases. Did they ever succeed in checking the progress of truth? No more than the ignorant bigots who sat in judgment over Galileo checked the progress of the Earth's rotation. No exposures whatever are able to vitally affect the stability or instability of a belief which humanity inherited from the first races of men, those, who if we, p. 122, can believe in the evolution of spiritual man as in that of the physical one had the great truth from the lips of their ancestors, the gods of their fathers, that were on the other side of the flood. The identity of the Bible with the legends of the Hindu sacred books and the cosmogonies of other nations, must be demonstrated at some future day. The fables of the Mythopoeic Ages will be found to have but allegorized the greatest truths of geology and anthropology. It is in these ridiculously expressed fables that science will have to look for her missing links. Otherwise, when such strange coincidences in the respective histories of nations and peoples so widely thrown apart? Whence the identity of primitive conceptions which, fables and legends though they are termed now, contain in them nevertheless the kernel of historical facts, of a truth thickly overgrown with the husk of popular embellishment, but still a truth? Compare only this verse of Genesis by, and it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days, etc., with this part of the Hindu cosmogony, and the Vedas, which speaks of the descent of the Brahmins. The first Braham complains of being alone among all his brethren without a wife. Notwithstanding that the Eternal advises him to devote his days solely to the study of the sacred knowledge, Veda, the firstborn of mankind insists. Provoked at such ingratitude, the Eternal gave Braham a wife of the race of the Danes, or giants, from whom all the Brahmins maternally descend. Thus the entire Hindu priesthood is descended, on the one hand, from the superior spirits, the sons of God, and from Dantony, the daughter of the earthly giants, the primitive men. And they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. The same is found in the Scandinavian cosmogonical fragment. In the Edda is given the description to Gangler by Har, one of the three informants, Har, Jafuhar, and Treaty, of the first man, called Bur, the father of Bor, who took for wife Bzla, a daughter of the giant Bultera, of the race of the primitive giants. The full and interesting narrative may be found in the prose Edda, sex. 4 to 8, in Mallet's Northern Antiquities. The same groundwork underlies the Grecian fables about the Titans, and may be found in the legend of the Mexicans the four successive races of Popol Vuh. It constitutes one of the many ends to be found in. p. 123. The entangled and seemingly inextricable skein of mankind, be it as a psychological phenomenon. Belief in supernaturalism would be otherwise inexplicable. 
to say that it sprang up and grew and developed throughout the countless ages without either cause or the least firm basis to rest upon but merely as an empty fancy would be to utter as great an absurdity as the theological doctrine that the universe sprang into creation out of nothing it is too late now to kick against an evidence which manifests itself as in the full glare of noon liberal as well as christian papers and the organs of the most advanced scientific authorities begin to protest unanimously against the dogmatism and narrow prejudices of silism the christian world a religious paper adds its voice to that of the unbelieving london press following is a good specimen of its common sense if a medium it says can be shown ever so conclusively to be an impostor we shall still object to the disposition manifested by persons of some authority in scientific matters to poo-poo and knock on the head all careful inquiry into those subjects of which mr barrett took note in his paper before the british association because spiritualists have committed themselves to many absurdities that is no reason why the phenomena to which they appeal should be scouted as unworthy of examination they may be mesmeric or clairvoyant or something else but let our wise men tell us what they are and not snub us as ignorant people too often snub inquiring youth by the easy but unsatisfactory apothem little children should not ask questions thus the time has come when the scientists have lost all right to be addressed with the miltonian verse o thou who for the testimony of truth has borne universal reproach sad degeneration and one that recalls the exclamation of that doctor of physic mentioned one hundred and eighty years ago by dr henry moore and who upon hearing the story told of the drummer of tedworth and of in walker cried out presently if this be true i have been in a wrong box all this time and must begin my account anew but in our century notwithstanding huxley's endorsement of the value of human testimony even dr henry moore has become an enthusiast and a visionary both of which united in the same person constitute a canting madman p one hundred twenty four what psychology has long lacked to make its mysterious laws better understood and applied to the ordinary as well as extraordinary affairs of life is not facts these it has had in abundance the need has been for their recording and classification for trained observers and competent analysts from the scientific body these ought to have been supplied if error has prevailed and superstition run right these many centuries throughout christendom it is the misfortune of the common people the reproach of science the generations have come and gone each furnishing its quota of martyrs to conscience and moral courage and psychology is little better understood in our day than it was when the heavy hand of the vatican sent those brave unfortunates to their untimely doom and branded their memories with the stigma of heresy and sorcery chapter five ich bin der geist der stets vernein i am the spirit which still denies mephisto and faust the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him gospel according to john fourteen seventeen millions of spiritual creatures walk the earth unseen both when we wake and when we sleep milton mere intellectual enlightenment cannot recognize the spiritual as the sun puts out a fire so spirit puts out the eyes of mere intellect w how it there has been an infinite confusion of names to express one and the same thing the chaos of the ancients the zoroastrian sacred fire or the enthusbirum of the parsis the hermes fire the elm's fire of the ancient germans the lightning of sibel the burning torch of apollo the flame on the altar of pan the inextinguishable fire in the temple on the acropolis and in that of vesta the fire flame of pluto's helm the brilliant sparks on the hats of the dioscuri on the gorgon head the helm of pallas and the staff of mercury the pi upsilon rho alpha sigma beta epsilon sigma tau omicron near the egyptian tha or ra the grecian zeus catibates the descending the pentecostal fire tongues the burning bush of moses the pillar of fire of the exodus and the burning lamp of abram the eternal fire of the bottomless pit the delphic oracular vapors the sidereal light of the rosicrucians the akasha of the hindu adepts the astral light of eliphas levi the nerve aura and the fluid of the magnetis the odd of reichenbach the fire globe or meteor cat of bobinet the psychode and actinic force of three the psychic force of sergeant cox and mr crooks the atmospheric magnetism of some naturalists galvanism and finally electricity are but various names for many different manifestations or effects of the same mysterious all pervading cause the greek archaeus or alpha rho chi alpha iota omicron sigma sir e bulwer lytton in his coming race describes it as the real used by the subterranean populations 
and allowed his readers to take it. P. 126. For fiction. These people, he says, consider that in the real they had arrived at the unity and natural emergic agencies, and proceeds to show that Faraday intimated them under the more cautious term of correlation, thus. I have long held an opinion, almost amounting to a conviction, in common, I believe, with many other lovers of natural knowledge, that the various forms under which the forces of matter are made manifest, have one common origin, or, in other words, are so directly related and naturally dependent, that they are convertible, as it were, into one another, and possess equivalents of power in their action. Absurd and unscientific as may appear a comparison of a fictitious real invented by the great novelist, and the primal force of the equally great experimentalist, with the cabalistic astral light, it is nevertheless the true definition of this force. Discoveries are constantly being made to corroborate the statement thus boldly put forth. Since we began to write this part of our book, an announcement has been made in a number of papers of the supposed discovery of a new force by Mr. Edison, the electrician, of New York, New Jersey, which force seems to have little in common with electricity, or galvanism, except the principle of conductivity. If demonstrated, it may remain for a long time under some pseudonymous scientific name, but, nevertheless, it will be but one of the numerous family of children brought forth from the commencement of time by our cabalistic mother, the astral virgin. In fact, the discoverer says that, it is as distinct, and has as regular laws as heat, magnetism, or electricity. The journal which contains the first account of the discovery adds that, Mr. Edison thinks that it exists in connection with heat, and that it can also be generated by independent and as yet undiscovered means. Another of the most startling of recent discoveries, is the possibility of annihilating distance between human voices by means of the telephone, distance sounder, an instrument invented by Professor A. Graham Bell. This possibility, first suggested by the Little Lover's Telegraph, consisting of small tin cups with vellum and drug twine apparatus, by which a conversation can be carried on at a distance of 200 feet, has developed into the telephone, which will become the wonder of this age. A long conversation has taken place between Boston and Cambridgeport by telegraph, every word being distinctly heard and perfectly understood, and the modulations of voices being quite distinguishable, according to the official report. The voice is seized upon, so to say, and held in form by a magnet, and the sound wave transmitted by electricity acting in unison and cooperating with the magnet. The whole success depends upon a perfect control of the electric currents in the p. 127. Power of the magnets used, with which the former must cooperate. The invention, reports the paper, may be really described as a sort of trumpet, over the bell mouth of which is drawn a delicate membrane, which, when the voice is thrown into the tube, swells outward in proportion to the force of the sound wave. To the outer side of the membrane is attached a piece of metal, which, as the membrane swells outward, connects with a magnet, and this, with the electric circuit, is controlled by the operator. By some principle, not yet fully understood, the electric current transmits the sound wave just as delivered by the voice in the trumpet, and the listener at the other end of the line, with a twin or facsimile trumpet at his ear, hears every word distinctly, and readily detects the modulations of the speaker's voice. Thus, in the presence of such wonderful discoveries of our age, and the further magical possibilities lying latent and yet undiscovered in the boundless realm of nature, and further, in view of the great probability that Edison's force and Professor Graham Bell's telephone may unsettle, if not utterly upset all our ideas of the imponderable fluids, would it not be well for such persons as may be tempted to traverse our statements, to wait and see whether they will be corroborated or refuted by further discoveries? Only in connection with these discoveries, we may, perhaps, well remind our readers of the many hints to be found in the ancient histories as to a certain secret in the possession of the Egyptian priesthood, who could instantly communicate, during the celebration of the mysteries, from one temple to another, even though the former were at Thebes and the latter at the other end of the country, the legends attributing it, as a matter of course, to the invisible tribes of the air, which carry messages for mortals. The author of Pre-Adamite Man quotes an instance, which being given merely on his own authority, and he seeming uncertain whether the story comes from Macrinus or some other writer, may be taken for what it is worth. He found good evidence, he says, during his stay in Egypt, that one of the Cleopatras, sent news by wire to all the cities, from Heliopolis to Elephantine, on the Upper Nile. It is not so long since Professor Tyndall ushered us into a new world, peopled with airy shapes of the most ravishing beauty. 
The discovery consists, he says, in subjecting the vapors of volatile liquids to the action of concentrated sunlight, or to the concentrated beam of the electric light. The vapors of certain nitrites, iodides, and acids are subjected to the action of the light in an experimental tube, lying horizontally, and so arranged that the axis of the tube and that of p. 128. The parallel beams issuing from the lamp are coincident. The vapors form clouds of gorgeous tints, and arrange themselves into the shapes of vases, of bottles and cones, and nests of six or more, of shells, of tulips, roses, sunflowers, leaves, and of involved scrolls. In one case, he tells us, the cloud bud grew rapidly into a serpent's head, a mouth was formed, and from the cloud, a cord of cloud resembling a tongue was discharged. Finally, to cap the climax of marvels, once it positively assumed the form of a fish, with eyes, gills, and feelers. The tunis of the animal form was displayed throughout, and no disc, coil, or speck existed on one side that did not exist on the other. These phenomena may possibly be explained in part by the mechanical action of a beam of light, which Mr. Crookes has recently demonstrated. For instance, it is a supposable case, that the beams of light may have constituted a horizontal axis, about which the disturbed molecules of the vapors gathered into the forms of globes and spindles. But how account for the fish, the serpent's head, the vases, the flowers of different varieties, the shells? This seems to offer a dilemma to science as baffling as the meteor cat of Bobinet. We do not learn that Tyndall ventured as absurd an explanation of his extraordinary phenomena as that of the Frenchman about his. Those who have not given attention to the subject may be surprised to find how much was known in former days of that all-pervading, subtle principle which has recently been baptized the universal ether. Before proceeding, we desire once more to enunciate in two categorical propositions what was hinted at before. These propositions were demonstrated laws with the ancient theurgists. I. The so-called miracles, to begin with Moses and end with Cagliostro, when genuine, whereas the Gasparin very justly insinuates in his work on the phenomena, perfectly in accordance with natural law, hence no miracles. Electricity and magnetism were unquestionably used in the production of some of the prodigies, but now, the same as then, they are put in requisition by every sensitive, who is made to use unconsciously these powers by the peculiar nature of his or her organization, which serves as a conductor for some of these imponderable fluids, as yet so imperfectly known to science. This force is the prolific parent of numberless attributes and properties, many, or rather, most of which, are as yet unknown to modern physics. 2. The phenomena of natural magic to be witnessed in Siam, India, Egypt, and other oriental countries, bear no relationship whatever to sleight of hand, the one being an absolute physical effect, due to the action of occult natural forces, the other, a mere deceptive result. p. 129. Obtained by dexterous manipulation supplemented with confederacy. The thaumaturgists of all periods, schools, and countries, produced their wonders, because they were perfectly familiar with the imponderable in their effects but otherwise perfectly tangible waves of the astral light. They controlled the currents by guiding them with their willpower. The wonders were both of physical and psychological character, the former embracing effects produced upon material objects, the latter the mental phenomena of Mesmer and his successors. This class has been represented in our time by two illustrious men, Du Petet and Regazzoni, whose wonderful powers were well attested in France and other countries. Mesmerism is the most important branch of magic, and its phenomena are the effects of the universal agent which underlies all magic and has produced at all ages the so-called miracles. The ancients called it chaos, Plato and the Pythagoreans named it the soul of the world. According to the Hindus, the deity in the shape of ether pervades all things. It is the invisible, but, as we have said before, too tangible fluid. Among other names this universal Proteus or the Nebulous Almighty, as the Marvel calls it in derision was termed by the Theurgist the Living Fire, the Spirit of Light, and Magnus. This last appellation indicates its magnetic properties and shows its magical nature. For, as truly expressed by one of its enemies Mu Alpha Gamma Omicron Sigma and Mu Alpha Gamma Nu Epsilon Sigma are two branches growing from the same trunk and shooting forth the same resultants. Magnetism is a word for the derivation of which we have to look to an incredibly early epoch. The stone called magnet is believed by many to owe its name to Magnesia, a city or district in Thessaly, where these stones were found in quantity. We believe, however, the opinion of the Hermetists to be the correct one. 
The word mag, magus, is derived from the Sanskrit mahaji, the great or wise, the anointed by the divine wisdom. Yumalpas is the mythic founder of the Yumalpadae, priest. p. 130. The priests trace their own wisdom to the divine intelligence. The various cosmogony show that the archaeal universal soul was held by every nation as the mind of the demiurgic creator, the Sophia of the Gnostics, or the Holy Ghost as a female principle. As the Magi derived their name from it, so the Magnesian stone or magnet was called in their honor, for they were the first to discover its wonderful properties. Their temples dotted the country in all directions, and among these were some temples of Hercules, hence the stone, when it once became known that the priests used it for their curative and magical purposes, received the name of the Magnesian or Heraclean stone. Socrates, speaking of it, remarks, Euripides calls it the Magnesian stone, but the common people, the Heraclean. It was the country and stone which were called after the Magi, not the Magi after one or the other. Pliny informs us that the wedding ring among the Romans was magnetized by the priests before the ceremony. The old pagan historians are careful to keep silent on certain mysteries of the wise, Magi, and Pausanias was warned in a dream, he says, not to unveil the holy rites of the Temple of Demeter and Persephone at Athens. Modern science, after having ineffectually denied animal magnetism, has found herself forced to accept it as a fact. It is now a recognized property of human and animal organization, as to its psychological, occult influence, the academies battle with it, in our century, more ferociously than ever. It is the more to be regretted and even wondered at, as the representatives of exact science are unable to either explain or even offer us anything like a reasonable hypothesis for the undeniable mysterious potency contained in a simple magnet. We begin to have daily proofs that these potencies underlie the theurgic mysteries, and therefore might perhaps explain the occult faculties possessed by ancient and modern thaumaturgists as well as a good many of their most astounding achievements. Such were the gifts transmitted by Jesus to some of. p. 131. His Disciples. At the moment of his miraculous cures, the Nazarene felt a power issuing from him. Socrates, in his dialogue with Theges, telling him of his familiar god, demon, and his power of either imparting his, Socrates, wisdom to his disciples or preventing it from benefiting those he associates with, brings the following instance in corroboration of his words, I will tell you, Socrates, says Aristides, a thing incredible, indeed, by the gods, but true. I made a proficiency when I associated with you, even if I was only in the same house, though not in the same room, but more so, when I was in the same room, and much more when I looked at you. But I made by far the greatest proficiency when I sat near you and touched you. This is the modern magnetism and mesmerism of Du Patet and other masters, who, when they have subjected a person to their fluidic influence, can impart to them all their thoughts even at a distance, and with an irresistible power force their subject to obey their mental orders. But how far better was this psychic force known to the ancient philosophers? We can glean some information on that subject from the earliest sources. Pythagoras taught his disciples that God is the universal mind diffused through all things, and that this mind by the sole virtue of its universal sameness could be communicated from one object to another and be made to create all things by the sole willpower of man. With the ancient Greeks, Kyrios was the God-mind, Nu. Now chorus, Kyrios, signifies the pure and unmixed nature of intellect wisdom, says Plato. Kyrios is Mercury, the divine wisdom, and Mercury is the soul, son, from whom that Hermes received this divine wisdom, which, in his turn, he imparted to the world in his books. Hercules is also the sun the celestial storehouse of the universal magnetism, or rather Hercules is the magnetic light which, when having made its way through the open eye of heaven, enters into the regions of our planet and thus becomes the creator. Hercules passes through the twelve labors, the valiant titan. He is called father of all and. p. 132. Self-born, Atopus. Hercules, the son, is killed by the devil, Typhon, and so is Osiris, who is the father and brother of Horus, and at the same time is identical with him, and we must not forget that the magna was called the bone of Horus and I am the bone of Typhon. He is called Hercules Invictus, only when he descends to Hades, the subterranean garden, and plucking the golden apples from the tree of life, slays the dragon. The rough titanic power, the lining of every sun god, opposes its force of blind matter to the divine magnetic spirit, which tries to harmonize everything in nature. All the sun gods, with their symbol, 
the visible sun, are the creators of physical nature only. The spiritual is the work of the highest God the concealed, the central, spiritual sun, and of his demiurge the divine mind of Plato, and the divine wisdom of Hermes Trismegistus the wisdom of Hughes from Ulam or Kronos. After the distribution of pure fire, in the Samothracian mysteries, a new life began. This was the new birth, that is alluded to by Jesus, in his nocturnal conversation with Nicodemus. Initiated into the most blessed of all mysteries, being ourselves pure, we become just and holy with wisdom. He breathed on them and saith unto them, Take the holy pneuma. And this simple act of willpower was sufficient to impart vaticination in its nobler and most perfect form if both the initiator and the initiated were worthy of it. To deride this gift, even in its present aspect, as the corrupt offspring and lingering remains of an ignorant age of superstition, and hastily to condemn it as unworthy of sober investigation, would be as unphilosophical as it is wrong, remarks the Reverend J. B. Gross. To remove the veil which hides our vision from the future, has been attempted in all ages of the world, and therefore the propensity to pry into the lap of time, contemplated as one of the faculties of human mind, comes recommended to us under the sanction of God. Zwinglius, the Swiss reformer, attested the comprehensiveness of his faith in the providence of the Supreme Being, and the cosmopolitan doctrine that the Holy Ghost was not excluded from the more worthy portion of the heathen world. Admitting its truth, we cannot. p. 133. Easily conceive a valid reason why a heathen, thus favored, should not be capable of true prophecy. Now, what is this mystic, primordial substance? In the book of Genesis, at the beginning of the first chapter, it is termed the face of the waters, said to have been incubated by the Spirit of God. Job mentions, in chap. 26, 5, that dead things are formed from under the waters, and inhabitants thereof. In the original text, instead of dead things, it is written dead refine, giants, or mighty primitive men, from whom evolution may one day trace our present race. In the Egyptian mythology, Kenef the eternal unrevealed God is represented by a snake emblem of eternity encircling a water urn, with his head hovering over the waters, which it incubates with his breath. In this case the serpent is the Agathodamon, the good spirit, in its opposite aspect it is the Cacodymon the bad one. In the Scandinavian Eddas, the honey do the food of the gods and of the creative, busy Idrisil bees falls during the hours of night, when the atmosphere is impregnated with humidity, and in the northern mythologies, as the passive principle of creation, it typifies the creation of the universe out of water, the stew is the astral light in one of its combinations and possesses creative as well as destructive properties. In the Chaldean legend of Barassus, Onus or Dagon, the man-fish, instructing the people, shows the infinite world created out of water and all beings originating from this prima materia. Moses teaches that only earth and water can bring a living soul, and we read in the scriptures that herbs cannot grow until the eternal caused it to reign upon earth. In the Mexican Popol Vuh man is created out of mud or clay, tear glaze, taken from under the water. Brahma creates Lomas, the great Muni, or first man, seated on his lotus, only after having called into being, spirits, who thus enjoyed among mortals a priority of existence, and he creates him out of water, air, and earth. Alchemists claim that primordial or pre-Adamic earth when reduced to its first substance is in its second stage of transformation like clear water, the first being the alkahes proper. This primordial substance is said to contain within itself the essence of all that goes to make up man, it has not only all the elements of his physical being, but even the breath of life itself in a latent state, ready to be awakened. This it derives from the incubation of the Spirit of God upon the face of the water's chaos, in fact, this substance is chaos itself. From this it was that Paracelsus claimed to be able to make his homunculi, and p. 134. This is why Thales, the great natural philosopher, maintained that water was the principle of all things in nature. What is the primordial chaos but ether? The modern ether, not such as is recognized by our scientists, but such as it was known to the ancient philosophers, long before the time of Moses, ether, with all its mysterious and occult properties, containing in itself the germs of universal creation, ether, the celestial virgin, the spiritual mother of every existing form and being, from whose bosom as soon as incubated by the divine spirit, are called into existence matter and life, force and action. Electricity, magnetism, heat, light, and chemical action are so little understood even now that fresh facts are constantly widening the range of our knowledge. Who knows where ends the power of this protean giant ether, 
or whence its mysterious origin? Who, we mean, that denies the spirit that works in it and evolves out of it all visible forms? It is an easy task to show that the cosmogonical legends all over the world are based on a knowledge by the ancients of those sciences which have allied themselves in our days to support the doctrine of evolution, and that further research may demonstrate that they were far better acquainted with the fact of evolution itself, embracing both its physical and spiritual aspects, than we are now. With the old philosophers, evolution was a universal theorem, a doctrine embracing the whole, and an established principle, while our modern evolutionists are enabled to present us merely with speculative theoretics, with particular, if not wholly negative theorems. It is idle for the representatives of our modern wisdom to close the debate and pretend that the question is settled, merely because the obscure phraseology of the mosaic account clashes with the definite exegesis of exact science. One fact at least is proved, there is not a cosmogonical fragment, to whatever nation it may belong but proves by this universal allegory of water and the spirit brooding over it, that no more than our modern physicists did any of them hold the universe to have sprung into existence out of nothing, for all their legends began with that period when nascent vapors in Sumerian darkness lay brooding over a fluid mass ready to start on its journey of activity at the first flutter of the breath of him, who is the unrevealed one. Him they felt, if they saw him not. Their spiritual intuitions were not so darkened by the subtle sophistry of the forecoming ages as ours are now. If they talked less of the Silurian age slowly developing into the mammalian, and if the Cenozoic time was only recorded by various allegories of the primitive Monta Adam of our race it is but a negative proof after all that their wise men and leaders did not know of these successive periods as well as we do now. p. 135. In the days of Democritus and Aristotle, the cycle had already begun to enter on its downward path of progress. And if these two philosophers could discuss so well the atomic theory and trace the atom to its material or physical point, their ancestors may have gone further still and followed its genesis far beyond that limit where Mr. Tyndall and others seem rooted to the spot, not daring to cross the line of the incomprehensible. The lost arts are sufficient proof that if even their achievements in physiography are now doubted, because of the unsatisfactory writings of their physicists and naturalists, on the other hand their practical knowledge in phytochemistry and mineralogy far exceeded our own. Furthermore, they might have been perfectly acquainted with the physical history of our globe without publishing their knowledge to the ignorant masses in those ages of religious mysteries. Therefore, it is not only from the mosaic books that we mean to adduce proof for our further arguments. The ancient Jews got all their knowledge religious as well as profane from the nations with which we see them mixed up from the earliest periods. Even the oldest of all sciences, their Kabbalistic secret doctrine, may be traced in each detail to its primeval source. Upper India, or Turkestan, far before the time of a distinct separation between the Aryan and Semitic nations. The King Solomon so celebrated by posterity, as Josephus the historian says, for his magical skill, got his secret learning from India through Hiram, the king of Ophir, and perhaps Sheba. His ring, commonly known as Solomon's seal, so celebrated for the potency of its sway over the various kinds of genii and demons, and all the popular legends, is equally of Hindu origin. Writing on the pretentious and abominable scale of the devil worshippers of Travancore, the Reverend Samuel Matir, of the London Missionary Society, claims at the same time to be in possession of a very old manuscript volume of magical incantations and spells in the Malayalam language, giving directions for effecting a great variety of purposes. Of course he adds, that many of these are fearful in their malignity and obscenity, and gives in his work the facsimile of some amulets bearing the magical figures and designs on them. We find among them one with the following legend, to remove trembling. p. 136. Rising from demoniacal possession write this figure on a plant that has milky juice, and drive a nail through it, the trembling will cease. The figure is the identical Solomon's seal, or double triangle of the Kabbalists. Did the Hindu get it from the Jewish Kabbalist, or the latter from India, by inheritance from their great king Kabbalist, the wise Solomon? but we will leave this trifling dispute to continue the more interesting question of the astral light, and its unknown properties. Admitting, then, that this mythical agent is ether, we will proceed to see what and how much of it is known to science. With respect to the various effects of the different solar rays, Robert Hunt, F. R. S. remarks, in his researches on light and its chemical relations, that those rays which give the most light the yellow and the orange rays will not produce change of color in the chloride of silver, while those rays which have the least illuminating power the blue and violet produce the greatest change, 
in an exceedingly short time. The P. 137. Yellow glasses obstruct scarcely any light, the blue glasses may be so dark as to admit of the permeation of a very small quantity. And still we see that under the blue ray both vegetable and animal life manifests an inordinate development, while under the yellow ray it is proportionately arrested. How is it possible to account for this satisfactorily upon any other hypothesis than that both animal and vegetable life are differently modified electromagnetic phenomena, as yet unknown in their fundamental principles? Mr. Hunt finds that the undulatory theory does not account for the results of his experiments. Sir David Brewster, in his treatise on optics, showing that the colors of vegetable life arise, from a specific attraction which the particles of these bodies exercise over the differently colored rays of light, and that it is by the light of the sun that the colored juices of plants are elaborated, that the colors of bodies are changed, etc., remarks that it is not easy to allow that such effects can be produced by the mere vibration of an ethereal medium. And he is forced, he says, by this class of facts, to reason as if light was material. Professor Josiah P. Cook, of Harvard University, says that he cannot agree with those who regard the wave theory of light as an established principle of science. Herschel's doctrine, that the intensity of light, and effect of each undulation, is inversely as the square of the distance from the luminous body, if correct, damages a good deal if it does not kill the undulatory theory. That he is right, was proved repeatedly by experiments with photometers, and, though it begins to be much doubted, the undulatory theory is still alive. As General Pleasanton, of Philadelphia, has undertaken to combat this anti-Pythagorean hypothesis, and has devoted to it a whole volume, we cannot do any better than refer the reader to his recent work on the Blu-ray, etc. We leave the theory of Thomas Young, who, according to Tyndall, placed on an immovable basis the undulatory theory of light, to hold its own if it can, with the Philadelphia experimenter. Eliphas Levi, the modern magician, describes the astral light in the following sentence, we have said that to acquire magical power, two things are necessary, to disengage the will from all servitude, and to exercise it in control. The sovereign will is represented in our symbols by the woman who crushes the serpent's head, and by the resplendent angel who represses the dragon, and holds him under his foot and spear, the great magical agent, the dual current of light, the living and astral fire of the earth, has been represented in the ancient theognies by the serpent with the head. P. 138 of a bull, a ram, or a dog. It is the double serpent of the Caduceus, it is the old serpent of the Genesis, but it is also the brazen serpent of Moses entwined around the Tau, that is to say, the generative linga. It is also the goat of the witch Sabbath, and the baphomet of the Templars, it is the hyle of the Gnostics, it is the double tail of serpent which forms the legs of the solar cock of the Abraxas, finally, it is the devil of Emma de Merville but in very fact it is the blind force which souls have to conquer to liberate themselves from the bonds of the earth, for if their will does not free them from this fatal attraction, they will be absorbed in the current by the force which has produced them, and will return to the central and eternal fire. This last cabalistic figure of speech, notwithstanding its strange phraseology, is precisely the one used by Jesus, and in his mind it could have had no other significance than the one attributed to it by the Gnostics and the Kabbalists. Later the Christian theologians interpreted it differently, and with them it became the doctrine of hell. Literally, though, it simply means what it says the astral light, or the generator and destroyer of all forms. All the magical operations, continues Levi, consist in freeing oneself from the coils of the ancient serpent, then to place the foot on its head, and lead it according to the operator's will. I will give unto thee, says the serpent, in the gospel myth, all the kingdoms of the earth, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The initiate should reply to him, I will not fall down, but thou shalt crouch at my feet, thou wilt give me nothing, but I will make use of thee and take whatever I wish. For I am thy Lord and Master. This is the real meaning of the ambiguous response made by Jesus to the tempter. Thus, the devil is not an entity. It is an errant force, as the name signifies. An otic or magnetic current formed by a chain, a circle, of pernicious wills must create this evil spirit which the gospel calls legion, and which forces into the sea a herd of swine and other evangelical allegory showing how base natures can be driven headlong by the blind forces set in motion by error and sin. In his extensive work on the mystical manifestations of human nature, the German naturalist and philosopher, Maximilian Purdy, has devoted a whole chapter to the modern forms of magic. The manifestations of magical life, he says in his preface, 
partially repose on quite another order of things in the nature in which we are acquainted with time, space, and causality. These manifestations can be experimented with but little, they cannot be called out at our bidding, but may be observed. p. 139. And carefully followed whenever they occur in our presence, we can only group them by analogy under certain divisions, and deduce from them general principles and laws. Thus, for Professor Purdy, who evidently belongs to the school of Schopenhauer, the possibility and naturalness of the phenomena which took place in the presence of Kavi Nasami, the Fakir, and are described by Louis Jacolio, the Orientalist, are fully demonstrated on that principle. The Fakir was a man who, through the entire subjugation of the matter of his corporeal system has attained to that state of purification at which the spirit becomes nearly free from its prison, and can produce wonders. His will, nay, a simple desire of his has become creative force, and he can command the elements and powers of nature. His body is no more an impediment to him, hence he can converse spirit to spirit, breath to breath. Under his extended palms, a seed, unknown to him, for Jacolio has chosen it at random among a variety of seeds, from a bag, and planted it himself, after marking it, in a flower pot, will germinate instantly, and push its way through the soil. Developing in less than two hours' time to a size and height which, perhaps, under ordinary circumstances, would require several days or weeks, it grows miraculously under the very eyes of the perplexed experimenter, and mockingly upsets every accepted formula in botany. Is this a miracle? By no means. It may be one, perhaps, if we take Webster's definition, that a miracle is every event contrary to the established constitution and course of things a deviation from the known laws of nature. But are our naturalists prepared to support the claim that what they have once established on observation is infallible? Or that every law of nature is known to them? In this instance, the miracle is but a little more prominent than the now well-known experiments of General Pleasanton, of Philadelphia. While the vegetation and fruitage of his vines were stimulated to an incredible activity by the artificial violet light, the magnetic fluid emanating from the hands of the fakir affected still more intense and rapid changes in the vital function of the Indian plants. It attracted and concentrated the akasha, or life principle, on the germ. His magnetism, obeying his will. p. 140. Drew up the akasha in a concentrated current through the plant towards his hands and by keeping up an unintermitted flow for the requisite space of time, the life principle of the plant built up cell after cell, layer after layer, with preternatural activity, until the work was done. The life principle is but a blind force obeying a controlling influence. In the ordinary course of nature the plant protoplasm would have concentrated and directed it at a certain established rate. This rate would have been controlled by the prevalent atmospheric conditions, its growth being rapid or slow, and, in stock or head, in proportion to the amount of light, heat, and moisture of the season. But the fakir, coming to the help of nature with his powerful will and spirit purified from the contact with matter, condenses, so to speak, the essence of plant life into its germ, and forces it to maturity ahead of its time. This blind force being totally submissive to his will, obeys it with servility. If he chose to imagine the plant as a monster, it would as surely become such, as ordinarily it would grow in its natural shape, for the concrete image slave to the subjective model outlined in the imagination of the fakir is forced to follow the original in its least detail, as the hand and brush of the painter follow the image which they copy from his mind. The will of the fakir conjurer forms an invisible but yet, to it, perfectly objective matrix, in which the vegetable matter is caused to deposit itself and assume the fixed shape. The will creates, for the will in motion is force, and force produces matter. p. 141. If some person's object to the explanation on the ground that the fakir could by no means create the model in his imagination, since he was kept ignorant by Jacques Leo of the kind of seed he had selected for the experiment, to these we will answer that the spirit of man is like that of his creator omniscient in its essence. While in his natural state the fakir did not, and could not know whether it was a melon seed, or seed of any other plant, once entranced, i.e., bodily dead to all outward appearance the spirit, for which there exists neither distance, material obstacle, nor space of time, experienced no difficulty in perceiving the melon seed, whether as it lay deeply buried in the mud of the flower pot, or reflected in the faithful picture gallery of Jacolio's brain. Our visions, portents, and other psychological phenomena, all of which exist in nature, are corroborative of the above fact. And now, perhaps, we might as well meet at once another impending objection. Indian jugglers, they will tell us, 
do the same, and as well as the fakir, if we can believe newspapers and travelers' narratives. Undoubtedly so, and moreover these strolling jugglers are neither pure in their modes of living nor considered holy by anyone, neither by foreigners nor their own people. They are generally feared and despised by the natives, for they are sorcerers, men practicing the black art. While such a holy man as Kaving Nisami requires with the help of his own divine soul, closely united with the astral spirit, and the help of a few familiar Petrus pure, ethereal beings, who rally around their elect brother in flesh the sorcerer can summon to his help with that class of spirits which we know as the elementals. Like attracts like, and greed for money, and pure purposes, and selfish views, cannot attract any other spirits than those that the Hebrew Kabbalists know as the Klippeth, dwellers of Asiah, the fourth world, and the eastern magicians as the Afrits, or elementary spirits of air, or the devs. This is how an English paper describes the astounding trick of plant growth, as performed by Indian jugglers. An empty flower pot was now placed upon the floor by the juggler, who requested that his comrades might be allowed to bring up some garden mold from the little plot of ground below. Permission being accorded, the man went, and in two minutes returned with a small quantity of fresh earth tied up in a corner of his cheddar, which was deposited in the flower pot and lightly pressed down. Taking from his basket a dry mango stone, and handing it round to the company that they might examine it, and satisfy themselves that it was really what it seemed to be, the juggler scooped out a little earth from the center of the flower pot and placed the stone in the cavity. He then turned the earth lightly over it, and, having poured a little water over the surface, shed the flower pot out. P. 142. A view by means of a sheet thrown over a small triangle. And now, amid a full chorus of voices and rat-tat-tat accompaniment of the tabor, the stone germinated, presently a section of the cloth was drawn aside, and gave to view the tender shoot, characterized by two long leaves of a blackish-brown color. The cloth was readjusted, and the incantation resumed. Not long was it, however, before the cloth was a second time drawn aside, and it was then seen that the two first leaves had given place to several green ones, and that the plant now stood nine or ten inches high. A third time, and the foliage was much thicker, the sapling being about thirteen to fourteen inches in height. A fourth time, and the little miniature tree, now about eighteen inches in height, had ten or twelve mangoes about the size of walnuts hanging about its branches. Finally, after the lapse of three or four minutes, the cloth was altogether removed, and the fruit, having the perfection of size, though not of maturity, was plucked and handed to the spectators, and, on being tasted, was found to be approaching ripeness, being sweetly acid. We may add to this, that we have witnessed the same experiment in India and Tibet, and that more than once we provided the flower pot ourselves, by emptying an old tin box of some Liebig extracts. We filled it with earth with our own hands, and planted in it a small root handed to us by the conjurer, and until the experiment was ended never once removed our eyes from the pot, which was placed in our own room. The result was invariably the same as above described. Does the reader imagine that any prestidigitator could produce the same manifestation under the same conditions? The learned O'Reilly, corresponding member of the Institute of France, gives a number of instances which show the marvelous effects produced by the willpower acting upon the invisible Proteus of the Mesmerists. I have seen, says he, certain persons, who simply by pronouncing certain words, arrest wild bulls and horses at headlong speed, and suspend in its flight the arrow which cleaves the air. Thomas Bartholomew affirms the same. Says Dupitet, when I trace upon the floor with chalk or charcoal this figure, a fire, a light fixes itself on it. Soon it attracts to itself the person who approaches it, it detains and fascinates him, and it is useless for him to try to cross the line. A magic power compels him to stand still. At the end of a few moments he yields, uttering sobs. The cause is not in me, it is in this entirely cabalistic sign, in vain would you employ violence. In a series of remarkable experiments made by Regazzoni in the p. 143. Presence of certain well-known French physicians, at Paris, on the 18th of May, 1856, they assembled on one night together, and Regazzoni, with his finger, traced an imaginary cabalistic line upon the floor, over which he made a few rapid passes. It was agreed that the mesmeric subjects, selected by the investigators in the committee for the experiments, and all strangers to him, should be brought blindfold into the room, and caused to walk toward the line, without a word being spoken to indicate what was expected of them. The subjects moved along unsuspiciously till they came to the invisible barrier, when, 
as it is described, their feet, as if they had been suddenly seized and riveted, adhere to the ground, while their bodies, carried forward by the rapid impulse of the motion, fall and strike the floor. The sudden rigidity of their limbs was like that of a frozen corpse, and their heels were rooted with mathematical precision upon the fatal line. In another experiment it was agreed that upon one of the physicians giving a certain signal by a glance of the eye, the blindfolded girl should be made to fall on the ground, as if struck by lightning, by the magnetic fluid emitted by Regazzoni's will. She was placed at a distance from the magnetizer, the signal was given, and instantly the subject was felled to the earth, without a word being spoken or a gesture made. Involuntarily one of the spectators stretched out his hand as if to catch her, but Regazzoni, in a voice of thunder, exclaimed, Do not touch her. Let her fall, a magnetized subject is never heard by falling. De Musso's, who tells the story, says that marble is not more rigid than was her body, her head did not touch the ground, one of her arms remained stretched in the air, one of her legs was raised and the other horizontal. She remained in this unnatural posture an indefinite time. Less rigid is a statue of bronze. All the effects witnessed in the experiments of public lectures upon mesmerism were produced by Regazzoni in perfection, and without one spoken word to indicate what the subject was to do. He even by his silent will produce the most surprising effects upon the physical systems of persons totally unknown to him. Directions whispered by the committee in Regazzoni's ear were immediately obeyed by the subjects, whose ears were stuffed with cotton, and whose eyes were bandaged. Nay, in some cases it was not even necessary for them to express to the magnetizer what they desired, for their own mental requests were complied with with perfect fidelity. Experiments of a similar character were made by Regazzoni in England at a distance of three hundred paces from the subject brought to. p. 144. Him. The genitura, or evil eye, is nothing but the direction of this invisible fluid, charged with malicious will and hatred, from one person to another, and sent out with the intention of harming him. It may equally be employed for a good or evil purpose. In the former case it is magic, in the latter, sorcery. What is the will? Can exact science tell? What is the nature of that intelligent, intangible, and powerful something which reigns supreme over all inert matter? The great universal idea willed, and the cosmos sprang into existence. I will, and my limbs obey. I will, and, my thought traversing space, which does not exist for it, envelops the body of another individual who is not a part of myself, penetrates through his pores, and, superseding his own faculties, if they are weaker, forces him to a predetermined action. It acts like the fluid of a galvanic battery on the limbs of a corpse. The mysterious effects of attraction and repulsion are the unconscious agents of that will, fascination, such as we see exercised by some animals, by serpents over birds, for instance, is a conscious action of it, and the result of thought. Sealing wax, glass, and amber, when rubbed, i.e., when the latent heat which exists in every substance is awakened, attract light bodies, they exercise unconsciously, will, for inorganic as well as organic matter possesses a particle of the divine essence in itself, however infinitesimally small it may be. And how could it be otherwise? Notwithstanding that in the progress of its evolution it may from beginning to end have passed through millions of various forms, it must ever retain its germ point of that pre-existent matter, which is the first manifestation and emanation of the deity itself. What is then this inexplicable power of attraction but an atomical portion of that essence that scientists and Kabbalists equally recognize as the principle of life the Akasha? Granted that the attraction exercised by such bodies may be blind, but as we ascend higher the scale of the organic beings in nature, we find this principle of life developing attributes and faculties which become more determined and marked with every rung of the endless ladder. Man, the most perfect of organized beings on earth, in whom matter and spirit I dot e or the most developed and powerful, is alone allowed to give a conscious impulse to the principle which emanates from him, and only he can impart to the magnetic fluid opposite and various impulses without limit as to the direction. He wills, says Dupitet, and organized matter obeys. It has no poles. Dr. Briere de Blomon, in his volume on hallucinations, reviews a wonderful variety of visions, apparitions, and ecstasies, generally termed hallucinations. We cannot deny, he says, that in certain diseases we see develop the great sure excitation of sensibility, which lends to the p. 145. Since is a prodigious acuteness of perception. Thus, some individuals will perceive at considerable distances, 
Others will announce the approach of persons who are really on their way, although those present can neither hear nor see them coming. A lucid patient, lying in his bed, announces the arrival of persons to see whom he must possess transmural vision, and this faculty is termed by Briere de Blomont hallucination. In our ignorance, we have hitherto innocently supposed that in order to be rightly termed a hallucination, a vision must be subjective. It must have an existence only in the delirious brain of the patient. But if the latter announces the visit of a person, miles away, and this person arrives at the very moment predicted by the seer, then his vision was no more subjective, but on the contrary perfectly objective, for he saw that person in the act of coming. And how could the patient see, through solid bodies in space, an object shut out from the reach of our mortal sight, if he had not exercised his spiritual eyes on that occasion? Coincidence? Kakanis speaks of certain nervous disorders in which the patients easily distinguish with the naked eye infusoria and other microscopical beings which others could only perceive through powerful lenses. I have met subjects, he says, who saw in Sumerian darkness as well as in a lighted room, others who followed persons, tracing them out like dogs, and recognizing by the smell objects belonging to such persons or even such as had been only touched by them, with a sagacity which was hitherto observed only in animals. Exactly, because reason, which, as Kakana says, develops only at the expense and loss of natural instinct, is a Chinese wall slowly rising on the soil of sophistry, and which finally shuts out man's spiritual perceptions of which the instinct is one of the most important examples. Arrived at certain stages of physical prostration, when mind and the reasoning faculties seem paralyzed through weakness and bodily exhaustion, instinct the spiritual unity of the five senses sees, hears, feels, tastes, and smells, unimpaired by either time or space. What do we know of the exact limits of mental action? How can a physician take upon himself to distinguish the imaginary from the real senses in a man who may be living a spiritual life, and a body so exhausted of its usual vitality that it actually is unable to prevent the soul from oozing out from its prison? The divine light through which, unimpeded by matter, the soul perceives. p. 146. Things past, present, and to come, as though their rays were focused in a mirror, the death-dealing bull projected in an instant of fierce anger or at the climax of long-festering hate, the blessing wafted from a grateful or benevolent heart, and the curse hurled at an object offender or victim all have to pass through that universal agent, which under one impulse is the breath of God, and under another the venom of the devil. It was discovered, by Baron Reichenbach and Kaldod, whether intentionally or otherwise we cannot say, but it is singular that a name should have been chosen which is mentioned in the most ancient books of the Kabbalah. Our readers will certainly inquire what then is this invisible all? How is it that our scientific methods, however perfected, have never discovered any of the magical properties contained in it? To this we can answer, that it is no reason because modern scientists are ignorant of them that it should not possess all the properties with which the ancient philosophers endowed it. Science rejects many a thing today which she may find herself forced to accept tomorrow. A little less than a century ago the Academy denied Franklin's electricity, and, at the present day, we can hardly find a house without a conductor on its roof. Shooting at the barn door, the Academy missed the barn itself. Modern scientists, by their willful skepticism and learned ignorance, do this very frequently. Ameft, the supreme, first principle, produced an egg, by brooding over which, and permeating the substance of it with its own vivifying essence, the germ contained within was developed, and the, the active creative principle proceeded from it, and began his work. From the boundless expanse of cosmic matter, which had formed itself under his breath, or will, this cosmic matter astral light, ether, fire mist, principle of life it matters not how we may call it, this creative principle, or, as our modern philosophy terms it, law of evolution, by setting in motion the potencies latent in it, formed suns and stars, and satellites, controlled their emplacement by the immutable law of harmony, and peopled them with every form and quality of life. In the ancient eastern mythologies, the cosmogonic myth states that there was but water, the father, and the prolific slime, the mother, Illus or Hyle, from which crept forth the mundane snake matter. It was the god Phanes, the revealed one, the word, or logos. How willingly this myth was accepted, even by the Christians who compiled the New Testament, may be easily inferred from the following fact. Phanes, the revealed god, is represented in the snake symbol as a protagonos, a being furnished with the heads of a man, a hawk or an eagle, a bull taurus, and a lion, with wings on both sides. 
the heads relate to the zodiac, and typify the four seasons of the year, for the mundane serpent is the mundane year, while the ser. p. 147. Pen itself is the symbol of Kenef, the hidden, or unrevealed deity God the Father. Time is winged, therefore the serpent is represented with wings. If we remember that each of the four evangelists is represented as having near him one of the described animals grouped together in Solomon's triangle in the pentacle of Ezekiel, and to be found in the four cherubs or sphinxes of the sacred arch we will perhaps understand the secret meaning, as well as the reason why the early Christians adopted this symbol, and how it is that the present Roman Catholics and the Greeks of the Oriental Church still represent these animals in the pictures of their evangelists which sometimes accompany the four Gospels. We will also understand why Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyons, had so insisted upon the necessity of the fourth Gospel, giving as a reason that there could not be less than four of them, as there were four zones in the world, and four principal winds coming from the four cardinal points, etc. According to one of the Egyptian myths, the phantom form of the Isle of Chemis, Chemi, ancient Egypt, which floats on the ethereal waves of the Empyrean sphere, was called into being by Horus Apollo, the sun god, who caused it to evolve out of the mundane egg. In the cosmogonical poem of Voluspa, the Song of the Prophetess, which contains the Scandinavian legends of the very dawn of ages, the phantom germ of the universe is represented as lying in the Ginnungagap or the Cup of Illusion, a boundless and void abyss. In this world's matrix, formerly a region of night and desolation, Nebelheim, the mist place, dropped the ray of cold light, ether, which overflowed this cup and froze in it. Then the invisible blue scorching wind which dissolved the frozen waters and cleared the mist. These waters, called the streams of Olivagar, distilled and vivifying drops which, falling down, created the earth and the giant Immer, who only had the semblance of man, male principle. With him was created the cow, Ad Humla, female principle, from whose udder flowed four streams of milk, which diffused themselves throughout space, the astral light in its purest emanation. The cow Ad Humla produces a superior being, called Burr, handsome and powerful, by licking the stones that were covered with mineral salt. Now, if we take into consideration that this mineral was universally p. 148. Regarded by ancient philosophers as one of the chief formative principles in organic creation, by the alchemists as the universal menstruum, which, they said, was to be wrought from water, and by everyone else, even as it is regarded now by science as well as in the popular ideas, to be an indispensable ingredient for man and beast, we may readily comprehend the hidden wisdom of this allegory of the creation of man. Paracelsus calls salt the center of water, wherein metals ought to die, etc., and Van Helmont terms the alkahest, summum et felicissimum omnium salium, the most successful of all salts. In the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? And following the parable he adds, Ye are the light of the world, v. 14. This is more than an allegory, these words point to a direct and unequivocal meaning in relation to the spiritual and physical organisms of man and his dual nature, and show, moreover, a knowledge of the secret doctrine, the direct traces of which we find equally in the oldest ancient and current popular traditions, in both the Old and New Testaments, and in the writings of the ancient and medieval mystics and philosophers. But to return to our Edda legend, Immer, the giant, falls asleep, and sweats profusely, this perspiration causes the pit of his left arm to generate out of that place a man and a woman, while his foot produces a son for them. Thus, while the mythic cow gives being to a race of superior spiritual men, the giant Immer begets a race of evil and depraved men, the Rhymthersen, or Frost Giants. Comparing notes with the Hindu Vedas, we find it then, with slight modifications, the same cosmogonic legend in substance and details. Rama, as soon as Bhagavata, the supreme god, endows him with creative powers, produces animated beings, wholly spiritual at first. The Jajotas, inhabitants of the surges, the celestial, region, are unfit to live on earth, therefore Brahma creates the Danes, giants, who become the dwellers of the paddles, the lower regions of space, who are also unfit to inhabit mere clock, the earth. To palliate the evil, the creative power evolves from his mouth the first Braham, who thus becomes the progenitor of our race, from his right arm Brahma creates Raitris, the warrior, and from his left Shatterni, the wife of Raitris. And then their son Bess springs from the right foot of the creator, and his wife Bezani from the left. While in the Scandinavian legend Burr, the son of the cow Aghumla, 
a superior being, marries Bula, a daughter of the depraved race of giants. In the Hindu tradition the first Praham marries Daintari, also a daughter of the race of the giants, and in Genesis we see the sons of God taking for wives the daughters of men, and likewise producing mighty men of old. The p. 149. Whole establishing an unquestionable identity of origin between the Christian-inspired book, and the heathen fables of Scandinavia and Hindustan. The traditions of nearly every other nation, if examined, will yield a like result. What modern cosmogonists could compress within so simple a symbol as the Egyptian serpent in a circle such a world of meaning? Here we have, in this creature, the whole philosophy of the universe, matter vivified by spirit, and the two conjointly evolving out of chaos, force, everything that was to be, to signify that the elements are fast bound in this cosmic matter, which the serpent symbolizes, the Egyptians tied its tail into a knot. There's one more important emblem connected with the sloughing of the serpent's skin, which, so far as we are aware, has never been heretofore noticed by our symbolists. As the reptile upon casting his coat becomes freed from a casing of gross matter, which cramped a body grown too large for it, and resumes its existence with renewed activity, so man, by casting off the gross material body, enters upon the next stage of his existence with enlarged powers and quickened vitality. Inversely, the Chaldean Kabbalists tell us that primeval man, who, contrary to the Darwinian theory was purer, wiser, and far more spiritual, as shown by the myths of the Scandinavian Burr, the Hindu Dejotas, and the Mosaic Sons of God, in short, of a far higher nature than the man of the present Adamic race, became despiritualized or tainted with matter, and then, for the first time, was given the fleshly body, which is typified in Genesis in that profoundly significant verse, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin, and clothe them. Unless the commentators would make of the first cause a celestial tailor, what else can the apparently absurd words mean, but that the spiritual man had reached, through the progress of involution, to that point where matter, predominating over and conquering spirit, had transformed him into the physical man, or the second Adam, of the second chapter of Genesis? This Kabbalistical doctrine is much more elaborated in the book of Jasher. In chapter 7, these garments of skin are taken by Noah into the ark, he having obtained them by inheritance from Methuselah and Enoch who had them from Adam and his wife. Ham steals them from. p. 150. His father Noah, gives them in secret to Cush, who conceals them from his sons and brothers, and passes them to Nimrod. While some Kabbalists, and even archaeologists say that Adam, Enoch, and Noah might, in outward appearance, be different men, but there were really the selfsame divine person. Others explain that between Adam and Noah there intervened several cycles. That is to say, that every one of the antediluvian patriarchs stood as the representative of a race which had its place in a succession of cycles, and each of which races was less spiritual than its predecessor. Thus Noah, though a good man, could not have borne comparison with his ancestor, Enoch, who walked with God and did not die. Hence the allegorical interpretation which makes Noah have this coat of skin by inheritance from the second Adam and Enoch, but not wear it himself, for if otherwise, him could not have stolen it. But Noah and his children bridged the flood, and while the former belonged to the old and still spiritual antediluvian generation, insomuch as he was selected from all mankind for his purity, his children were post-diluvian. The coat of skin worn by Cushion's secret, I.E., when his spiritual nature began to be tainted by the material is placed on Nimrod, the most powerful and strongest of physical men on the side of the flood the last remnant of the antediluvian giants. In the Scandinavian legend, Nimr, the giant, is slain by the sons of Burr, and the streams of blood flowing from his wounds were so copious that the flood drowned the whole race of ice and frost giants, and Bergomir alone of that race was saved, with his wife, by taking refuge in a bark, which fact permitted him to transmit a new branch of giants from the old stock. But all the sons of Burr remained untouched by the flood. When the symbolism of this diluvian legend is unraveled, one perceives at once the real meaning of the allegory. The giant Amr typifies the primitive root organic matter, the blind cosmical forces, in their chaotic state, before they receive the intelligent impulse of the divine spirit which set them into a regular motion dependent on immovable laws. The progeny of Burr are the sons of God, or the minor gods mentioned by Plato and the Timaeus, and who were entrusted, as he expresses it, with the creation of men, for we see them taking the mangled remains of Emmer to the Ginnengarup, the chaotic abyss, and employing them for the creation of our world. His blood goes to form oceans and rivers his bones, 
the mountains, his teeth, the rocks and cliffs. P. 151. His hair, the trees, etc., while his skull forms the heavenly vault, supported by four pillars representing the four cardinal points. From the eyebrows of Immer was created the future abode of man Midgard. This abode, the earth, says the Edda, in order to be correctly described in all its minute particulars, must be conceived as round as a ring, or as a disc, floating in the midst of the celestial ocean, ether. It is encircled by Jormungan, the gigantic Medgard or earth serpent, holding its tail in its mouth. This is the mundane snake, matter and spirit, combined product and emanation of Immer, the gross rudimental matter, and of the spirit of the sons of God, who fashioned and created all forms. This emanation is the astral light of the Kabbalists, and the as yet problematical, and hardly known, ether, or the hypothetical agent of great elasticity of our physicists. How sure the ancients were of this doctrine of man's trinitarian nature may be inferred from the same Scandinavian legend of the creation of mankind. According to the Voluspa, Odin, Har, and Lodger, who are the progenitors of our race, found in one of their walks on the ocean beach, two sticks floating on the waves, powerless and without destiny. Odin breathed in them the breath of life, Har endowed them with soul and motion, and Lodger with beauty, speech, sight, and hearing. The man they called us the Ash, and the woman Embla the Alder. These first men are placed in Midgard, Midgarden, or Eden, and thus inherit, from their creators, matter or inorganic life, mind, or soul, and pure spirit, the first corresponding to that part of their organism which sprung from the remains of Immer, the giant matter, the second from the Enelig, Sir, or gods, the descendants of Burr, and the third from the Vanar, or the representative of pure spirit. Another version of the Edda makes our visible universe spring from beneath the luxuriant branches of the mundane tree the Yggdrasil, the tree with the three roots. Under the first root runs the fountain of life, Urgar, under the second is the famous well of Mimer, in which lie deeply buried wit and wisdom. Odin, the alpha deer, asks for a draught of this water, he gets it but finds himself obliged to pledge one of his eyes for it, the eye being in this case the symbol of the deity revealing itself in the wisdom of its own creation, for Odin leaves it at the bottom of the deep well. The care of the mundane tree is entrusted to three maidens, the Norns are Parsi, Order, Verdindi, and Skuld are the present, the past, and the future. Every morning, while fixing the term. p. 152. Of human life, they draw water from the Urdar fountain and sprinkle with it the roots of the mundane tree, that it may live. The exhalations of the ash, Idrisil, condense, and falling down upon our earth call into existence and change of form every portion of the inanimate matter. This tree is the symbol of the universal life, organic as well as inorganic. Its emanations represent the spirit which vivifies every form of creation, and of its three roots, one extends to heaven, the second to the dwelling of the magician's giants, inhabitants of the lofty mountains and at the third under which is the spring of Virgelmeyer, now is the monster Nithok, who constantly leads mankind into evil. The Tibetans have also their mundane tree, and the legend is of an untold antiquity. With them it is called Zampun. The first of its three roots also extends to heaven, to the top of the highest mountains, the second passes down to the lower region, the third remains midway, and reaches the east. The mundane tree of the Hindus is the Aswatha. Its branches are the components of the visible world, and its leaves the mantras of the Vedas, symbols of the universe and its intellectual or moral character. Who can study carefully the ancient religious and cosmogonic myths without perceiving that this striking similitude of conceptions, and their exoteric form and esoteric spirit, is the result of no mere coincidence, but manifests a concurrent design? It shows that already in those ages which are shut out from our sight by the impenetrable mist of tradition, human religious thought developed in uniform sympathy in every portion of the globe. Christians call this adoration of nature in her most concealed verities pantheism. But if the latter, which worships and reveals to us God in space in his only possible objective form that a visible nature perpetually reminds humanity of him who created it, and a religion of theological dogmatism only serves to conceal him the more from our sight, which is the better adapted to the needs of mankind? Modern science insists upon the doctrine of evolution, so do human reason and the secret doctrine and the idea is corroborated by the ancient legends and myths, and even by the Bible itself when it is read between the lines. We see a flower slowly developing from a bud, and the bud from its seed. But once the latter, with all its predetermined program of physical transformation, and its invisible, 
Therefore, spiritual forces which gradually develop its form, color, and odor, the word evolution speaks for itself. The germ of the present human race must have pre-existed in the parent of this race, as the seed, in which lies hidden. p. 153. The flower of next summer, was developed in the capsule of its parent flower. The parent may be but slightly different, but it still differs from its future progeny. The antediluvian ancestors of the present elephant and lizard were, perhaps, the mammoth and the plesiosaurus, why should not the progenitors of our human race have been the giants of the Vedas, the Voluspa, and the Book of Genesis? While it is positively absurd to believe the transformation of species to have taken place according to some of the more materialistic views of the evolutionists, it is but natural to think that each genus, beginning with the mollusk and ending with monkey man, has modified from its own primordial and distinctive form. Supposing that we concede that animals have descended from at most only four or five progenitors, and that even a rigor all the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth have descended from some one primordial form, still no one but a stone-blind materialist, one utterly devoid of intuitiveness, can seriously expect to see in the distant future, psychology based on a new foundation, that of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. Physical man, as a product of evolution, may be left in the hands of the man of exact science. None but he can throw light upon the physical origin of the race. But, we must positively deny the materialist the same privilege as to the question of man's psychical and spiritual evolution, for he and his highest faculties cannot be proved on any conclusive evidence to be as much products of evolution as the humblest plant or the lowest worm. Having said so much, we will now proceed to show the evolution hypothesis of the old Brahmins, as embodied by them in the allegory of the mundane tree. The Hindus represent their mythical tree, which they call Aswatha, in a way which differs from that of the Scandinavians. It is described by them as growing in a reverse position, the branches extending downward and the roots upward, the former typifying the external world of sense, i.e., the visible cosmical universe, and the latter the invisible world of spirit, because the roots have their genesis in the heavenly regions where, from the world's creation, humanity has placed its invisible deity. The creative energy having originated in the primordial point, the religious symbols of every people are so many illustrations of this metaphysical hypothesis expounded by Pythagoras, Plato, and other. p. 154. Philosophers. These Chaldeans, says Philo, were of opinion that the cosmos, among the things that exist, is a single point, either being itself God, the Eos, or that in it is God, comprehending the soul of all the things. The Egyptian pyramid also symbolically represents this idea of the mundane tree. Its apex is the mystic link between heaven and earth, and stands for the root, while the base represents the spreading branches, extending to the four cardinal points of the universe of matter. It conveys the idea that all things had their origin and spirit evolution having originally begun from above and proceeded downward, instead of the reverse, as taught in the Darwinian theory. In other words, there has been a gradual materialization of forms until a fixed ultimate of debasement is reached. This point is that at which the doctrine of modern evolution enters into the arena of speculative hypothesis. Arrived at this period we will find it easier to understand Heckel's anthropogeny, which traces the pedigree of man from its protoplasmic root, sodden in the mud of seas which existed before the oldest of the fossiliferous rocks were deposited, according to Professor Huxley's exposition. We may believe man evolved by gradual modification of a mammal of ape-like organization still easier when we remember that, though in a more condensed and less elegant, but still as comprehensible, phraseology, the same theory was said by Barassus to have been taught many thousands of years before his time by the manfish Oannes or Dagon, the semi-demon of Babylonia. We may add, as a fact of interest, that this ancient theory of evolution is not only embalmed in allegory and legend, but also depicted upon the walls of certain temples in India, and, in a fragmentary form, has been found in those of Egypt and on the slabs of Nimrod and Nineveh, excavated by Layard. But what lies back of the Darwinian line of descent? So far as he is concerned nothing but unverifiable hypotheses. For, as he puts it, he views all beings as the lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long before the first bed of the Silurian system was deposited. He does not attempt to show us who these few beings were. But it answers our purpose quite as well, for in the admission of their existence at all, resort to the ancients for corroboration and elaboration of the idea receives the stamp of scientific approbation. With all the changes that our globe has passed through as regards temperature, 
climate, soil, and if we may be pardoned, in view of recent developments its electromagnetic condition, he would be bold indeed who dare say that anything. p. 155. And present science contradicts the ancient hypothesis of anti-Solarian man. The flint axes first found by Boucher de Perthes, in the valley of the Somme, prove that men must have existed at a period so remote as to be beyond calculation. If we believe Bushna, man must have lived even during and before the glacial epoch, a subdivision of the quaternary or diluvial period probably extending very far back in it. But who can tell what the next discovery has in store for us? Now, if we have indisputable proof that man has existed so long as this, there must have been wonderful modifications of his physical system, corresponding with the changes of climate and atmosphere. Does not this seem to show by analogy that, tracing backward, there may have been other modifications, which fitted the most remote progenitors of the frost giants to live even contemporaneously with the Devonian fishes or the Silurian mollusks? True, they left no flint hatchets behind them, nor any bones or cave deposits, but, if the ancients are correct, the races at that time were composed not only of giants, or mighty men of renown, but also of sons of God. If those who believe in the evolution of spirit as firmly as the materialists believe in that of matter are charged with teaching unverifiable hypotheses, how readily can they retort upon their accusers by saying that, by their own confession, their physical evolution is still an unverified, if not actually an unverifiable hypothesis. The former have at least the inferential proof of legendary myth, the vast antiquity of which is admitted by both philologists and archaeologists, while their antagonists have nothing of a similar nature, unless they help themselves to a portion of the ancient picture writings, and suppress the rest. It is more than fortunate that, while the works of some men of science who have justly won their great reputations will flatly contradict our hypotheses, the researches and labors of others not less eminent seem to fully confirm our views. In the recent work of Mr. Alfred R. Wallace, The Geographical Distribution of Animals, we find the author seriously favoring the idea of some slow process of development of the present species from others which have preceded them his idea extending back over an innumerable series of cycles. And if animals, why not animal man, proceeded still farther back by a thoroughly spiritual one a son of God? And now, we may once more return to the symbolology of the olden times, and their physico-religious myths. Before we close this work, we hope to demonstrate more or less successfully how closely the conceptions of the latter were allied with many of the achievements of modern science. p. 156 in physics and natural philosophy. Under the emblematical devices and peculiar phraseology of the priesthood of old lay latent hints of sciences as yet undiscovered during the present cycle. Well acquainted as may be a scholar with the hieratic writing and hieroglyphical system of the Egyptians, he must first of all learn to sift their records. He has to assure himself, compasses and rule in hand, that the picture writing he is examining fits, to align, certain fixed geometrical figures which are the hidden keys to such records before he ventures on an interpretation. But there are myths which speak for themselves. In this class we may include the double sex first creators, of every cosmogony. The Greek Susan, Ether, Anthonia, the chaotic Earth, and Mades, the water, his wives, Osiris and Isis Latona the former god representing also Ether the first emanation of the supreme deity, Amun, the primeval source of light, the goddess Earth and water again, Mithras, the rock-born god, the symbol of the male mundane fire, or the personified primordial light, and Mithra, the fire goddess, at once his mother and his wife, the pure element of fire, the active, or male principle, regarded as light and heat, in conjunction with earth and water, or matter, female or passive elements of cosmical generation. Mithras is the son of Borge, the Persian mundane mountain from which he flashes out as a radiant ray of light. Rama, the fire god, and his prolific consort, and the Hindu Angi, the refulgent deity, from whose body issue a thousand streams of glory and seven tongues of flame, and in whose honor the Sagniku Brahmins preserve to this day a perpetual fire, Shiva, personated by the mundane mountain of the Hindu Zamaru, Himalaya. This terrific fire god, who is said in the legend to have descended from heaven, like the Jewish Jehovah, and a pillar of fire, and a dozen of other archaic, double-sexed deities, all loudly proclaim their hidden meaning. And what can these dual myths mean but the physico-chemical principle of primordial creation? The first revelation of the supreme cause in its triple manifestation of spirit, force, and matter, the divine correlation, at its starting point of evolution, allegorized as the marriage of fire and water, 
products of electrifying spirit, union of the male active principle with the female passive element, which become the parents of their Tellurian child, cosmic matter, the prima materia, whose spirit is ether, the astral light. Thus all the world mountains and mundane eggs, the mundane trees, and the mundane snakes and pillars, may be shown to embody scientifically. p. 157. Demonstrated Truths of Natural Philosophy All of these mountains contain, with very trifling variations, the allegorically expressed description of primal cosmogony, the mundane trees, that of subsequent evolution of spirit and matter, the mundane snakes and pillars, symbolical memorials of the various attributes of this double evolution and its endless correlation of cosmic forces. Within the mysterious recesses of the mountain the matrix of the universe the gods, powers, prepare the atomic germs of organic life, and at the same time the life drink, which, when tasted, awakens in man matter the man spirit. The soma, the sacrificial drink of the Hindus, is that sacred beverage. For, at the creation of the prima materia, while the grossest portions of it were used for the physical embryo world, the more divine essence of it pervaded the universe, invisibly permeating and enclosing within its ethereal waves the newly born infant, developing and stimulating its activity as it slowly evolved out of the eternal chaos. From the poetry of abstract conception, these mundane myths gradually passed into the concrete images of cosmic symbols, as archaeology now finds them. The snake, which plays such a prominent part in the imagery of the ancients, was degraded by the absurd interpretation of the serpent of the book of Genesis into a synonym of Satan, the prince of darkness, whereas it is the most ingenious of all the myths and its various symbolisms. For one, as Agatha Damon, it is the emblem of the healing art and of the immortality of man. It encircles the images of most of the sanitary or hygienic gods. The cup of health, and the Egyptian mysteries, was entwined by serpents. As evil can only arise from an extreme in good, the serpent, under some other aspects, became typical of matter, which, the more it recedes from its primal spiritual source, the more it becomes subject of evil. In the oldest Egyptian imagery, as in the cosmogonic allegories of Kenef, the mundane snake, when typifying matter, is usually represented as contained within a circle, he lies straight across its equator, thus indicating that the universe of astral light, out of which the physical world evolved, while bounding the latter, is itself bound by a meft, or the supreme first cause. The producing Ra, and the myriad forms to which he gives life, are shown as creeping out of the mundane egg, because it is the most familiar form of that in which is deposited and developed the germ of every living being. When the serpent represents eternity and immortality, it encircles the world, biting its tail, and thus offering no solution of continuity. It then becomes the astral light. The disciples of the school of Pharisees taught that ether, Zeus or Zen, is the highest empyrean heaven, which encloses the supernal world, and its light, the astral, is the concentrated primordial element. Such is the origin of the serpent, metamorphosed in Christian ages. p. 158. Into Satan. It is the odd the Obi, and the Or of Moses and the Kabbalists. When in its passive state, when it acts on those who are unwittingly drawn within its current, the astral light is the Obi, or Python. Moses was determined to exterminate all those who, sensitive to its influence, allowed themselves to fall under the easy control of the vicious beings which move in the astral waves like fish in the water, beings who surround us, and whom bull will lighten calls in Zinoni the dwellers of the threshold. It becomes the odd, as soon as it is vivified by the conscious efflux of an immortal soul, for then the astral currents are acting under the guidance of either an adept, a pure spirit, or an able mesmerizer, who is pure himself and knows how to direct the blind forces. In such cases even a high planetary spirit, one of the class of beings that have never been embodied, though there are many among these hierarchies who have lived on our earth, descends occasionally to our sphere, and purifying the surrounding atmosphere enables the subject to see and opens it in the springs of true divine prophecy. As to the term or, the word is used to designate certain occult properties of the universal agent. It pertains more directly to the domain of the alchemist, and is of no interest to the general public. The author of the Homomerian system of philosophy, Anaxagoras of Clasomene, firmly believed that the spiritual prototypes of all things, as well as their elements, were to be found in the boundless ether, where they were generated, whence they evolved, and whither they returned from earth. In common with the Hindus who had personified their akasha, sky or ether, and made of it a deific entity, the Greeks and Latins had deified ether. Virgil calls Zeus, pater omnipotens ether, 
Magnus, the great god, Ether. These beings above alluded to are the elemental spirits of the Kabbalists, whom the Christian clergy denounce as devils, the enemies of mankind. p. 159. Already Tertullian, gravely remarks De Musos, in his chapter on the devils, has formally discovered the secret of their cunning. A priceless discovery, that. And now that we have learned so much of the mental labors of the Holy Fathers and their achievements in astral anthropology, need we be surprised at all, if, in the zeal of their spiritual explorations, they have so far neglected their own planet as at times to deny not only its right to motion but even its fericity? And this is what we find in Langhorn, the translator of Plutarch, Dionysius of Halicarnassus, L. 2, is of opinion that Numa built the Temple of Vesta in a round form, to represent the figure of the earth, for by Vesta they meant the earth. Moreover Philolaeus, in common with all other Pythagoreans, held that the element of fire was placed in the center of the universe, and Plutarch, speaking on the subject, remarks of the Pythagoreans that the earth they suppose not to be without motion, nor situated in the center of the world, but to make its revolution round the sphere of fire, being neither one of the most valuable, nor principal parts of the great machine. Plato, too, is reported to have been of the same opinion. It appears, therefore, that the Pythagoreans anticipated Galileo's discovery. The existence of such an invisible universe being once admitted as seems likely to be the fact if the speculations of the authors of the unseen universe are ever accepted by their colleagues many of the phenomena, hitherto mysterious and inexplicable, become plain. It acts on the organism of the magnetized mediums, it penetrates and saturates them through and through, either directed by the powerful will of a mesmerizer, or by unseen beings who achieve the same result. Once that the silent operation is performed, the astral or sidereal fandom of the mesmerized subject quits its paralyzed, earthly casket, and, after having roamed in the boundless space, alights at the threshold of the mysterious born. For it, the gates of the portal which marks the entrance to the silent land, are now but partially ajar, they will fly wide open before the soul of the entranced somnambulist only on that day when, united with its higher immortal essence, it will have quitted forever its mortal frame. Until then, the seer or seeress can look but through a chink. It depends on the acuteness of the clairvoyant spiritual sight to see more or less through it. p. 160. The Trinity in unity is an idea which all the ancient nations held in common. The three dejotas the Hindu Trimurti, the three heads of the Jewish Kabbalah. Three heads are hewn in one another and over one another. The Trinity of the Egyptians and that of the mythological Greeks were like representations of the first triple emanation containing two male and one female principles. It is the union of the male logos, or wisdom, the revealed deity, with the female aura or animal mundi the holy pneuma, which is the sephira of the Kabbalists and the sophia of the refined Gnostics that produced all things visible and invisible. While the true metaphysical interpretation of this universal dogma remained within the sanctuaries, the Greeks, with their poetical instincts, impersonated it in many charming myths. In the Dionysiacs of Nonus, the god Bacchus, among other allegories, is represented as in love with the soft, genial breeze, the holy Numa, under the name of Aura Placida. And now we will leave Godfrey Higgins to speak. When the ignorant fathers were constructing their calendar, they made out of this gentle zephyr two Roman Catholic saints. S.S. Aura and Placida, nay, they even went so far as to transfer the jolly god into St. Bacchus, and actually show his coffin and relics at Rome. The festival of the two blessed saints, Aura and Placida, occurs on the 5th of October, close to the festival of St. Bacchus. How far more poetical, and how much greater the religious spirit to be found in the heathen Norse legends of creation. In the boundless abyss of the mundane pit, the and Golgop, where rage and blind fury and conflict cosmic matter and the primordial forces, suddenly blows the thaw wind. It is the unrevealed God, who sends his beneficent breath from Muspelheim, the sphere of empyreal fire, within whose glowing rays dwells this great being far beyond the limits of the world of matter, and the animus of the unseen, the spirit brooding over the dark, abysmal waters, calls order out of chaos, and once having given the impulse to all creation the first cause retires, and remains forevermore in statu abscondido. There is both religion and science in these Scandinavian songs of heathenism. As an example of the latter, take the conception of Thor, the son of Odin. Whenever this Hercules of the North would grasp the handle of his terrible weapon, the thunderbolt or electric hammer, he is obliged to put on his iron gantlets. He also wears a magical belt. p. 
161. Known as the girdle of strength, which, whenever girded about his person, greatly augments his celestial power. He rides upon a car drawn by two rams with silver bridles, and his awful brows encircled by a wreath of stars. His chariot has a pointed iron pole, and the spark-scattering wheels continually roll over rumbling thunderclouds. He hurls his hammer with resistless force against the rebellious frost giants, whom he dissolves and annihilates. When he repairs to the Erdar Fountain, where the gods meet in conclave to decide the destinies of humanity, he alone goes on foot, the rest of the deities being mounted. He walks, for fear that in crossing Biverest, the rainbow, the many hued desire bridge, he might set it on fire with his thunder car, at the same time causing the Erdar waters to boil. Rendered into plain English, how can this myth be interpreted but as showing that the Norse legend makers were thoroughly acquainted with electricity? Thor, the humorization of electricity, handles this peculiar element only when protected by gloves of iron, which is its natural conductor. His belt of strength is a closed circuit, around which the isolated current is compelled to run instead of diffusing itself through space. When he rushes with his car through the clouds, he is electricity in its active condition, as the sparks scattering from his wheels and the rumbling thunder of the clouds testify. The pointed iron pole of the chariot is suggestive of the lightning rod, the two rams which serve as his coursers are the familiar ancient symbols of the male or generative power, their silver bridles typify the female principle, for silver is the metal of Luna, Astarte, Diana. Therefore on the ram and his bridle we see combine the active and passive principles of nature and opposition, one rushing forward, and the other restraining, while both are in subordination to the world permeating, electrical principle, which gives them their impulse. With the electricity supplying the impulse, and the male and female principle combining and recombining an endless correlation, the result is evolution of visible nature, the crown glory of which is the planetary system, which in the mythic Thor is allegorized by the circlet of glittering orbs which bedeck his brow. When in his active condition, his awful thunderbolts destroy everything, even the lesser other titanic forces. But he goes afoot over the rainbow bridge, Biverus, because to mingle with other less powerful gods than himself, he is obliged to be in a latent state, which he could not be in his car, otherwise he would set on fire and annihilate all. The meaning of the Erdar fountain, that Thor is afraid to make boil, and the cause of his reluctance, will only be comprehended by our physicists when the reciprocal electromagnetic relations of the innumerable members of the planetary system, now just suspected, shall be thoroughly determined. Glimpses of the truth are given in the p. 162. Recent scientific essays of Professors Meyer and Sterry Hunt. The ancient philosophers believed that not only volcanoes, but boiling springs were caused by concentrations of underground electric currents, and that this same cause produced mineral deposits of various natures, which form curative springs. If it be objected that this fact is not distinctly stated by the ancient authors, who, in the opinion of our century were hardly acquainted with electricity, we may simply answer that not all the works embodying ancient wisdom are now extant among our scientists. The clear and cool waters of Erdo were required for the daily irrigation of the mystical mundane tree, and if they had been disturbed by Thor, or active electricity, they would have been converted into mineral springs unsuited for the purpose. Such examples as the above will support the ancient claim of the philosophers that there is a logos in every mythos, or a groundwork of truth in every fiction.